Star Wars Republic Commando Book 4 Order 66 By Karen Travis Prologue Kerbak Plaza, Galactic City, Coruscant, 600 days after the Battle of Geonosis. So that's me. So that's how I once looked. We should all see ourselves from a stranger's perspective at least once in our lives. There's a Jedi walking toward me, all brown robes and earnest piety, no braid, so despite his youth he's not a Padawan any longer. He'll be commanding troops. At the very least, he'll be on active service on his own. The war makes us veterans before our time. I want to grab him by the shoulders and ask if he thinks this is a just war, a war fought honorably, but he'll panic if a Mandalorian in full armor accosts him especially one he'll sense is a force user like himself. Nobody else is taking much notice of me. Mandalorians on Coruscant are just foreigners, bounty hunters, one more bunch of economic migrants out of the many thousands of species who flock to the galaxy's capital. Ah, uh, the Jedi's looking around the crowd. He can sense me. I'm lost in the crowd of shoppers and sightseers. It's very strange obscene, even to see everyone going about their business on Coruscant as if we're not in the second year of an ugly war. And for them, of course, they're not. It's someone else's war in every sense fought on other worlds, fought by other beings, fought by men who aren't Coruscant citizens. Clone troopers aren't anyone's citizens. They have no legal rights. They're objects. Chattel. Military assets. Nobody should stand back and let that happen, least of all a Jedi. I'm just a few meters from the Jedi now. He's so serious, so committed. Yes, that was me, just months ago. A passerby glances his way and I sense her unease. When I walked around the city in my robes, I thought that others saw me as someone there to help them. Now I know different. They probably saw someone they didn't trust, with powers they didn't understand, someone they didn't elect but who shaped their lives behind the scenes anyway. If they'd known how much I could shape their thoughts, too, they'd have fled from me. The Jedi passes close by but I still don't recognize him. He stares into the T-slit of my helmet as if I've grabbed him. I can feel his confusion as I walk on Bino, not just confusion, fear. A force-using Mandalorian has to be on his list of worst nightmares. There was a time when it was on mine, too. Funny that. Then I sense him turn. I feel him working his way back through the crowd toward me burning with questions. Before he reaches out to tap my shoulder and I have to give him credit for even trying I turn to face him. He flinches. What he sees doesn't match what he can feel. What are you? A man who drew the line. I say. How about you? Your General Jizik. Is it that obvious? To a Jedi, yes it is. I used to be Bard and Jizik. Everyone in the Jedi Order knows I finally went native. It's the only response I know, complete surrender to a way of life first Jedi, now Mandalorian with every fiber of my being. My Jedi Masters didn't raise me to live my life by halves. Not any longer. I say at last. You walked out on us in the middle of a war, a war we have to fight. He's puzzled, resentful, scared. How could you betray us like that? I wonder who he means by we, Jedi, or clones. I left because it's wrong. I shouldn't have to tell him that. Because you're using a slave army to do it. Because there's no point fighting one kind of evil if you replace it with your own brand. Get specific. Get personal. Don't give him a chance to look away from his conscience. You, personally. You make that choice each morning. 
A belief you suspend when it suits you isn't a belief. It's a lie. Oh, that's dumb. I feel his soul squirm. I don't like it any more than you do. He seems oblivious of the stares of passers-by. But if I walk out, it won't change the council's policy, or the course of the war. It'll change your war. I say. But I suppose you're only following orders. Right. Everything that has happened in the galaxy, everything that ever will happen is framework made up of countless connections of individual choices. Yes or no, kill or spare, survive or die. They shape every moment for all eternity. One man's decision matters. One being's choices, moment by moment, connected to a network of billions of other choices, is all that existence is. We need every general we can muster, he says. Maybe the Jedi thinks he can appeal to my sense of guilt. There's a terrible darkness coming. I can feel it. So can I. It's vague and unfathomable, but it's there, looming, like someone stalking me. Then do something about your own darkness. Like joining a gang of mercenaries? He looks over my armor with evident disgust. Thugs. Savages. Before you choke on your own piety, Jedi, ask yourself who you're fighting for. Fearfeck, I called him Jedi. My disconnection's complete. His expression is one of quiet horror, and I walk away knowing I'll never see him again, I know that. And this war will end in grief, I know that too. I've made my choice. Unlike the clone troopers, I have one. And I choose to let the galaxy look after itself, and save those men that the rest of the civilized world relegates to the status of beasts. It's the right thing to do. It's what a Jedi should do. The day of reckoning is coming. Yes, I can feel that as well. I can't stop it, whatever it is, but I can defend those dearest to me. Choices. I had one. I made it. Chapter 1 So, who's to know whether Django had more than one son or not, or even how old he is? Come on now. Spar, it's time to he doing your bit for Mandiame. You don't have to lift a finger. Just act like Fetzer while we sort ourselves out, so everyone knows we're still in business. Fen Shaisa Appealing to deserter spar former ARC Trooper A02 to pass himself off as Django Fett's son and heir in the interregnum following Fett's death. Mess Cavalli, mid rim, approximately 50 years before the Battle of Geonosis. Get up! Get up and run, you little Chikar, or I'll drag you up. Fallon Matran could see the curling smoke of the mercenaries' camp a couple of hundred meters away but it might as well have been a hundred kilometers. He couldn't get up. He couldn't go on. He knelt on all fours, struggling for breath, every muscle burning, but he refused to cry. He was seven years old. Nearly. He thought it was six years and ten months, but he'd lost count in the war. Can't, he said. Can't. Munin Skirata was a big man with pockmarked green armor and a blaster that fired metal pellets. He loomed above, voice deafening, face invisible behind a helmet with a T-shaped visor that scared Fallon the first time he saw it. I know you can. You survived Circurus on your own. And you're not strolling in your fancy quaddy park now, so shift your shebs, you lazy little nibril. It wasn't fair. Life generally wasn't. Fallon's parents were dead, and he hated the world. He wasn't sure if he hated Munin Skirata, but if he could have killed the man right then, he would have. Only exhaustion stopped him. He almost reached for the knife he'd taken from his father's body when he realized Papa was dead and was never going to wake up however hard he tried to rouse him 
but he couldn't take his weight off both arms without collapsing into the dirt. You can do it if you want to, Munin yelled. But you don't want to, and that makes you a Nibril. You know what a Nibril is? A loser. A waste of space. Deadwood. Get up. Fallon wanted one thing, and that was to show that he wasn't lazy or stupid. His dad had never called him stupid. Neither had his mother. They loved him and made him feel safe, and now they were gone forever. He struggled into a kneeling position, then stood up, swaying and tottering, before breaking into a run again. That's more like it. Munin jogged alongside him. Come on. Shift it. Fallon's legs didn't feel like part of his body anymore. He'd run so far that they wouldn't do what he wanted. He was trying to run, but stumbling along in small steps, unable to find a steady rhythm. His lungs screamed for a rest. But he wasn't going to stop and be a Nibril. He didn't want to be one of those. Ahead was as near to home as he was ever going to see again, a camp that moved from place to place each day, where he sobbed himself to sleep every night with his fist crammed into his mouth so the Mandalorians wouldn't hear him and think he was a baby for crying so much. He could see the Mando soldiers standing around in the camp, watching. They all wore armor. Even their women were tough soldiers, and it wasn't always easy to tell who was under that armor, male or female or even if they were human. Fallon willed his body on, but it wasn't listening. He pitched forward flat on his face. Every time he tried to get up, gravel and dirt cutting into his palms, his arms gave way again. He sobbed in frustration. The finish line was still a long way off. But he had to get up. He had to finish. I'm not lazy. I'm not a Nibril. I won't let him call me that dash. Okay, add I.K. Munin said, scooping him up in his arms. He sat Fallon on one hip as if he was used to carrying kids and strode into the camp. The sudden switch from yelling to kindness was confusing. You did okay, lad. It's all right. Fallon hit Munin as hard as he could, but his bald fist bounced off the metal breastplate. It hurt. He wasn't going to let Munin know that, though. I hate you, he said, now certain at last. When I'm bigger, I'm going to kill you. I bet you would, Munin said, smiling. You already tried once. The other Mandalorians watched, some with helmets on, some not. They'd finished fighting their war here. They were waiting for a ship to take them home. You trying to kill that boy? One of the men stopped to ruffle Fallon's hair. His name was June Hoken, and he was eating shavings of that horrible dried fish stuff, Jahal, carving them from a big chunk with his vibroblade and popping them into this mouth the way some folks ate fruit. Per Shabaike. Hasn't he been through enough? I'm just training him. There's such a thing as too much. Come on, he's Mandacarla. He's already managed to survive on his own. He's all guts, this one. Guts or not, I didn't have my boy do proper training runs until he was eight. Fallon didn't like being talked about as if he couldn't understand what was going on. In the center of the camp tents made of plastoid sheets strung over pits, then covered with grass and branches a pot of stew was cooking over a crackling fire. Munin set him down and scrubbed his face and hands clean with a cold wet rag before ladling stew into a bowl and handing it to him. We'll have to get you some armor when we get home, Munin said. You need to learn to live and fight in it. Besker Gam. The Mandalorian's second skin. Fallon slurped from the bowl. He was always hungry. The stew was more like a broth no lovely fat dumplings like his mother made and he didn't like the fishy smell, but this was a banquet compared with what he'd scavenged in the ruined city for a year. 
don't want any armor, he said. You can do all kinds of things when you're wearing armor that ordinary folks can't do, Cal. Munin called him Cal. In the man's own language, it had something to do with knives and stabbing. Munin had nicknamed him Cal because Fallon had tried to stab him with the three-sided knife when they first met. The Mandalorian seemed to think it was funny and hadn't been angry at all. But Munin fed him and didn't hurt him. And in the weeks since Fallon had been part of the mercenary camp, he'd felt better even if he wasn't happy. Sometimes Munin called him Kalike. The mercenaries told him it meant Little Blade and showed that Munin was fond of him. I'm Fallon, he said at last. My name's Fallon. But he was already forgetting who Fallon was. His home in Quat City seemed like a dream mostly forgotten when he woke up, more a feeling than a memory. His family had moved to Circurus while his father did engineering stuff on the new KDY warships there. I don't want another name. Munin ate with him. When he wasn't shouting, he was actually a kind man, but he could never take Papa's place. Starting over can be a good thing, Cal I.K. You can't change the past or other folks, but you can always change yourself, and that changes your future. The thought grabbed Fallon and wouldn't let go. When you felt powerless, the idea of being able to make the bad stuff stop was the best thing in the world and he didn't want to feel this bad ever again. He wanted things to change. But why do you make me run and carry things? He asked. It hurts. So that you can handle anything life throws at you, son. So that you never have to be afraid of anyone again. I'm going to make a soldier of you. Fallon liked the idea of being a soldier. He had a vague but long list of beings he wanted to kill for hurting his parents, and you could do things like that if you were a soldier. Why? It's a noble profession. You're tough and smart, and you'll be a great soldier. It's what Mandalorians do. Why didn't you kill me? You kill everyone else. Munin chewed thoughtfully for a while. Because you don't have parents. And me and my missus don't have a son, so it sort of makes sense that we do what Mandalorians always do that we take you in, train you, set you up to be a soldier and a father yourself. Don't you want that? Fallon thought about it for a long time. He didn't have an answer, other than that he was lonelier now among other beings than when he'd lived on his own in the rubble on Circurus, because all the Mandalorians seemed to belong. They were close-knit, like a family and they hadn't killed his parents. they just rolled into town a year later while the war was still raging. He still felt angry though, and they'd do as a focus for his anger until the real thing came along. You think I'm lazy and stupid? Fallon said. No, I just say that and shout at you to get you mad enough to push yourself to the limit. Munin watched him empty the bowl and then refilled it. Because strength is up here. He tapped his head. You can make your body do anything if you want to badly enough. It's called endurance. When you find out just how much you can do, how much you can face, you'll feel fantastic like nobody can ever hurt you again. You'll be strong in every sense of the word. Fallon wanted to feel fantastic. On a full stomach, life seemed vaguely promising as long as he didn't think about his mother and father lying there among the shattered beams of the house they'd rented on Circurus. It was an image he couldn't get out of his mind. He got up to wash the bowl in a pail of water and then sat down again next to the fire to look at his father's knife, as he did every day. It had three flat sides, like a pyramid stretched out to a point. He'd never been allowed to touch it while his father was alive but he'd taught himself to use it because he had nowhere to run and nobody to look after him. He could throw it pretty well now. He practiced a lot. He could hit any target, moving or otherwise. What's it like being a soldier? He asked. Munin shrugged. Often boring. 
sometimes scary. You travel a lot. You make the best friends you could ever have. You really live. And sometimes you die too early. Do I have to follow orders? Orders keep you alive. It wasn't quite dusk, but Fallon could hardly keep his eyes open, and he sank into a delicious numb fatigue as the world receded. He tried to stay in that twilight state because sleep inevitably brought the dreams, but he was just too tired. At one point he was aware of being picked up and carried but he didn't wake fully and the last thing he felt was settling into a pile of warm blankets in one of the shelters that smelled of machine oil, smoke, and dried fish. It was then that the dream started again. He knew he was dreaming, but it didn't help. He walked through the front doors of the house on Circurus, all the walls shattered and fallen with just the doors left intact, and he didn't recognize what he stepped on as his mother until he saw the blue fabric of her favorite tunic. He looked around for his father. Papa was lying by the remains of the window, and Fallon knew something wasn't right, but it took him a few moments to work out that most of his father's head was missing. He knelt down to take the knife from his father's belt and thought he saw him move. It was always then that he woke up. It hadn't been like that in real life he'd huddled next to the bodies for ages before he decided he had to run and hide, and took the knife to defend himself but in the dream, it was all faster, different, more horrible. He jerked awake, heart pounding. Papa's head. He sobbed. Papa's head's broken. Munin Skirata hugged Fallon to his chest. It's okay, he said. I'm here, son. I'm here. It's just a bad dream. I wanted to stop. I want to stop seeing Papa's head. Munin didn't yell at him for crying. He just held him until he stopped. Fallon clung to him and sobbed until he couldn't get his breath anymore. He realized that the three-sided knife was on his belt now, in a new leather sheath, and he didn't know where that had come from. It'll stop, Cal, Munin said. I promise. And nobody's ever going to hurt you while I'm around. You're going to grow up strong, and you're going to be happy. Fallon decided he didn't mind being called Cal if it made the nightmare go away. Somehow, the two things were now connected. If he stopped being Fallon, he stopped seeing his parents' bodies. Munin Skirata sounded so certain and felt so strong and solid that Fallon believed him. You could change if you wanted to. You could do anything if you wanted to. I'm not really a Nibral, am I? Course not, Cal, Munin said quietly. I shouldn't have said it. There's no word for what you are in Mandalorian. Fallon Cal didn't understand. He looked up into Munin's face for an explanation. Hero, Munin said. We don't have a word for hero. But you're a real little hero, Cal Skirata. Cal Skirata. It was who he was going to be from this moment onward. He fell asleep again, and when he woke the next morning no dreams, no nightmares he saw that the world was a different place. Chapter 2 Bajra Bal Beskergam, Erenovi, Eliot, Mandoe Bal Mandalor and Venquian MHI Education and armor, self-defense, our tribe, our language and our leader all help us survive. Ryan taught to Mandalorian children to help them learn the resol near the six tenets of Mando culture. Arca Barracks, Special Operations Brigade HQ, Coruscant, 736 days after the Battle of Geonosis' second anniversary of the outbreak of war. Scorch raised his rifle and sighted up on the two sergeants on the parade ground below the window. The DC-17's upgraded optics were a definite improvement on the last version. The reticule settled on Cal Scarato within a narrow imaginary band level with his eyes and the indentation at the base of his skull, a 
a perfect cranial vault shot, the ideal for instant incapacitation. Scorch could see the Mandalorian's mouth moving as he spoke to Wallen Vav. Yeah, it's getting like downtown Keldeb around here. It's not as if I don't like the guy. But... Sergeant Vav and he would always be Sergeant Vav, civilian or not was the nearest Scorch had to a father. Vav and Skirata seemed to be deep in conversation, both talking at once while they stared down at the ferrocrete surface of the parade ground, no eye contact at all. It was a weird thing to be doing at daybreak. I thought you said you could lip-read, Sev said, munching on a handful of spiced wara nuts. I can, but he's not making sense. Maybe they're talking Mandoe. I can lip-read Mandoe just fine, Mirsheb. You'd think they'd have the sense to wear their buckets and use the internal comm link. Maybe it's nothing confidential. Scorch could smell the pungent spice on the nuts from across the room. Look, you know what happens when you stuff your face with those things. You get indigestion and wind. And I'm not going to put you over my shoulder and burp you. Sev belched. You'll miss me when I'm gone. Make yourself useful and take a look, will you? Sev made a long, low rumbling noise at the back of his throat, finished the handful of nuts, and sided up with his own dice. He was a sniper. He spent even more time staring through optics than Scorch did. They're reciting something, he said at last, and leaned his dice against the wall again to sit on his bunk and resume munching. They're both saying the same words. Yeah? And? Don't know. Can't make it out. For as long as Scorch could remember, Skirata and Vav had been at loggerheads about everything from tactics and how to motivate troops to the color of the mess walls, sometimes to the point of fistfights. But the war seemed to have softened their outlook. There was no affection between them not as far as Scorch could see but something kept them together as brother warriors, tight and secret. Neither of them needed to be here. Vav's bank raid and they didn't talk about that. No sir had probably netted millions. They were men with a mission, driven by something Scorch didn't quite understand. He cranked up the magnification. But it didn't help. Maybe they're having a really boring conversation. It's names, said Sev at last. They're reciting names. Scorch sided up again, transfixed. How old is Skirata? Sixty, sixty-one, something like that. What's that in clone years? Dead. It was a sobering thought, and Scorch wondered why it hadn't struck him that way before. He'd never worried about getting old. He never thought he'd survive, for all Delta Squad's general bluster that the Separatists hadn't been born who could kill them. You think the crazy old Barve is going to find his magic cure? He asked. Sev tossed a nut in the air and caught it in his mouth. For what? Our premature exit from this life. He is always talking about it. Sev rumbled again. I still reckon he killed Ko Sai. And I still reckon he got her research, and that's why he killed her, to shut her up. So yeah, I'd bet on him finding a way to stop us aging so fast. Scorch suspected that Valve was as deeply involved in the death of Kamino's renegade cloner as Skirata. He was still fiercely loyal to Valve, because the man was the reason Delta were all still alive today one of a handful of squads that had survived intact since the Kamino days. Vav raised survivors. You're not going to mention that to Zay, are you, Sev? Nah. I hate giving him sleepless nights. But if Sergeant Cal's got Kosai's research, why hasn't he started dishing out the cure? It's been nearly six months since he gave you her head. You make it sound like a birthday present, Sev said. Maybe he can't make some of the formula work. 
or he's just milking the Republic for all he can get before he bangs out with his stash. Cal wouldn't leave without his precious nulls. Scorch turned to look at Sev and met a raised eyebrow. Would he? If they deserted, would you shoot them? Sev asked. Scorch shrugged, trying to look disinterested, but the idea of putting a round through a brother clone didn't sit well with him. The Nulls were Skarada's adopted sons, too, his precious little boys even if they were grown men big men, dangerous men and if any Barves so much as looked at them the wrong way, Skarada would have his guts for gargers. Even us. We wouldn't have to, Scorch said. You heard all about Palpatine's death squad standing by if we step out of line. Don't avoid the question. Would you shoot them if ordered? Depends, Scorch said at last. Orders are orders. Depends who's giving them. The longer this war goes on, the less I feel the nulls are on the same side as us. Scorch knew what Sev meant, but he thought it was a harsh judgment all the same. He couldn't imagine the Nulls siding with the Seps. They were crazy, unpredictable, even Skirata's private army, but they weren't traitors. Come on, he said, grabbing his helmet and heading for the doors. Let's see what the old guys are up to. I can't stand the suspense any longer. The parade ground was a platform edged with a low retaining wall and a border of manicured bushes. All trimmed to regulation height there was such a thing, Scorch was certain and it didn't see many parades. More often than not these days, it stood empty except for the occasional impromptu game of Biolo Ball. The two veteran sergeants stood in the center of it with heads slightly bowed, oblivious of the commandos approaching. But Skirata was never really oblivious of anything. Nor was Vav. They had eyes in their backsides, those two. Scorch still hadn't worked out how they'd managed to keep such a close eye on their respective training companies back in Topoka City. To a young clone, they'd seemed like omniscient gods who could not be deceived, evaded, or outsmarted, and they still came pretty close now. Scorch could hear the mumbling rumble of low voices. It had a sort of rhythm to it. Yes, they were reciting a list. Now that he could hear... He caught sounds he recognized. Names. They were reciting names. Sev was the first to hesitate. He caught Scorch's elbow. I don't think we should interrupt them, Niviodi. Skirata turned slowly, lips still moving, and then Vav looked up. You want to join in, Adak? Vav said kindly, and he was not a kindly man just commemorating brothers gone to the Manda. You've forgotten what day it is. Scorch had although it should have been etched in his memory. 736 days ago, all 10,000 Republic commandos had been deployed to Geonosis with the rest of the Grand Army at zero notice, a scramble to board ships that left no time for farewells to their training sergeants. Of the 10,000 men who shipped out, only 5,000 had come back. Scorch felt like a fool. He knew what the two sergeants were doing now, and why they were reciting the names of fallen clone commandos. It was a Mandalorian custom to honor dead loved ones and comrades by repeating their names daily. He wondered if they went through all those thousands every single day. You didn't memorize every name, did you, Sarge? Sev asked. We remember every lad we trained and we always will, Skirata said quietly, but Scorch saw that he kept glancing down at a data pad clutched in his hand. Five thousand names plus those killed after the Battle of Geonosis was an impossible feat of memory even for Skirata's devotion. The rest. We only need a little prompting. Scorch couldn't now name half the squads in his batch at the Topoka Training Center, let alone the men in them. He felt ashamed as if he betrayed them. Vav gave him a nod and gestured with his own data pad indicating he was transmitting, and when Scorch checked the pad clip to his belt the list was there, highlighted at the company currently being recited. 
He joined in the reading obediently. So did Sev. There were many clones with identical nicknames based on their numbers a lot called Phi, or Niner, or Four and it gave Scorch a shudder to say the name Sev more than once. It probably didn't do much for Sev's morale, either. Scorch glanced at him, but he looked unmoved as usual, eyes fixed on his data pad. Bari's Red Kef. Then Taller J. Tarn Leo. The list went on. After a few minutes, their voices synchronized. There was a strange hypnotic feel to it, like an incantation, a rhythm and pitch that left Scorch almost in a trance. It was just the effect of simple repetition, but it still unsettled him. He wasn't the mystic sort. Behind him, he heard the faint crunch of boots, but he didn't dare break the spell and turn to look. Other commandos were joining the ritual. There were never many men in the barracks at any one time, but it seemed like they were all turning out to pay their respects. So many names? Is mine going to be on that list this time next year? Phi was on it. Phi, RC-8015, Omega Squad Sniper. Skirata didn't even blink when he said the name, and neither did Valve, even though word was getting around that Phi wasn't dead. It was a strange moment repeating the mouthy little D-Cut's name as if he were gone. Scorch, feeling suddenly guilty at escaping so much personal bereavement, saw Sev take a slow look to his left as if he'd spotted someone. Scorch didn't want to break his concentration. He didn't look to see what had distracted Sev. Reciting the list of the fallen took well over an hour. Eventually, when the last name was read, Skirata and Vav stood silent for a moment with their heads bowed. Scorch felt he'd been woken abruptly, suddenly aware of sound and harsh sunlight as if he'd stepped out of a dark room, and he was almost expecting some momentous end to the ceremony. But in typical Mandalorian style, it simply ended because all that needed to be said had been said. Skirata looked up. A couple of hundred commandos had assembled, some with helmets and some without each man in individual painted armor that looked incongruously cheery for such a solemn event. But that was very Mando, too. Life went on and was there to be lived to the full, and constant remembrance of lost friends and family was an integral part of that. Aye, Han. That was the word for it, a peculiarly Mandalorian emotion, a strange blend of contentment and sorrow when safely surrounded by loved ones and yet recalling the dead with bittersweet intensity. The dead were never shut out. Skirata's deep water-class submersible was called Aeihan. That said a lot about the man. What are you waiting for, Adak? Skirata asked. He always called them that, little sons. Scorch wondered if he'd formally adopted all his squads. That was Skirata all over. Just make sure I don't have to add any of your names next year, or I'll be very annoyed. You reckon there'll be a next year, Sarge? The commando who asked wasn't a guy Scorch knew, but then Delta kept to themselves. His armor was decorated with navy blue and gold chevrons. I like to plan ahead. Who knows, I might have a social engagement. Skirata hesitated for a moment. You know how the war's gone so far. Maybe we'll all be here in ten years. Your grandson will be big enough for full armor by then. There was a ripple of laughter and Skirata smiled sadly. Scorch expected him to be happier at the mention of the baby boy that one of his kids his biological kids had dumped on him. He certainly seemed to dote on the child. But it looked as if something had taken the happy grandfatherly gloss off the situation. My dearest wish, Skirata said, is that you all get to see him grow up. Well, it wasn't a day for hilarity anyway. They just stood there on a big, empty parade ground and recited the names of thousands of dead brothers, so Scorch felt it was a suitably downbeat note to end on. Nobody was singing much about Dirajum Cote Eternal Glory these days, although Scorch thought a verse of Voden might have been appropriate. 
But the impromptu assembly broke up in silence, and Skirata walked off with his usual limp, Vav ambling beside him. Out of curiosity, Scorch kept an eye on the two sergeants all the way to the hangars on the far side of the barracks. Come on, said Sev. Can't hang around all day. Got a mission briefing before lunch. I need to calibrate my HUD. What do you think they're up to? Getting old and working out how to spend Vav's bank hall. No, they're up to something serious. I can tell. Mind reader now, are we? Scorch couldn't understand why Sev never saw what he saw. They'd grown up with those two old Shabir, and when either of them had some scam running, they had this look about them, subtle but discernible to clones who relied on subliminal detail for recognition in a sea of near-identical brothers. Skarada had his scam face on, for sure. He definitely knows something we don't, Scorch said. Whatever it is, then, it won't hurt us. Skarada and Vav paused at the entrance to the armory. Then Scorch saw something that vindicated his paranoia. Two familiar figures that he hadn't seen in a couple of years figures in Besker Gam. Traditional Mandalorian armor emerged from a side door and greeted the two sergeants with that distinctive hand-to-elbow grip. Mandalorians shook hands by mutually clasping above the wrist. Vav said it was to prove you had a strong enough grip to haul a comrade to safety. Maybe they'd arrive to mark the anniversary. Nobody outside the Grand Army seemed to bother about it. What are they doing here? Sev muttered. Why now? Wadi Tehai and Midge Hilamar were two of the Kyu Valdar, the training sergeants recruited personally by Django Fett to train clone commandos in Kamino. Most were Mandalorians, and most had disappeared again once their contract was over, living up to their title. Those who no longer exist. But now they were reappearing in ones and twos. It just made Scorch feel that his general suspicions were justified. I don't know, he said. Maybe Cal's decided he likes the company of intellectuals. He paused. Tehai still had that ancient bronzium spear slung across his back and a besker flute hanging from his belt. They were both lethal weapons. You think he ever uses those things? Sure of it, Sev said. I heard Zay was trying to recruit Q Valdar again to cross-train ordinary troopers. Smacks of desperation. In case you hadn't noticed, we are desperate. The four Mandalorians exchanged a few words and disappeared. Without his helmet systems, Scorch couldn't overhear anything at that distance. Why did Fed recruit any non-Mando sergeants at all? Sev shrugged. He said it was for the skills mix, but I reckon he just couldn't find a hundred mandos to front up for him. Scorch followed Sev back into the accommodation block. He often wondered how the commandos trained by erotized non-Mandalorians, a word that could mean anything from foreigner to traitor felt about being surrounded by others who were so steeped in Mandalorian culture. There weren't that many left, though. Out of 2,500 or so who completed training by Aruatais, fewer than a thousand remained. It said a lot for Mandalorian training. We could train the white jobs better ourselves, Scorch said. We've got experience to pass on to them. Sev picked up his helmet from the table and inverted it to begin calibration. You fed up with fighting then? Want a nice desk job? No, just saying. Scorch tried to avoid thinking too much because life was now full of questions that were beyond his power to answer or even influence. They crept up on him at unguarded moments, in the freshers, or while he sat in the gunship en route to an insertion, and just before he fell asleep. Where was the Grand Army going to get more troops? If they started cross-training more meat cans as commandos, who backfilled their positions, Things looked more stretched every day. And where were all those zillions of Shabla droids the Separatists were supposed to have? They had plenty, 
But if they had as many as Intel claimed they must have been having a party somewhere and sitting out the war. One of the null arcs swore blind that there was only a fraction of that number deployed. The nulls knew a lot that they didn't share with the commando squads. When they didn't know something, Scorch got worried. He kept forgetting how many zeros there were in a quadrillion, but whatever it was, it was a lot more droids than he'd encountered. Maybe Palpatine will have to start recruiting citizens, he said hopefully. Sev laughed. He didn't do that often. I'd rather work shorthanded than have to serve with mongrels. You've seen what they're like as fleet officers. You want them as infantry? At least the war would be over quicker. We'd win or lose horribly. True. Brutal, but true. But what happens to us when it ends? It was the kind of question that whiny Bunch Omega kept asking. Scorch couldn't plan that far ahead. All he knew was that the Grand Army would run out of troops in a year or so, if casualty rates held constant, and he wasn't seeing anywhere near enough replacements coming in. Someone said that Palpatine started producing clones on Coruscant because he doesn't trust the Kaminoans not to get their facilities trashed by the Seps again, Scorch said. Sev huffed and got on with calibrating. Yeah, like the rumor that we were getting some super-duper new ion cannon. He was right. It was another dumb rumor like so many they'd heard before. If the Chancellor was breeding more clone troops, he'd have told everyone, just to boost morale and scare the Seps. And if he had them, he'd deploy them. Scorch had seen evidence of neither. But if he was breeding them, they wouldn't be ready for a long time. Kamino clones took ten standard years to mature. No, it was all buzz, the stream of tall tales, general half-heard gossip, and occasional nuggets of truth that circulated among the ranks. There were no extra reinforcements on the horizon. Galactic City, Coruscant, 737 days ADG. Surveillance was an art, and so was evading it. Republic Treasury agent Bessany went and had tailed a good number of fraudeurs and embezzlers in the last six years, but she'd never been the subject of an investigation herself. As she headed home from the office after a late finish some work was best done while colleagues were absent, especially the kind of work that would get her arrested she slid her hand into her pocket out of habit to check two things. One was the Marison blaster that Mariel, Null Arc Trooper and Seven, had given her. The other was her data pad full of heavily encrypted data that should never have left the treasury mainframe. I'm a spy. I'm working against my own government. I was always such a good girl, wasn't I, Dad? And now look what's become of me. Her father would have understood, though, she was sure. He taught her to stand up for what she believed. The blaster was simply the kind of precaution you had to take when you were meddling in the Chancellor's secrets. At night, even under the garish lighting of a quarter thronged with beings from every part of the galaxy, Bessany felt utterly alone and hunted. Every day sometimes in the morning, sometimes on her way home she was convinced someone a few paces behind was watching her. She'd turn, seeing nothing but commuters with woes other than hers on their minds but the uneasy feeling wouldn't go away. Sometimes it even happened in the office. She wondered if one of the shape-shifting Gerlinen spies was still shadowing her, but they'd left Coruscant now, and if they'd put their minds to it, not even a Jedi could detect them. This time, though, the sensation of being stalked wasn't just her guilt talking. Just as the Gerlinen had warned, someone was following her. A man had caught her attention at the speeder bus platform near the treasury building. She was used to attracting stares. She was very tall, very blonde, but this scrutiny was different, a kind of fixed, slightly past her glance that meant the man was keeping her carefully in his peripheral vision, trying to look as if he were taking no notice of her. Some might have said Bessany was just paranoid, but she was a professional investigator, and she just knew. Her gut was rarely wrong. The man was graying, middle-aged and portly, 
an anonymous-looking human male in a well-worn, high-necked business suit just like millions of others. He seemed to change his mind about waiting for the speeder bus to the university and walked ten meters behind Bessany. She caught sight of him reflected in the transparent steel walls of Gallows Mall. He was tailing her, no doubt about it. And if you've not arrested me yet, chances are you can't. Or you don't know what I'm up to. It was hard to imagine what Kant meant for a government that seemed to use emergency powers with such careless and unopposed ease. Bessany had been waiting in silent dread for a knock on the door in the middle of the night ever since she'd first started bending the rules. And then twisting them out of all recognition on behalf of Sergeant Cal Scarata Calbir, Papa Cal whose extraordinary paternal charisma made her throw aside the caution of a lifetime. It was for a moral cause. She never had any doubt about that. It was just a healthy fear of getting caught. She glimpsed her stalker in the transparent steel shop front again, and her stomach churned. The more she dug into the accounts of the Grand Army, the more anomalies she found bogus companies, credits being channeled into cloning facilities far from Kamino, and yet there were no extra troops appearing to bolster the beleaguered Grand Army now stretched dangerously thin across the galaxy. Numbers were her life, but the numbers in Chancellor Palpatine's defense budget didn't even come close to adding up. You're building another secret army, aren't you, Chancellor? And that's why the Kaminoans are worried. They know something's up. Bessany didn't break her pace. She kept on walking, still relatively safe among the crowds and tried to decide whether to carry on to the air taxi platform, grab a cab, and escape her apparent pursuer, or to divert down the next walkway to nowhere in particular, and flush him out. And then what? Run away? Shoot him? The man was still behind her as she stepped onto the moving slidewalk that linked the lower level of Gallows Mall to the fashion floors. She leaned one-handed on the safety rail as the moving belt carried her past the holo displays of garments, letting her gaze sweep over him before turning to look at the other side. When she reached the ready-to-wear section, she stepped off at the last moment and thought she'd lost him, but after a few minutes she caught sight of him again riffling through impossibly frilly underclothes on a rail as if shopping for his wife. His air of bemusement looked authentic. Of course, I might just be paranoid after all. Bessany spun around and headed back to the sly walk down to the walkway level again. If he followed her this time, she decided she'd grab an air taxi, or maybe even confront him. Yes, she could do that. She'd walk right up to him, look him in the eye, smile charmingly, and ask him if he knew her. Do I just want to shake him off, or find out who he is? If Palpatine's agents wanted to kill her, they'd had plenty of opportunities. This man was probably just finding out who she associated with and where she went. The sly walk dipped at a gentle gradient down to the walkway, and she stepped off at a race-walking pace to the air taxi rank. His only option then would be to follow her home, and then then she would have an excuse to shoot him. But even if you do... There'll be another one to take his place. How much did they know? Treasury security was her business. She was certain they didn't realize she was downloading data from the budget system. Ahead of her, a tower of black transparent steel hung like a waterfall, a different themed restaurant on every floor. She could see the diners and the sporadic burst of flame as chefs prepared kojai of wings at the tables and she could still see the man in the suit reflected in the ambling crowd behind her. They were well inside the entertainment district now. The walkways were packed with well-heeled Coruscanti and off-world tourists out to sample the best cuisine in the galactic capital. Crowds were useful insurance, but they were also places where the worst could happen. Bessany slid her data pad into the inside pocket of her coat, pretending to fumble for her transit identity chip, 
and gripped the blaster in her pocket. It was purely for comfort. There was no way she could use a weapon here in this crowded, very public place. Her newfound friends in the Karuskan security force could make, he problem go away if she opened fire, but they couldn't make thousands of people turn a blind eye. Attention was the last thing she needed right now. The plaza was growing more packed as she neared the taxi platform. A line of diners waiting for tables at the Vezari Fry House had formed a dam in the sea of visitors, slowing the flow of foot traffic so much that the crowd began to form eddies. Bessany was losing ground to the man in the suit. She could see him as she turned to avoid the queue, so she darted sideways into the colonnade of small tap taps to bypass the crowd. She was banking on him not trying anything stupid as in fatally stupid in public. The colonnade led to a parking area for private speeders, so if she cut through there she could rejoin the main walkway by the taxi platform. But the Permacrete Square was a deserted maze of vessels crisscrossed with long black shadows, and she realized she'd made a dangerous mistake. She should have stuck with the crowds. Hand on her blaster, she turned. There was no point running. She was almost face to face with the man now, a matter of paces away, and she met his eyes. He seemed surprised when she drew the blaster from her pocket. But his wide-eyed expression wasn't directed at her. It was because someone else was suddenly right behind him, an arm clamped around his neck, and his sharp gasp was cut short. Bessany heard a faint gurgling. The man's right leg flailed a couple of times, and then he seemed to be standing frozen on tiptoe, motionless. Just because you're following someone, said a familiar, much missed voice, doesn't mean you're not being followed. Clothing rustled. Let's just check what you're carrying. Oh, a nice DH-17. That's not quite your style, is it? A battered gray delivery speeder dropped out of nowhere, and Bessany didn't have time to move past complete confusion into fear. Its side hatch opened, a huge hairy Wookiee arm shot out and hauled the man inboard. Captain Ordo Null Arc 11 Ordo, her Ordo, her lover shoved the taper nose DH-17 blaster inside his jacket and beckoned impatiently to her. He was supposed to be on deployment light years away, not here. She hadn't even spotted him following them. Neither had the man in the suit, it seemed. Ordo, you said you were in the outer rim? She whispered looking around to see if there were witnesses, heart hammering. How long have you been following me? The speeder dropped a little lower, and he put one boot on the hatch rail. Ordo looked very different out of his pristine white arc trooper armor, and nondescript dark street clothes, he could have been anyone from a bodyguard to a thug from one of the local gangs that preyed on unwary tourists. I like to keep an eye on you, he said. Get in. What are you going to do with him? If his control knows he was following me, then they'll know I'm involved. Ordo seemed disturbingly relaxed. It was as if he'd never been taught that kidnapping people was wrong. But Skirata's special forces squads abducted, assassinated, and spied for the Republic. And there was an inevitability if you bred hypersmart, ultra-hard fighting men. Sooner or later, they understood their power, and used it for their own ends if those ends weren't met by the Republic. Can't stand around chatting, Ordo said. Get in, Sire I.K. Ordo always exuded unshakable confidence in a crisis and Bessany now understood why troops would follow some officers anywhere. Before she could even think about it, she found herself scrambling into the speeder's open hatch, following orders without argument. A stench of cooking oil and stale meal bred the speeder's previous cargo, probably hit her. In the gloom, a Wookiee sat crammed awkwardly into one of the human-sized seats with a firm grip on the man in the suit. It was Anaka, one of Skirata's fixers. Kalbir's associates were an eclectic mix of species and professional backgrounds, 
from the respectable to the outright criminal, but mostly the marginal beings who needed to duck and dive to get by. Scarato was very good at getting a motley crew to work together for mutual advantage. He missed his vocation, Bessany thought. Politics needed a man like that. Anaka made a quiet rumbling trill deep in her throat. Ordo shrugged in response. No, I haven't a clue who this Chikar is, he said. Get this crate airborne and we'll find out. What do you want? The man asked. My wallet? My speeder? He was trying to play ordinary and failing. He wasn't scared enough or even angry enough at being plucked off the street. Any normal being would have been reduced to a quivering heap if they were kidnapped by a Wookiee and a man who looked the way Ordo did right then. Ordo held out one hand palm open. His other hand drew a short-barreled custom verpine pistol. Not that I think you'll be carrying your real identichip, but let's have a look. Bessany shrank back against the bulkhead. She was now perfectly safe, but even with a Wookiee and a Null Arc Trooper taking care of her problem, she felt uneasy sitting so close to someone who'd been tailing her. Her adrenaline was starting to ebb. This wasn't how she saw her sober career in the Republic's civil service panning out. Ordo had literally crashed into her life a year ago, and her galaxy had been changed out of all recognition. Today was just the new normality. Inaka lifted the speeder clear of the parking area, banking over the artificial cliffs and canyons of Coruscant. Bessany could see the nightscape through the small viewport at the rear. She wondered where they might be going. Inaka's specialty was procuring vessels and safe houses safe for the clones and Skirata's associates, anyway. Wherever they were taking this man wouldn't be safe for him at all. My name's Chadas. The man set eyes following Ordo's hands as he rifled through the contents of the wallet. I work the late shift at the Transit Authority. Sounds like a load of Ossic to me. Why were you following this woman? I wasn't. You always hang around attractive females in the lingerie section, do you? There's a word for men like you. I wasn't following her. I was looking for something for my wife, Dash. I'm the jealous kind. I don't like perverts stalking my girlfriend. I told you, Dash. Why were you carrying a serious piece like a DH-17? In case you hadn't noticed, Coruscant is getting pretty rough. A holdout blaster's a wise precaution. So many riffraff about. Ordo, still holding the verp on Chadas, reached into his jacket and drew out the DH-17 blaster. He admired it for a few moments before flicking the safety catch off and handing it to Bessany. She took it reluctantly. But that's an assassin's weapon. Why else would you need a flash suppressor and low-light optics? I got it from a buddy. Your buddy must work in a rough business, then. Look, we can keep this game up as long as you like, but I miss dinner tonight, and that always makes me cranky. You're a Criffin clone, aren't you? And you're Republic Intel. Chadas snorted. I'm just an office clerk. Okay. Ordo took out a hand scanner. Bessany, if he moves, blow his gassy off. Let's see who he really is. Bessany wasn't sure how she'd aim at anything other than the man's chest, but she tried to hold the DH-17 convincingly. There wasn't much Chadas could do thousands of meters above the city anyway except submit to the scan. Ordo flashed it in front of his eyes to check his retinas, and then made him press his fingers onto the pad. What's that going to tell you? Chadas asked. He was definitely looking nervous now. I haven't got a criminal record. I'll bet. Ordo read the display with a little frown. Well, Agent Lemeloth, RBNJ, you've got remarkably high security clearance for a clerk. Two more promotions and you'll report directly to the Chancellor. How the staying did you access that? Because I'm much, 
much smarter than you, mongrel. Bessany had never known Ordo to show the slightest embarrassment at being a clone. In fact, he seemed to take great pride in it. His genome having been selected and enhanced to create the raw material for the perfect soldier. And however much the Kaminoan clone masters believed the null prototypes were a failed experiment intensive training from infancy had produced a superfit, hyper-intelligent, but unmanageably idiosyncratic black ops commando. As far as Ordo was concerned he was the best, and therefore any randomly conceived being like Chadas was a poor second or worse. He had a point. And now he also had the agent's biometric access to the Republic's most sensitive information. He could slice into some priceless files. But he had to do it now, before Republic Intel Miss Chadas, or whatever his name was. The Nulls were very adept at data stripping even better than Bessany was, in fact. Yes, they really were the best, and that made them especially dangerous to cross. Chada's Lemelot seemed to have reached the same conclusion. Try to use my access, and you'll be caught right away. He looked really agitated now, staring into Ordo's face as if he was more shocked than scared. What are you doing anyway? You're programmed to be obedient. You should have paid more attention in genetics class, Ordo said. Genes only predispose. Environment's what counts. Programming. No, human beings don't work that way. Trainable. Not programmable. You're a soldier of the Republic. I order you to land this vessel and release me. Ordo made a little snorting noise of distracted contempt. You can kiss my ships. And you still haven't told me why you were following Agent Wenin. Who are you working for, clone? I like to be my own boss. The hours arc better. Now answer me before I have to start breaking things. Bessany had questioned suspects in the course of her job, but accounts that didn't balance or unauthorized expenditure didn't usually involve abduction and persuasion with a blaster. Lemeloth turned his head slowly to fix on Bessany, as if he could get farther with her than with Ordo. It's not too late to turn yourself in, Agent Wenin, he said. We understand. You talk to some malcontent like Senator Skina. He puts unhelpful ideas in your head about the direction of the war effort dash. You're bluffing. Bessany cut in, hoping he was. If Lemeloth had opened the batting with that, then he probably didn't have the worst dirt on her that she was ripping data on the clone production program for Skirata. I'm just a simple auditor. Numbers. Balance sheets. Budget estimates. Aren't we done here? Ordo asked quietly. Last chance, Lemeloth. Something's dawned slowly on Bessany, for all her mental acuity. There was only going to be one way out of this for Lemeloth. Ordo couldn't just give him a black eye and tell him not to hang around her again. They'd snatched a spy, and spies didn't forget. Even if Juzik had been here, he might not have been able to memory rub Lemeloth enough to guarantee the man would have no recollection of following her. If I don't report in, Lemeloth said, you're the last contact I was tailing. None of this is going to go away for you, Agent Wenin. No, but you are. Ordo didn't look up from his data pad. He seemed engrossed tapping away at the screen. I'm into your secure comm system now. I've just sent a message saying Wenin went straight home, didn't make contact with anyone, and that you'll call in later tonight. So you're working for the Separatists. That's what we get for letting Mandalorian scum train our troops, I suppose. Usually, Ordo said holding a gloved hand out to Bessany for the DH-17. Folks beg me for leniency at this point. Lemeloth was ashen. His gaze tracked discreetly around the speeder's cramped cargo area, as if he thought he stood a chance at 7,000 meters if only he could get to the hatch. It's not going to happen, is it? No. 
Ordo adjusted the force settings on the blaster. Bessany felt her gut tighten. But I'm not a savage. Professional courtesy and all that. Then no speeches, no insults, no warning Ordo simply raised the DH-17, held it to the agent's temple, and fired. It discharged with a loud dap. The man slumped off the seat and hit the deck with a thud. It was fast, dispassionate, and shocking. The smell of discharged blaster and seared skin overpowered the odors of food. Bessany found she couldn't speak or cry out. She froze. Anaka looked over her shoulder from the pilot's seat and made a low, rumbling growl. No, I don't expect you to do all the housework. Ordo said still utterly matter-of-fact. I'll do the disposal myself. Anaka yelled. Okay, keep the blaster, but dump him in the lower levels, the derelict zone, so that a borat can dispose of the body. Ordo began stripping the corpse of everything vaguely incriminating or useful, as if he did it regularly. Bessany realized he probably did. The rats are pretty thorough. And recycling's our civic duty. Ordo glanced up as if suddenly aware that Bessany was staring at him in horror. For all the terrible jobs he had to do, he still had an incongruous innocence about him, a kind of wide-eyed embarrassment whenever he thought he might have made a social gaffe. Bessany had never seen anyone killed before, let alone shot an arm's length from her by her own lover. She knew Ordo's work was dirty and difficult, but there was knowing, and there was seeing. Sorry, he said, suddenly a guilty little boy caught throwing stones. I should have told you to look away. It's it's okay. Try as she might, though, Bessany couldn't make it okay. Something had stalled in her. She felt as if her heart was waiting for a safe moment to beat again. I realize you couldn't, just let him go. Ordo pulled off the man's belt with some effort. The banthahide strap snapped like a whip. If it had been the other way around, what do you think he'd have done to me? Or you come to that? He'd have killed either of us without a second thought. It's not like I tortured him or anything. Clean death. That's the most any of us can hope for. Bessany had hoped to die of extreme old age in her sleep. Most beings did, she suspected, even Mandalorian warriors. Does. Did he know what I was really up to? I skimmed your file details off the Intel mainframe. Ordo shook his head. According to that, it was just your meeting with the senator that made them jumpy. Best thing you can do now, Sire I.K., is to tell your boss that a pervert's stalking you and that you're scared. That'll cover your behavior and weapons, if anyone asks questions, and make you look like you've got nothing to hide. Ordo had been trained to kill efficiently, and given no other choice of career. Bessany tried to remember that when Anaka dropped them off at her apartment, and the speeder vanished into the night. He switched from assassin mode to harmless domesticity the moment the doors opened, trotting into the kitchen to make a pot of CAF. Bessany watched, unable to stop the trembling in her legs. It wasn't that she felt sorry for Lemeloth, but just a few hours ago he probably had no idea he was going to die. She wasn't sure what had disturbed her most, being present at an execution, or realizing how very tenuous the link to life was for some in this war, and that the people she loved and cared for were as close to oblivion at any moment as that agent. Outside this room, Karuskant went on shopping and dining and watching the Holovids. The war was reality for someone else. I'm starving, Ordo said, opening and closing cupboard doors. Clones were always hungry. Executions didn't seem to dent his appetite. Shall I make supper? I've learned to cook spicy grass grain. You like that? Just CAF for me. Bessany was sure she'd throw up if she tried to eat anything now. She opened the conservator and pointed to neat rows of containers, prepared meals for two weeks, 
all labeled and dated because she was a label and date kind of person. Help yourself. Ordo laid the table for two anyway. He had a very precise way of doing things, as if every eventuality in his life had a drill, and she knew that if she measured the spacing of the cutlery it would be exact. He pulled back a chair and gave her a nod to sit down. It's my job, he said quietly. So he understood what was troubling her then, and maybe his snap change to domestic trivia was displacement. I don't kill for fun. I know. It's time you left Coruscant, Bess I.K. You'll be safe on Mandalore. You can't go on like this. You need me inside the treasury. But I can slice into the system. Mario can. We all can, since you turned over your codes to us. Yes, she'd done that pretty well the first night they'd met. Shot by a Jedi, abducted by a clone. And I trusted them? Yes, I did. They're as good as family now. It's still easier for me to do it. Ordo placed a cup of CAF in front of her with the handle at precisely 90 degrees, as if it was a private ritual. The nearest I've ever come to arguing with Calbear was over whether we were putting you at risk for our own ends. I went into this knowing the score, Ordo. But you think you have to face danger yourself to be able to look me in the eye, don't you? He knew her a lot better than she realized. I'm not going to sit on my backside in Kiramora while you're on the front line, she said. I still have my uses. Staying, she'd forgotten all about her data pad. She took it out of her pocket. Here. I found another black hole in the procurement budget. New contracts for Rothana Heavy Engineering. Ordo took the data pad and looked as if he was calculating, lips moving slightly. I make that an order for 500 lar ties. Exactly. The LAT slash I gunship was the workhorse of the Grand Army, and replacements were always needed. 500 was a drop in the ocean for RHE, whose yards could churn them out like cheap family speeders. Now look at the delivery date. Ordo raised his eyebrows. That's nearly a year away. Are they knitting them by hand or something? It gets better. I tied up that order authorization with the delivery date and the corresponding budget estimate for the next financial year, and not only do they not match, but the expenditures coded under domestic security. I thought the decimal point was an error, but no it's off by well, see for yourself. That much can buy a few thousand the kilometers. Bessany waited for Ordo to react. She brought him a prize at great risk. She realized that she was waiting for a pat on the head. Either Palpatine's ordered some gold-plated custom larties to show us clone boys how much he cares, or he's building a huge new fleet. Ordo scratched his chin thoughtfully. Lots of big ships. Shab, I need a shave. He's got to have somewhere to put his new clone army, Bessany said. But k and Rothana can lay a keel and launch a warship inside five months, and they can handle hundreds, thousands if they drop all other contracts. Where's the other hardware they're building in the meantime? Unless they're replacing ships a rivet at a time, I couldn't find any other big orders due for completion before that time period. So Palpatine stocking up with clones and ships, but not for deployment anytime soon. What's so important about a year's time? Why that timing? Bessany knew enough about the fighting this stuff that HNE rarely covered now to realize that every day was an all-out, final effort for units of the Grand Army somewhere. But throwing much bigger resources at a war suggested finality. You think the war might be coming to an end? It's only just started. Maybe he's finally taking notice of our warnings that the Seps just don't have anything like the number of battle droids they claim to have. But I still don't understand the delay. Either way, Kalbir will find this information useful. Ordo sent the data by comlink to Skirata there and then. The numbers in this war didn't add up, 
It was a sore point with the nulls, and especially with Skrata. They kept finding evidence that the separatist droid armies weren't the much vaunted quadrillions but hundreds of millions, yet it didn't seem to change the tactics dictated by Palpatine. Those were still bad enough odds for such a small clone army. But it explained why the separatists hadn't overrun Coruscant. Bessany preferred to think of this as the beginning of the end. She was a data rational woman, her world built on demonstrable evidence and irrefutable numbers, but there was always room for optimism. She also preferred to think of Ordo as a victim of a regime that damaged him, not a stone cold killer. He rummaged through the conservator and sat down with a plate of cold roast roba and thin slices of sheet bread, chewing happily as if he hadn't a care in the world. How could he possibly react like a normal man anyway? He'd never had a childhood, and not even Skirata's doting paternal presence could change the fact that everything about Ordo and his brothers from their genome to the intensive training to maximize that genetic potential had been designed to make him a lethal human weapon. You're afraid of me, he said suddenly, with the outspoken perception of a child again. There was still a lot of the boy left in Ordo. Sire Ike, I'd never hurt you, I swear. I know, sweetheart. That slightly desperate, wounded tone, so at odds with his powerful physical presence, always made Bessany angry with the world. Ordo deserved better. I'm just shaken, that's all. It's not every day I see someone shot like that. For Ordo, of course, it was routine. A clone's life was cheap and disposable to both his Kaminoan creators and his political masters, and if men were indoctrinated to believe their sole purpose was to fight and die for the Republic, it was inevitable they would see others' lives as equally expendable. The war was very distant for most Coruscanti a conflict without personal consequences fought by men they never met. The two world soldier and citizen were utterly separate, and Bessany thought that could only turn out badly for society. This is much better Roba than we ever get in the mess. Ordo said distressingly innocent again. It's really tasty. I like you to have the best, said Bessany. You deserve it. Ordo looked blank for a moment and then fished in his belt pouch. What he placed on the table in front of her was nothing short of shocking. A gold pin with three enormous brilliant blue gems one central stone flanked by two smaller ones glittered in the harsh kitchen light, showing hints of deep forest green fire. I meant to give this to you months ago, he said. But the time never seemed right. Bessany was almost afraid to touch it, Ordo, are those what I think they are? Sharoni sapphires, yes. Sharoni stones were rare and ludicrously valuable. Clones didn't even get paid let alone have personal fortunes. Bessany had to ask. Where did you get them? Sergeant Vav. He raided his family's safe deposit box on Maijito. He's a disinherited Ermanu aristocrat. Anyway... He said you'd do the stones justice. Ordo spoon pickled mosh root relish onto his plate. They're worth ten million. Ordo. Bessany's stomach hit the floor and bounced hard. It felt like it, anyway. If she had one more shock tonight, she wasn't sure she could handle it. The police are going to be looking for these. You don't have to take them. And if the cops haven't found them yet... Chances are they never will. It's stolen, a voice said in her head. It's wrong. So was stripping confidential data from the treasury mainframe. So was handing over her passwords to Cal Scarada. So was extracting a badly injured clone from the hospital at gunpoint and making him disappear from the Grand Army's system. So was sitting back in a seat and watching while a Republic agent doing his lawful job was dispatched with a single bolt to the head. She'd done it all. And I'm going to keep doing it. Bessany didn't know how to handle a gift of that magnitude, stolen or not. She steeled herself to picking up the pin and turning it to make the light dance off its facets. 
Shironi gems appear green in daylight. Ordo said matter-of-factly. It's the crystalline structure. Birefringent and biaxial. It's dash. Can't Cal sell it? Kiramora needs the creds. You could keep one. They were magnificent stones, but it was Ordo's anxious expression that forced her hand. She was as damned now as she would ever be. She'd thrown in her lot with Skarada, and his rules were now her rules. Did it matter if she added one more crime to the list? She'd placate Ordo now, and work out how to square it with her conscience later. Thank you. If I got paid I'd buy you something wonderful. Ordo sometimes had an anxious, apologetic tone when he felt he'd fallen short of perfection, a rare lapse in his apparently unassailable confidence. That was what happened Bessany thought, when a child was told it had to die for failing to meet standards. It ripped her apart every time, not even Skirata's influence constantly telling them they were perfect, wonderful, brilliant could totally erase that trauma. This is the best I can do right now. Do you want to marry me? Ordo was a slave by any other name, an object manufactured for a task, minus rights and a vote. Bessany understood now why Attain had also had a moment of apparent insanity, and had Darman's baby. The clones had a right to be men. Their future was all the more precious because it would be so brief. Well. Yes. Oh, good. Ordo seemed to have very fixed ideas about what a man should be and what he should do, no doubt swallowed whole from Skirata's philosophy. He placed his elbow on the table as if he was challenging her to arm wrestle. Take my hand then. She did palm to palm, because Ordo had that way with him. She trusted him. She didn't know if he was going to squeeze her fingers fondly or slam her hand to the table and declare victory. Mm, my solus tome, and mm, my solus dar tome, and mm, my midinuyen, and mm, my biayuri verde. He said, eyes fixed on hers. Now you say it. What's that? A mando marriage contract. If you agree, repeat it. It means we're one whether we're together or apart that we share everything we have, and that we'll raise our children as warriors. It wasn't exactly the way Bessany had imagined her wedding. But then she had never imagined a day like this one at all, ever. Her normality barrier had been smashed down twice in an hour, and the hammer was coming down for a third time. Okay, she said. She couldn't refuse, she didn't want to. Even if this was brutally pragmatic in that conflicting Mandalorian way, strictly business one moment and tearfully sentimental the next. It was as if he'd made up his mind and so had she, and he didn't see any point in messing around any longer. Mm, my solus tome, and my solus dar tome, and my midinuyen, and my biayuri verde. Ordo smiled. I'm glad we've got that sorted, he said letting go of her hand. You look like you need some more CAF. I'm still in shock. That must be it. People do rash things like this in wartime. Bessany now lived a life at the extremes, with the extremes, with the most marginal in society, an existence few beings around her would ever know. Good idea, she said voice shaking. She tried to blot out all thoughts of Lemelotha's wife, if he had won being told he was never coming home again. She couldn't. It would always plague her in the quiet moments. That, she reminded herself, was war. Chapter 3 If we were given just one word of information in our entire history, how we'd treasure it. How we'd pore over every syllable, divining its meaning, arguing its importance. How we'd de-examine it, and wring every lesson we could from it. Yet today we have trillions of words, tidal waves of information, and the smallest detail of every action our government and businesses take is easily available to us at the touch of a button. And yet, we ignore it and learn nothing from it. One day, we too die of voluntary ignorance. 
Hira Bassett, current affairs pundit, speaking on H&E's Facing Facts Say Low Audience Politics show, acts shortly after this broadcast for poor ratings. Ensari Mandalore, Market Day, approximately six months later 937 days ABG. Mandalore was paradise. It was desolate, backward and lacked most of the limited comforts Phi had been used to even as a clone commando. But here he was no longer a soldier among civilians. Mandalorians understood military life. They were all soldiers, one way or another, and that made this an easy place to be. He stood in the unrelenting drizzle that had reduced Ensari's marketplace to a quagmire, and tried to remember why he'd agreed to meet Parja here. She told him. But these days he forgot so much. The war was over for him now. He wondered if he would ever be fit to fight again. I don't know how to do anything else, do I? What use am I now? You okay, Naviodi? A stranger a man in full Mandalorian armor, like everyone else here put his hand on Fi's shoulder as if to get his attention. Fi must have looked lost. It was a voice that Fi felt he should have recognized, but he couldn't. Can I help? Fi could follow the map Parja had given him. Some days he knew he'd forgotten something important, and some days he didn't realize it until someone told him. But just knowing there was something he missed was progress. Just over a year ago, he'd been on life support and declared brain dead. His recollection of his recovery was a patchwork of memories that could easily have been dreams. I'm waiting for my girl. Fai said steadying himself on the bevy ragger that Parja had given him. It was a hunting spear with a removable counterbalance weight on the other end and although he was in no fit state to hunt, it looked more respectable than crutches or a walking stick. He had his pride. He still struggled to find the right words, and he knew he sounded confused but... Yes, he was making progress. Parja told him so. She told me to meet her here. I forget things lately. I was blown up. The man, in that mid-green armor so many Mandalorians wore, stared at the sigil on Fi's helmet that marked him as a wounded veteran, and paused for a few moments, but didn't ask for an explanation. You're younger than I thought, he said. Fi's voice must have surprised him. Maybe he expected an older man inside the armor. I'll wait with you until she shows up then. It was a kind thing to do, as if Fi needed protecting here. He'd been used to being the one who provided protection. It rankled to be needy. You've got Parja and you're alive. Be grateful. But Fi wasn't grateful. Since he'd arrived on Mandalore, he'd come to understand how free men lived. Now he resented every moment he'd spent serving a society in which he had fewer rights than a droid. Who are you fighting for? The man asked after a long, awkward pause. Mandalore had supplied the galaxy with mercenary troops for generations, and the topic of commercial soldiering counted as social small talk. Did they pay well? Grand Army of the Republic. What pay? Another pause. Mandalore wasn't Republic territory, not by a long chalk. And now the Mandalorian knew Fi was a clone, too, not even accorded the respect of being paid for his fighting prowess. But that didn't seem to be a stigma here. Deserter. The man said no hint of disapproval. Discharged dead. Fi groped for the words. He knew what he wanted to say, but getting his mouth to obey him was another matter. He could feel sweat beating on his top lip like a regular medical discharge, only a bit more serious. It's okay, Naviodi, you're among friends here, said the man. Fett was a disgrace for letting the Kaminoans make clones for the Jedi out of him. It's not your fault. Don't feel sorry for me, Fi said defensively. He didn't want pity. 
The Kaminoans didn't care any more than Fed did if the clone army was happy and well treated just as long as it won wars. But he'd had Cal Scarata looking out for him. Our sergeant took good care of us. He adopted me as his son. We did fine. So I heard. You've heard a lot. It's a small planet. A fair few Q Valdar came back here when they'd finished training you. So the guy didn't know. The Mandalorian training sergeants handpicked by Fett hadn't all been fond of him, but they respected his prowess. And they'd been griping about life in Topoka City. Well, there were no more secrets left to keep. Everyone knew about the Grand Army of the Republic now. It was dawning slowly on Fi that Fett, Mandalore and Bounty Hunter, had been a good advert for Mandalorian grit, but his heroic status wasn't respected by some of his own people. The Alpha Arc clone troopers, hard men literally made in Fett's mold were scared of him, utterly loyal to his orders even after his death. But Fi realized that some Manduade here thought he was a selfish Chikar. Mandalore didn't have any leader at all now, and life still went on regardless. Fi could imagine the chaos on Coruscant if the Chancellor was killed and nobody was around to succeed him. Mando's just got on with life. It had happened before, they said, and it would happen again, but no nation worth its salt fell apart just because there was nobody on the throne. You got any kids? asked the man. Fi shrugged. I'm working on it. Sometimes Fi's old self surfaced unexpectedly. He'd been superbly fit, an elite commando, and most painful of all he'd had what Skirata called Paklalat, the gift of gab. He'd had a way with words. But the explosion on Gaftiker had put an end to that, and now he was an invalid, dependent on the care of a nice woman called Parja Brawler who didn't seem to mind that he wasn't quite the prize he'd once been. The man looked past Fi as if he'd recognized someone approaching in the bustle of armored figures lugging flexorap bags of preserved vegetables, machine parts, and an occasional five-liter container of tihar, the local triple-distilled alcohol that could actually be used to degrease engine parts. Is that your missus? He asked. Heading this way, on your six. Fi turned. Parge's dark chestnut braids swung beneath the chin level of her helmet, secured with red copper beads. With her deep scarlet armor, the overall effect in the gray drizzle was one of vivid autumn fruit. Yeah. That's her. I'll leave you then. You're in safe hands again. Again. What did he mean? By the time Fi turned around the man had melted back into the market day crowd. Parja shouldered her way through the press of armored bodies with the focus of a laser cannon and caught Fi's arm, pulling him to her to tap the forehead of her helmet against his. It was the only way to give someone a kiss in full armor. That was probably why some Arotais believed Mandalorians headbutted one another as a greeting. Arotais foreigners, enemies, traitors, or anything in between would believe any old Tosh, Fi thought. You made it. Parja said all approval. Well done, Sairai K. Making new friends, are you? Don't know. If I couldn't see the man now. He vanished. He was worried about me. Parja reached up and patted his helmet. She'd painted it with the Mandalorian letters M and S for mere shipper brain injury just like a battlefield medic might do for triage purposes. On Mandalore, the symbol functioned as a blend of a general warning to give the wearer a break, and a medal for combat service. He saw the sigil on your bicy. It told him you were disabled and why. Saves a lot of daft questions, you see, and folks know how to treat you. Fi had never thought of himself as disabled. Injured maybe, but not disabled. He told himself it was still early days and that Bard and Juzik was putting him back together a cell at a time with his Jedi healing techniques. What are we doing now? He asked. You've got to find your way to the cantina. 
Parja showed no trace of impatience even though he realized she'd probably told him a dozen times. I'm not going to prompt you either. Use the map. And what else have you got to do? Come on, tell me. Notes. Make notes as I go. Good. Make notes. Then all you have to remember to do is to keep looking at your data pad. Ensri was a small pimple on the map compared with just one of Karuskan's teeming termite hill neighborhoods, and the nearest settlement to Kiramorut, Skirata's refuge for clone deserters deep in the northern forests. It was more a trading post than a town. But from Fai's perspective, it was as complex and confusing as a labyrinth. He took the stylus from his forearm plate and checked his data pad. Events a couple of years ago even his artificially brief childhood were vivid, but he couldn't retain the day-to-day -day memories that everyone else took for granted. He oriented himself the way he'd once been trained, getting his bearings from landmarks like the grain silo on the edge of town and the basic magnetic compass on his forearm, and then trudged off. Once he learned to cope with that, he'd learned to use his helmet's head-up display again. One step at a time, Parja had said. She trailed after him. You're doing okay. Really, Sire I.K., you're getting better every day. I'm proud of you. How could Parja love him in this state? He felt crushed. But they met when he was already injured, and she never knew the fi he'd been. She loved him for what he was now. Tilings could only get better. I miss my brothers, he said. I miss Ordo, too. There were messages, occasional calm link conversations with Omega Squad and the Nullox who were his only family in any sense of the word, but Fi had lived his whole short life among other men like him. He'd never really been this alone. He felt suddenly guilty that Parja wasn't his entire world. She'd nursed him in those awful days after he was rescued from Karuskant, fed and cleaned him like an infant and her constant encouragement had made him walk again every bit as much as Juzik's force healing skills. Once, Fi could imagine nothing he wanted more than a nice girl who cared about him. He never thought that she might end up caring for him. Ordo's bound to drop by soon, Parja said. You know the nulls don't exactly run to a timetable. Anyway, Bardai K is due back in a few days for your next healing session. If I thought it was worth asking. Can I go home? Parja blinked. This is home, Fi. You don't mean Karuskant, do you? Yeah. No, you're not going back there. They were going to kill you, remember? They wanted to switch off your life support because they didn't think you were worth keeping alive. They'll probably confiscate you at customs as stolen Republic property. You don't need to go back to that stinking Dariim. Parja was angry about it, but it was a very distant brutality for Fi, something that he knew was terrible but hadn't fell because he'd been mercifully unaware in a coma. As he paced the route to the cantina with mechanical care, checking the map at every alley and crossroad, he tried to imagine Bessany and Captain Obrim desperately trying to save him from a callous system that put down permanently disabled clones like animals. Ordo said Bessany had pulled a weapon on the med center staff and kidnapped him at Blaster Point. He seemed fiercely proud of her. Sheer guts like that had the same effect on a Mandalorian male that a pair of long legs did on Urotai's. Female courage was irresistible. I can get past customs, Fi said. I'm a commando. Bessany went to a lot of trouble to get you out. I know. If I couldn't square Bessany's daunting blonde glamour with the rather lonely, methodical woman inside, let alone one who could start an armed siege. Never said thanks. You want to thank her? Wait till she visits. But I could say hi to everyone. Fi persisted. He rounded a corner, and the cantina was exactly where the map said it was. It was a small triumph. He took off his helmet and let the rain wash over his face, hating himself for talking like a simple kid. 
It's easier for me to go to them. Your brothers are deployed all over the galaxy. And I could see Atain's baby. That's a dangerous secret, Fi. It's not fair that Dar doesn't know he's a dad. The galaxy's an unfair place. It's safer that he doesn't know yet. Fi finally blurted it out without thinking. I don't belong here, Par Jike. I should be fighting. It's all I know how to do. I thought I wanted out, but I don't know what to do. The cantina doors were beaded with rain as if they had just been painted, the only part of the building that seemed to have been maintained in years. Concentrating on their glossy blackness kept the frustration and anger at his own helplessness from overwhelming him. But part of his mind never stopped whispering that he was nothing now, that he had no purpose or pride. It was his indoctrination surfacing. Sergeant Cal said so. Calbir reminded Fi a couple of times a week by calm that he was a free man and he didn't have to have any purpose beyond living his life to the full. It didn't feel that way right then. Fi couldn't shake the guilt that everyone was fighting the war except him and that he was a burden on Parja. She slipped her helmet off and clipped it to her belt. You've had quite a battle to get where you are now, she said quietly and nodded toward the doors. And you can be a soldier again, if you want, but not yet. I know it's hard. Try to be patient. I don't have time. Parja seemed to flinch every time he reminded her that time was running out twice as fast for him as it was for a normal man. They didn't talk about Kalbir's plan to stop the accelerated aging now. The genetic engineering secrets needed to stop it seemed as far away as ever. He was still searching for the right geneticists to make sense of co size research. You'll get time. Parja had a way of dropping her voice that got Fi's attention and compliance a lot better than yelling at him. Quiet menace summed her up. Even the way things are now, time's still on your side. Yeah. Fi, look at me. She clamped her hands on either side of his face and made him meet her eyes. You've got years ahead of you either way. So live them. And I'm not putting you back together so that you can run off with some erotic hussy with a fancy Coruscant manicure when you're fit. So you better marry me. Okay? Mando's marry young. We're both past the age. It's not right. Fi's first thought was that he needed permission from someone, probably Calbear. But he didn't, and that was scary. He could do whatever he wanted. All his life he'd had army rules and regs and procedures to follow, a structured existence, and now he was adrift on a sea of choices he never thought he'd have but without the capacity to make the most of them. I'm no use for anything, he said. Why do you want to marry me? Parja's eyes narrowed. They were very blue. I'll be the judge of what you're good for. You're fi, for a start, and that's a good enough reason. Now get your shebs into that cantina and show me you remember how to order any trigal and a meal. Fi was sure it was all bluster. He was amazed by her patience. She never cared how many times he dropped things or couldn't recall the right word. Her aunt Rav Brawler, one of the Kiwi Valdar who trained them on Kamino, said the engineer in Parja hated leaving any broken machine unfixed. Fi was the kind of restoration project that she relished. Will you still want me when I'm better? As he walked through the cantina doors, the bar seemed a more intimidating target than any beachhead. I might be too. The word eluded his lips, although his brain had selected gorgeous good to look at. Then I'll just have to wear a welding visor to shield my delicate sensibilities, Parja said. Several people in the cantina paused to look up. It was a small town on a small planet where everyone knew their neighbor's business, so they recognized Vi as a stranger. Or you can keep your helmet on at all times. Okay, I'll marry you then. Don't let me twist your arm. Maybe I can learn a trade. 
When your coordination improves, you can pull your weight in the workshop. It was always one with Parja, never if. Failure never occurred to her. As Fai stepped up to the bar, heart pounding because he wasn't sure he'd be able to find the right words to order ale, he was aware of two men to his right taking extra interest in him. He could hear them muttering over their drinks. Their helmets were stacked on the floor beside their table. Whatever else was wrong with his brain, Fai could still filter a conversation out of a hubbub of noise if it was about him. That's not the guy, I tell you. You can't tell. But he looks like him, I give you that. Too much like him. Who's to say where Fett sewed his has narrow, eh? They looked up as if they were suddenly aware that Fai was staring at them he was, and with irritation and changed the subject. Mandalorians had the tact of a drunken weak way, so they must have thought he would have been pretty offended by their comparison. Fai tried to keep his mind on the task at hand and fumbled for a credit chip. To Alesh, he said. And all Mandalorian cantinas could rustle up a couple of bowls of soup. And two soups. The barkeep, an older woman with the kind of thin, gaunt face that made her look as if she got her kicks by sucking the juice from sour cane, gave him a long and cautious stare. You're not from around here, she said in basic. Everyone from Ensory spoke Mandoy, but Fi had enough trouble with basic these days. She tilted her head slightly to one side to look at the helmet under his arm, and her expression softened. Ah. Okay, Verdike, is it G.I. dumpling soup or red gourd? Verdike. It was an affectionate term for a soldier. That warning sigil worked just fine. Gourd, please. G.I. soup was too much for him. If I couldn't face fish now, not after what happened to Koh Sai. The Kaminoan scientist was always referred to as Jehalfish Milan now that she was dead and dismembered fish made Fai feel oddly queasy. He handed over his credits. Parja claimed a table in a dim corner and settled him in a seat. You're doing fine, Sire Ike. Who do I look like? Fai knew he looked like every single one of his clone brothers and as far as he knew like Django Fett had at the same age. He indicated the two men still huddled over their ale with as discreet a nod of his head as he could manage. Fett's dead, and he was a lot older than me. Not Fett, Parja whispered, taking a vice-like grip on his hand as if to shut him up. One of your brothers. Spar. Sparark Trooper Alpha Zero Two had deserted even before the Grand Army was first unleashed at Geonosis. As Skirata always said, the man might have been an Alpha Plank, but he wasn't a fool. He's not my brother. Well, they say Fen Shaisa wants him to pretend he's. Fet's heir, just to keep up appearances. In case you hadn't noticed, we don't have a man Alor at the moment. Did you notice when you had one? Parja paused and looked as if she was going to smile. The point is that not having one gives the Arutais the idea that we're in decline. Let's face it, we never really recovered from losing our best fighters at Galadrin. We haven't had to yet. If I hadn't noticed the place falling apart. Mandoade didn't need much leading, although they did like to have a figurehead, if only to gripe about. A vivid memory sprang into his head and the language to express it. Fett's already got a son. Boba. He must be about twelve now. Cocky little jerk. Ordo shoved his head down the fresher for bragging that his dad could wipe the floor with Calbear. We need more than a kid right now, Fi, even if anyone could find him. He's vanished. Takes after his father. Careful, or Shaisa might ask you to play the fruit of Fett's loins. Test tube, more like. Fi recalled seeing Fett in Topoka City from time to time, a solitary, distracted figure who seldom mixed socially with the Kui Valdar he'd recruited. Fi wondered if the man Alor got a kick out of seeing millions of copies of himself all over the place, 
or if it disturbed him. Why doesn't Shaisa take over? Or one of the chieftains? The Fed name still makes the Aruatais tremble. Eliot or Ishaya Talin. Mandalorians always hit the nail on the head with their sayings. Family definitely was a lot more than blood. Technically, Fi was as much Jango Fett's flesh and blood as Boba was. Fi thought it was interesting how he didn't feel the man was anything like a father. I'm Mando Elis then, he said. Pure Fett. But with better luck with women. Parja submitted to the grin she'd been trying in vain to suppress. She rubbed his forearm with vigorous enthusiasm. Kandosi I. Jang said you had a way with words. I do believe it's coming back. Fi felt a little brighter. Yes, maybe he'd be as good as new one day, or near enough. He ate his soup with the unsteady hand of a child learning to feed himself facing the wall so that nobody would see if he spilled it down his chin. He did. Parja reached out a discreet hand and wiped it for him before he could fumble for a cloth. Six months ago, she said, you couldn't even walk upright without help. You're doing good, sire I.K. She knew exactly when he needed reassurance. I'm lucky. My friends saved me. They put me back together again. He'd once thought the bond with his original squad the brothers he was born and raised with was the strongest he would ever experience, and their deaths had devastated him. He couldn't imagine being that close to another living being again. Then he found an equally deep bond with Omega Squad. Now his bonds extended to a wider family, a rag bag of clones and not clones and even something that had once seemed unattainable a woman who loved him. Okay, Fi said. When I don't look so broken, we'll get married. He wanted to be his old self for her. She looked at him with a slight frown, and it occurred to him that she might have thought he was fobbing her off. Maybe she just didn't understand what he was trying to say. Words often didn't come out as he planned these days. Better get fit fast, then, she said. Calbear had trained his boys to set goals, no matter how small. The next ridge, the next morning, even the next footstep if things were going badly you had to keep your eyes fixed on that, and use it for strength and focus. By this time next year, Fi decided he would be the man he was before the explosion. He picked up his mug of any tragal and tilted it slightly in Parge's direction managing not to spill any, and forced a grin. I'll paint my armor specially, he said. Maybe it was time he stopped looking like the ghost of Gez Hoken, whose red and gray armor he'd scavenged. Any color you like. But Parja was looking past him toward the doors of the cantina, and her expression had taken on that tight-lipped, narrow-eyed I'm going to punch your head and look that he found oddly endearing. He turned carefully to see what she was scowling at. A man in green armor swaggered up to them and looked down at Fi. Then he lifted off his helmet, releasing wavy blonde hair in need of a good trim, and extended a gauntlet hand. Well, look at you, he said. Chip off the old block, or at least what the old block might have been if he'd had your start in life. You doing all right, Niviodi? Fi didn't have a clue who he was. He seemed to be the only one who didn't, though. The cantina was silent, one communal held breath. Parja stared the man in the face. You weren't just passing, she said sourly, and put her hand on Fi's forearm in a grip that said keep off. So before you even ask my old man's not available. Can't you see he's injured? The blonde man didn't seem remotely offended by the rebuff. He just smiled, all charm not that it worked on Parja and clasped Fi's other arm Mando style. You look baffled, soldier, he said. The name's Fen Shaisa. How'd you like to do your bit for Mandalore? Omega Squad observation point above the Hadrician Road, Horgab, Midrim. Darman had never been a gambling man. 
Now he knew why. He watched his creds disappearing as Otten's racing beetle powered to victory, unchallenged and unstoppable. The bug wasn't exactly greased lightning. But at least it knew where it was going, a skill that seemed in short supply among the local insect life. As the rest of the squad's beetles scuttled around chaotically, Odin's trotted on a straight, determined course toward the finish line a strip of detonite tape stretched across the upturned ammo crate that formed the makeshift racetrack. The others rushed back and forth, buffeting the walls and bouncing off them time after time as if they might eventually batter an escape route through the side of the crate. They just didn't have that single-minded focus that made a winner. Darman gave them five points for sheer persistence. Kendosi. Aten cheered. Sound carried for kilometers on the still air here, but inside a soundproofed helmet, a commando could yell to his heart's content. It had taken Omega's squad days to find the path up to this vantage point, and they wanted to lie low. Go on, Naviodi, show em what you're made of. That's my boy. Omega had time on their hands while they waited for separatist rebel convoys passing through Horgab's Mauge's desert, and beetle racing was literally the only game in town. It was a blistering noon, one of those days when climate-conditioned Katarn armor was a cool haven from the killer heat outside. Maybe it was too hot today even for the local insect life. Darman reached out to put his beetle back on course with a careful forefinger. Its iridescent scarlet wing cases reminded him of the day wings that he'd seen on Kalura, flies that lived for one frantic, gloriously colored day, and then died. Darman had once thought that going out at the top of your game was a noble exit for a commando, but after a couple of years exploring the wide world beyond Kamino, he'd worked out that it wasn't glorious at all. It was unfair. Life was short especially for a clone and increasingly depressing. Daywings just showed you in fast-forward what was going to happen to you all too soon. Darman sometimes felt just like the racing beetles, too, trapped, shunted from location to location without really knowing what the greater plan might be, and banging his head against the wall of a war that seemed neither winnable nor losable. He was fed up finding things in common with insects. He was a man, and he missed his girl. He wanted to go home and he had no idea where home was. Fai said it was Kirimorat. Darman decided it would be wherever Atain wanted it to be. Sometimes she touched him in the forest to let him know she was thinking of him, a distant, and almost disturbing sensation as if someone was creeping up behind him. Dating your Jedi General was a very bad idea, and he knew it, but the war had to end sometime and then he would have what Sergeant Cal called a normal life. What normality might turn out to be for a fast-aging clone and a prematurely retired Jedi he had no idea, but he was willing to give it a go. He prodded his racing beetle back on course again. Get a move on, D-Cut. It's that way. Hey, no cheating. C.O.R. turned to Niner for adjudication as course steward. Disqualified the unsporting bounder, Sarge. His beetles doped. Okay, I know I've lost already. Darman tossed a credit chip at Otten to pay the bet, then picked up his beetle and turned it toward the finish line. Comic relief had been Fi's job, but he was gone. C.O.R.R., his replacement, did his best to fill the role of squad wise guy and general cheering up operative. I just hate to see the poor thing bumbling around like that, all confused and pathetic. You'll never be a successful trainer if you get sentimental about the bloodstock, Dar. Niner edged across the ground on his belly and peered into the box, his shadow falling across one of the beetles. It paused to wave its antennae and tested the suddenly cool air before trotting over to C.O.R.R.'s chosen creature brilliant turquoise, very shiny and making amorous advances to it. I don't think it's mine's on the race, somehow, Naviodi, said Niner, getting back on all fours. Otten's beetle pottered on, as steady and single-minded as its temporary owner, and crossed the finish line. Yeah, Otten's done it again. Drinks in the winner's enclosure. 
They were on self-recycled water now. Darman fantasized about fresh, cold water from a faucet. And however much the procurement techies insisted that the filter system guaranteed that the recovered water dash, personal, water, they called it was as pure as a Naboo spring, he still didn't like the idea that he'd drunk it and excreted it several times before. It was unsettlingly warm in his mouth as he sucked the tube from the reservoir inside his armor. Still, it beat drinking someone else's. A big jug of ice water, a shower, and a nice soft bunk. Aden made a discreet fist, victorious. Oya. Pay up, losers. He held out his palm. That's eight straight wins. We'll make you a little trophy, at I.K. Darman picked up a cup like desiccated husk from some long dead plant. You can put the winner out to stud now. Breed thoroughbreds. Will I get striped ones or mauve ones if I made it with CORRs? It's not like mixing paint. You don't know much about genetics, do you? Niner scooped up the beetles in his hands and tossed them into the air. They scattered in a dazzling display of gem-like wings, vanishing into the heat haze. They could fly just fine. Why did they never try to escape from the racetrack? Why did they keep buffeting their stupid little heads against the sides of the ammo crate when they could just look up and fly away? Niner repositioned the blaster cannon on its tripod with its muzzle nestled discreetly in a cleft in the rock and fidgeted with the optics. He seemed increasingly restless and withdrawn these days, as if he had doubts about everything and couldn't discuss them with the squad. Maybe it was Fi, not just his absence, which was hard enough to take, but what had happened to him. If Fi had died, they might have handled that better than knowing he was brain damaged. They hadn't seen him since Sergeant Cal whisked him away to Mandalore. Sometimes he sent calm messages, but apart from mentioning some Mandalorian woman called Parja, who seemed to be a permanent fixture in his new life, he told them little. Juzik said he was improving, though. Darman recalled just how much Fi had wanted a girlfriend, and now that he had one, Darman had no need to feel guilty about Atain. Most human beings seemed happier when they had something that someone else didn't, but Darman, like most clones, he realized was uncomfortable when he had some advantage over his brothers. As far as General Zay was concerned, not that Zay believed a word of the cover story. Of course, Fi was dead. He was so far away now in every sense that he might as well have been. Juzik was gone, too. The whole team was drifting apart. Darman settled down in prone position and sighted up on the dirt road below, the only open terrain for kilometers, to wait for their target. Aten made a faint slurping noise as he sipped from his water supply. A shadow cast from the remains of an ancient fortress. Three crumbling walls of baked mud bricks provided some cool spots in their laying up position. A lot of battles had been fought at this pass. Speaking of genetics, Aden said, What really did happen with Ko Sai? Darman shrugged. When Kalber wants us to know, he'll tell us. I heard some weird stuff. How weird? That Cal took her research and killed her. Who told you that? Sev. Aden had been one of Vav's trainees, like Delta Squad, and Darman knew they still gossiped despite old feuds. Sev's talking through his shebs as usual. He said, Ko's sight got what was coming to her either way. I know, but what does Calbear want her data for? At least Aden wasn't feeling sorry for the Iowa bait. Darman had built up a good solid hatred of Kaminoans since leaving his cloistered existence in Topoka City, and sometimes wished he'd felt this way when he was close enough to settle a few scores. It was amazing how much human beings could accept as normal if they had nothing else to compare it with. I don't know, said Darman. Maybe he's going to sell it to the highest bidder. 
Niner locked a new power pack into his dees. Have you asked him? No, said Aten. Why don't you ask him, Dar? You're one of his favorites. Like Ordo and Fi. And maybe he wants a half-Jedi grandchild one day. C.O.R.R. laughed. But he's got Bard I.K., so he's got a full Jedi son, hasn't he? Darman felt uncomfortable. He didn't want to alienate his brothers, and he never thought of any one of them as being treated differently. Calbert doesn't have favorites. He probably thinks I'm the idiot of the litter who needs looking after. You want me to ask him? Darman didn't know how he'd broach it, but Skirata had infinite patience where his boys were concerned. I'll ask him. But now the question had started to bother him. It didn't make any difference how Skirata treated them, but the doubt had wormed its way into his head and it wasn't going to go away. He settled down into a more comfortable position, Dees resting in the crook of his arm and his visor's magnification set on maximum range, and waited. Which moron in procurement ordered Dees's with the clip on the left? C.O.R.R. muttered. He never seemed to like the commando issue DC-17 very much. The original brigades of commandos had been raised with the rifle since they were old enough to hold one, but cross-trained men like C.O.R.R. came to a new, and they griped. And on the sidearm, too. Can holster it right. A moron who never had to fire it to save his life, said Niner. Or thought that if you aimed right-handed then your left was free to reach for a reload. What a bunch of useless bevikes. Did you make that word up? That's the right word, isn't it? It means dash. Well, yes, but I've never heard it used as a term of abuse before, just anatomical. He's right, said Otten. I reckon that's the real reason we were trained to be ambidextrous. To allow for those ordine eyes in procurement. Darman liked his dece. Okay, the clip was a nuisance, but the thing never jammed in heat, cold or dust, it was accurate, and even swapping out the attachments was no more trouble than reloading. I'd like a verp, he said. They're lovely. Remember when we went out tagging terrorists with them on triple zero? Aten rolled his head to ease his neck muscles. That was you and Fi. So it was. Darman said missing Fi badly but careful not to hurt C.O.R.R.'s feelings by saying so. C.O.R.R. was a good comrade. After a few weeks, it had felt like he'd been part of Omega forever. But if Fi could have come back as well, it would have been great. The heat haze broke the ochre desert into shimmering mirages, dark pools that came and went as Darman stared at them. The fleet met forecasts said there was an 80% chance of sandstorms. Horgab was yet another backworld whose strategic value Darman couldn't work out. Yes, there was ore mining here, and the separatists needed plenty of ore if they were going to keep churning out droids but why didn't Palpatine concentrate on hitting the major population centers of Sep worlds? Why was the clone army spread so thinly? Darman answered himself aloud. All he's doing is stretching our supply chains. Calbir? Old slimy. Palps. He should leave the military stuff to the generals. Typical Shabla Sivi. The strategic genius sitting on his backside in his nice safe office. If there was anywhere that typified the thoroughly stupid strategy of this war, it was Horgab. The GR had too few resources to take the place, but too many to be so thoroughly defeated that the politicians took the hint and withdrew. It was a nicely sustainable operation. It could keep simmering at this level of grinding misery for years and probably would. Across a riverbed that hadn't seen flowing water in decades, about twenty clicks to the northeast, 
Two companies of the 85th Infantry were shawing up the regional government at Had. A distant bump 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 like a slow heartbeat started up, answered by the higher-pitched and more rapid bark of cannon fire. Darman saw fresh palls of black smoke forming in the distance. He could almost set his chrono by the regularity of the bombardment. The local Mauja clans rolled out their collection of artillery pieces just after lunch, driving Had's population into shelters at the hottest time of the day, and made the city a miserable place to be until the wind picked up at nightfall and the Maujasi went home for the night. It was as if they were doing a day's work, using their contracted hours for a bit of bombardment, then heading home to watch the Holovids. Two companies, fewer than three hundred men. It was pitifully inadequate, and there was little air support. The rest of the battalion was scattered across the region in platoons, taking ground one day and losing it again the next. That was why the squad had been sent in. They had one target a key Majasi leader called Jalak. Now they were waiting for him to show. You know, said C.O.R.R., if we just committed a few more air assets to this and bombed the Asik out of the settlements around this dump, nobody would have to boil their shebs off, and we could all go somewhere with better nightlife. Look at the place. It's all mountains. Hills, said Aten. They're still in the way. Air assault. C.O.R.R. had started life as a bomb disposal trooper, so he was still learning Mandoe as he went along. Predictably, he picked up profanities and slang first, just like Atain had. He was even creating his own. C.O.R.K., we'd be sent somewhere equally pointless to do it all over again, Aden said. And we've been told to win hearts and minds. No obliterating civilian villages. Civilians, my shebs. They're all armed. They don't need a uniform to be hostiles. Why does every species with a grievance against its neighbor end up being classed as a sep and added to our list? They're not even a different species here. Darman joined in the grumbling. Not like Gaftaker, where you could see who is who. They're all humans. They all look the same, too. A tiny dust storm on the horizon indicated ground vehicles moving in their direction. Niner clicked his teeth, mildly annoyed. It was a habit he seemed to have picked up from Skirata. I hate it when he thinks. Thinking just makes you dissatisfied. Yeah, that's my job, said Aten. Heard from Lysema? Not yet, Sarge. She'll send a message. Don't worry. I know she will. Aten said peevishly. We're getting married. What? You heard me. The news didn't take their attention off the road, but it certainly diluted it. Darman's gut flipped over. This was a whole new world. This was Dash. Impossible, Niner said. You can't get married. You're in the army. Aden meant stubborn in Mandoi, but it wasn't a negative word to Mandalorians. It implied tenacity and courage rather than bloody-mindedness. Aden was quiet and relentlessly methodical until something really riled him, and then he reverted to type as one of Vav's men fighting mad and unwilling to back down until someone knocked him down. Vav had beaten an animal reaction into them, a savage will that he said would keep them alive long after more reasonable men had given up and died. Show me the regs, Aden said. Darman could see his chin jut out in defiance, even with his helmet in place. Go on. Show me the regulation that says we can't marry. We were never intended to have families. But there are no specific regs against it, are there? No. But it's still stupid. Why? No clone needed to see his brother's face to know what was going on in his head. Darman could tell from the faint clicks and breaths over the helmet comm link that Niner was jumpy, as if he was panicking about something. 
But Niner was definitely not one of life's panickers. He was upset. He was trying to make an uncomfortable reality go away. Because you don't get a salary, Niner said at last. So you can't support a wife and kids. There are no married quarters either. There's Dash. Auden dug in for the full argument. He sounded as if he clamped his teeth together. Lassim is a Twi'lek. Twi'leks and humans can't interbreed. And she's got an apartment. Calbert paid for it. And she's got a job. So I don't need to support her. Bango's your case, Sarge. C.O.R.R. muttered to himself. Kept man, eh? Nice work. You're still crazy, Niner said. And it's not my case. It just is. Darman's plans for some kind of domestic happiness were now under threat. He pitched into backup Otten. They were men, not droids. They had a right to expect more from life. Skarada told them so. You think we can't marry because we're property, Sarge? Darman asked. Niner's voice hardened a fraction. I don't know. Go ask General Zay. Zay won't give a shab. Auden snapped. And if he did, what's he going to do about it? How's he going to tell the difference between what we do now and what happens when I've exchanged vows with Lasima? He's got a point, Darman said. It's academic. And I want a life. Auden was getting really angry now. If I survive, then I'm not going to be a soldier forever. He paused for a few moments, as if gearing up for something difficult. I want out. I want to leave. It was the first time any of them had said that aloud. Maybe it was the first time any of them had wanted it. Fai's departure had somehow opened the door to dissent and real ambition beyond the GR. In the awkward silence, C.O.R.R. seemed to be studiously avoiding the argument. Sometimes he still behaved in a temporary, I'm just filling in kind of way, even if it was clear that Fi was never coming back. Niner had his sergeant's don't argue with me voice on now. Your mind should be on the operation, not on getting out of the army. It is, Otten said, moving up beside C.O.R.R. and taking a firing position next to him. I can do both at the same time. In fact, one helps me do the other. No, it wasn't Fai's escape. Darman decided it was the arrival of Skirata's grandson that had started it. The child had given all of them the feeling that real life was going on without them and leaving them behind. If they'd been like the white jobs, the regular clone troopers who had limited contact with normal civilian life, then they might have managed to kid themselves that things weren't so bad. But they'd all spent time doing things that not clones took for granted. By giving them as much freedom as he could Skirata had made them far less satisfied with their lot. What about you and Atain Dar? Aden asked. What you mean are we going to settle down? Yeah. Atain would have to leave the Jedi Order. They didn't hold with relationships attachment, they called it but they didn't expect Jedi to be celibate, either. That seemed to be asking for trouble, Darman thought. One day they'd get some lovesick Jedi doing something crazy, whatever the training was supposed to knock out of them, and it wouldn't end well. You couldn't turn flesh and blood into unemotional droids, either clone nor Jedi. It wasn't healthy. It wasn't fair. We haven't talked detail, Darman said. But yeah, that's what I want. Kids? Darman thought of Skirata's grandson. Babies were all demand and hunger. Force-sensitive babies well, Atain would have to sort that out. It was all a long way off, if ever, and he didn't have to think about it. One day, he said. But not yet. Better get cracking on it, C.O.R.R. said helpfully. Before you get too old. Talking of cracking on, said Niner.
Stand by. Darman's gut nodded as it always did before action. He scrambled into a better vantage point and spotted what had grabbed Niner's attention, a thin line of repulsor trucks carrying routine supplies from the port, kicking up dust like a smokescreen. Auden released the reconnaissance remote, tossing the tiny sphere into the air to make its way across the narrow pass and hover, relaying images from the ground beneath. C.O.R. scrolled through magnifications in his HUD. Darman could see his brother's changing field of view and the point-of-view icons in his own head-up display. It settled on the southern wall of crumbling cliffs that flanked the road and when Darman switched to the same view he could see shapes suddenly emerging from the fissures like insects. I still reckon they've got tunnels into those positions, C.O.R. said irritably. Or we'd have seen them move in. Niner had a good line of sight down the wadi. Well, as long as they didn't see us move in. Remember, we're only after Jalak. Don't waste ammo on anyone else unless you need to. Each week, a rebel platoon had come along the dirt road to intercept shipments moving to Had from the port city of Rishon, and Omega had let them, simply observing and collecting intel. It was Jalak they needed to take out. Smart, resourceful, and the main man for planning, Intel said. Now the rebels were getting Larry, to use Muriel's favorite word. They weren't taking as many precautions. It still seemed pretty pointless to Darman, seeing as the Malja tribes weren't actually a threat to the Republic. He doubted they could even spell separatist. They just liked thieving and didn't like their government, which sounded an awful lot like Skirata. They wanted whatever they could grab. Had probably looked like a nice place to pillage. But they'd fire back when Omega targeted them, so Darman's vague sympathy evaporated faster than spit on the hot rocks around him. He sided up. The rebels had to assault the convoy at close quarters if they wanted to pillage, because an artillery bombardment would trash everything they wanted to take, and that made them vulnerable. Jalak would be with them if Intel was right in fair game in open ground. They could have a warren of tunnels in there. C.O.R.R. was persistent. And we won't even dent that if we can't call in airstrikes. When we're clear, I say we wander down and run a few scans. See what we can do to shut them down. Some of the Maljasi spilled down onto the road carrying parts of dismantled repeating blasters and sprinted across to scramble up the rocks and take up positions on the other side and assemble the weapons. There were now around thirty of them. There was no sign of Jalak. Darman had various images of the man in his HUD, checking them against each rebel he could get a clear focus on through the DC-17's optics. A few more than usual, Aden said. Maybe there's nothing worth watching on HNE today. Niner shook his head. Intel didn't say there was anything different about this supply run. Here we go again. Darman sighed. Intel's as useful as a third nostril. Stop listening to them. The convoy of repulsor trucks was a few minutes from the ambush point now, their security speeders riding ahead. They knew they'd have company. They always got hit one way or another. It was just a question of how hard, so why didn't the Republic just supply had with air transport to freight supplies into town? They were as stupid as those Shabla beetles. It would have stopped this ritual. It just proved to Darman that Palpatine was either running out of creds and resources, or he hadn't a clue how to run a war, or maybe both. Stand by, said Niner. We should warn the convoy we're here. I'm not risking it. One minute they're government sympathizers, the next they're rebels. You can't trust any of them. Darman planned to put a grenade or three into the northern face of the slope if things got too hot, starting with the rebels' rotary blaster position. The thing looked ancient. Warfare was a lot less high-tech here, but underestimating it was a good way to end up dead. There was still no sign of Jalak. 200 meters, said Niner. 
Darman heard the repeater's magazine click into position. Boy, there's definitely more of them than usual. We could abort, Aden said. Niner had his finger on the trigger. The rebels were now all between Omega's position and the convo. Not now. I make it 31. On top of a rock in the middle of nowhere. We're going to have to run for it. Should have brought the speeder bikes. When you see Jalak, take him, Niner said. If you don't see him, hold fire, shut your eyes, and leave the convoy to look out for itself. No heroics. It was brutal, but they weren't here to babysit supply chains for civvies. Darman motivated himself with the thought of the jug of iced water back at base and checked the range on the Dees. The reticule lined up on the antique rotary and the grenade's charge glowed red. The first dap of rebel blasters split the heavy afternoon air. The convoy's escort returned fire while the convoy tried to scatter, but there was no open ground. No jollock, said Niner calmly. Give it time. Aden turned away from the assault below. Shab, I hate this. We're not here to police traffic. It was still tough to stand back and let the convoy take it. Darman itched for an excuse to open fire. He'd gone charging to the rescue before on Kalura, breaking cover to save civilians, but he'd been a kid then on his second deployment. The longer you spent fighting, the more cautious you became. Battle hardening meant that you knew how dead you could really get. Darman would leave the daring do to the new boys now. What new boys? We're going to run out of reinforcements. Blaster fire spat and flared, smoke roiled, and Darman made an effort not to react to the screaming and yelling. Niner reached out and put his hand on his shoulder, saying nothing. Got him, said Kor. He paused and made a low rumbling noise in his throat for a split second, just like Sev. By the lead vehicle. Look at that filthy Hutian. For a moment Darman couldn't work out why C.O.R.R. had suddenly taken Horgab's civil war so personally, but when he magnified his HUD image he understood. Jalak yes, it was him was sporting a few pieces of white plastoid armor, trooper armor. He swaggered through the smoke as if there wasn't a firefight in progress. There was only one way he could have acquired it, and that made this battle suddenly very personal indeed. I wonder what happened to the poor white job he took that from. Siwar whispered, taking aim. Well, Shopface, here's where you find out that trooper armor isn't as hardened as Katarn Kit. Niner swung back to the repeating blaster. They hadn't bargained on this many rebels showing up, so they'd have to leave it behind. One good shot, and the Majasi wouldn't be able to pinpoint the location in all this confusion. Soon as we're sure he's down, bang out, Niner said. Got it? C.O.R.R. squeezed the trigger without another word. Darman saw the plume of hot vapor like a puff of smoke rise from Jalik's head and the rebel leader nothing special, balding, maybe fifty seemed to leap for a moment before falling backward against a burning truck. Still moving, Darman said. Anand squeezed off a shot. Not anymore. Niner scrambled to grab his dice. Okay, job done, let's go. They could be down the slope and out into the rocky hills before the Majasi had worked out what had happened. They could have. Sniper! Sniper! The shout rang out across the wadi, and the firing paused for a moment. Then something whooshed a meter or so above the crumbling wall of the fort sending Darman and the others diving for cover. A mortar exploded some distance behind them. The next one would probably get the range right. We're screwed, C.O.R. said wearily, and snapped off his D's sniper attachment to replace it with the ion pulsar. They know we're here. By the time we get to the bottom they'll be waiting for us. Darman counted again, maybe twenty rebels still standing. We can take twenty. 
Niner knelt down and aimed the repeater. I'll give them something to think about, and you lot bang out. Darman ignored him and loaded a few grenades. Aten and C.O.R.R. didn't jump to obey orders, either. Don't start that, Sarge, Aten said. You know we don't do that. Let's go. Some repulsor trucks had now managed to pull back and were making a run for it back toward Rishin. Another mortar round shaved a meter over the squad's heads, way too close. The air was thick with pulverized rock and smoke from a burning vehicle. Darman switched filters on his visor with a couple of blinks and saw chaos in the haze, more debris than he expected and a lot of bodies. Okay, go. Go. Darman ran at a crouch for the exit point, thinking the others were following, but the faintest movement in Niner's HUD point of view icon caught his eye. Through the haze that hung in the narrow pass, there was a growing tide of movement. Shapes ones and twos at first, then dozens were pouring out of openings in the sides of the wadi. I make that about a hundred, Niner said quietly, stacking what ammo he still had next to the repeater. C.O.R.R. swallowed audibly. Tunnel network, he said. Told you so. The rebels had a lot more troops than Intel or Omega had thought, and they were all coming out to play. And they knew exactly where Omega were now. It was one thing to fight past twenty rebels when you had armor and they didn't. A hundred that was a different matter. Oh. Shab, said Darman. Private booth in the haunch of Nerf Cantina, Coruscan University Quarter. Mandalorians were lying savages, loyal to nobody and congenitally violent. They'd steal anything that wasn't nailed down, they'd kill for a bet. That was what a lot of folks thought of Mandoade, and Cal Scarato was now relying on that thuggish stereotype to cover his tracks. The last thing he wanted any Aruatai to know was that he needed information for purely emotional reasons. It always made negotiations harder. So, can you help me out or not, Professor? He fixed the biologist with his best I'm not just some ignorant grand expression and leaned back so that the shoulder holster under his best bantha hide jacket was partially visible. Nobody took much notice of armored Mandalorians on Coruscant but he preferred to work in plain clothes here. It just provided one connection too many if anyone bothered to join up the dots. I don't know how much university biology professors make a year, but I'm betting it's not millions. He Lamar was sitting in on the meeting to add a little medical expertise, and Mario provided a credible impression of hired muscle. The professor was Dr. Ryan Nenelin. He was a gerontologist, the best in his field, and that was the kind of expert Scarada badly needed. I have a comfortable lifestyle, Nenelin said. I'd have to have a very good reason for putting that at risk. They say you know more about the aging process than any being alive. Do you mind my asking what your interest is? Marilmo Arc Lieutenant N7 stood behind Scarada. My father's not getting any younger. He's such a cute kid, said Scarada. Takes after his mother. Okay, let's just say I have some parts of a puzzle, a puzzle that might make a lot of creds when complete, and I'm looking for someone who can help me work out what the missing parts are. Is your interest professional? Nenelin asked. I'm a Mandalorian, said Scarada. It didn't do any harm for the guy to realize what he was dealing with. Do I look like I might be motivated by a Republic accolade for scientific advancement? Pecuniary, then. And if the topic is the process of aging, then which parts of the puzzle do you have? I bet I know what you're thinking, said Scarada. I'd be very surprised if you did. The prof was remarkably lippy for an unarmed desk jockey alone in a room with three Mandalorians, even unarmored ones. Scarada thought it was a shame he couldn't slap some respect into him. You're thinking this is about some rejuvenation scam. Most entrepreneurs are on the brink of discovery, if only I can give them a little help. 
You'd be surprised how many pharmaceutical opportunities one get offered Master Fal. Fal. It was an alias Skarada hadn't used before. He wondered why he'd chosen to use the name after so many years. Skarada had been his only reality since childhood. Actually, it's an industrial process. He said forgetting about Fallon Matran. The only thing he could remember about Quatin now was a green transparent steel wall in his parents' apartment that made the whole room feel as if it was submerged in shallow tropical water. If I can resolve one aspect of it, it'd be worth a great deal to the cloning industry. Mario was usually the one who skated on thin ice when it came to shaking down a target. Now Skirata heard the null inhale slowly, carefully, as if he was getting ready to interrupt. Hide stuff in plain sight, son. I taught you that, didn't I? I'm struggling here, said Nenelin. I don't know much about commercial cloning. Well, that's an oversight for a clever boy like you. Skirata smiled all acid. Commercial cloning spanned now under wartime legislation. That's bad news if your business is based on clones. It means you can't replace them. They age fast, you see. It's partly the mechanism for maturing them fast, but it's also common sense if you make clones, you want repeat business, so you build an obsolescence. Great for clone masters, but right now plenty of businesses can't replace clone labor, and they want to make the most of the workforce they still have. They'd like to stop them from aging so fast. Nenelin looked at Skirata long and hard. Skirata decided he didn't like the man much. He wore an old-fashioned tunic, the kind that out-of-touch aristocrats still favored which probably explained why he hung out at the haunch of Nerf. The place was tricked out to look rough-hewn and ancient, its tables inaccurately imagined replicas of antique rural feasting trestles and instead of pour splashed plates it served its meals on pleat trenchers. The ale was specially brewed to make sure it remained authentically cloudy and full of unidentifiable lumps. Nenelin probably thought this was how the working classes once lived in some bucolic idol of coarse plenty that never actually existed, and that somehow this was a desirable state to revert to. You've got no idea, chum. You should try the real thing. I'm not sure I want to be complicit in the exploitation of clone sentient beings, said Nenelin. Muriel sat down next to him and gave Skirata a weary look. It's tantamount to slavery. What a great time to find an Arotai with half a conscience. Skirata decided it was one he only wore in public and looked to Helamar to pick up on the technical stuff. It wasn't his area of expertise. But he'd been a proper doctor once, and he knew how to phrase the science stuff. Do you know how Arcanian Micro grows human beings to adulthood in a year or so? Helamar asked. How any cloners operate? In theory, yes. Do you work for the Arcanians? Skarada didn't have to say yes or no. Nenelin's assumptions did the lying for him. If we worked for Arcanian Micro, We'd be breaking the law by working on cloning projects with a ban in force, wouldn't we? I suspect that turning their production over to pedigree nerf bloodstock wasn't an option. I couldn't say. But Nenelin couldn't resist filling in the gaps. He enjoyed being clever. He probably thought all Mandalorians were semi-literate grunts. If I were Arcanian Micro... I'd want a stopgap solution a way of extending the life of my product during the ban, but one that I had the option to reverse. An aging switch, Skarada said. Something of an impossible dream in normal beings. But with organisms designed to mature and age faster, it would be more a matter of restoring the status quo for the species in question. Exactly. Skarada kept Helamar in his peripheral vision waiting for the point in the conversation where he would have to step in and discuss technical stuff with the professor. And we're talking about humans. Which is your specialist area? I need to see. A specimen genome. Helamar leaned forward slightly. 
This is highly confidential data, and we'd like some reassurance that you understand how very sensitive this is. Nenelin looked irritated. Like Master F.A. said, any cloning activity, direct or ancillary, is illegal within the Republic unless licensed. And of course, no researcher in your position would compromise their reputation with illegal work. So they all understood each other. If Nenelin helped them, he'd lose more than his job if he revealed his source. And he seemed hooked now. Finding out exactly how clone masters controlled maturation was heady temptation for a gerontolo dash. Gist. Most commercial cloning research took place in-house, each company with its own closely guarded industrial secrets. Cloning companies spied on one another, didn't share data, and weren't averse to enforcing non-disclosure agreements with staff the hard way with a blaster, or worse. Skirata could almost see Nenelin's thoughts forming like a hologram above his head, the glittering bronzium globe of a Republic science accolade, and rippling applause. Gotcha. Helamar held out a data chip. Here are some sequences for you to examine. The geneticist on this part of the project was silencing genes H78B and H88, one by zinc and one by methylation. Interesting said Nenelin, inserting the chip into his data pad and frowning at the screen. I'd have expected some manipulation of telomere length via checkpoint genes. Not those two. Yes, that's very interesting indeed. He paused as if framing a delicate question. Are you really a Mandalorian? You mean how come I can use big words and don't walk on my knuckles? Well, some of us evolved. Helamar snapped his thumb and forefinger together in demonstration. See? Give us a few more weeks and we'll invent a wheel. Nenelin had clearly riled the dock. Skirata willed Helamar not to take a swing at him. I meant that you sound as if you had a scientific education. Nenelin said carefully. Just a country doctor, Helamar said. I don't think Mandalore has produced a geneticist of note since Demigol. Nenelin's expression said that he felt he ought to have known who Demigol was, but he didn't, and so had no idea if Helamar was mocking him or not. When he found out if he found out he'd discover the insult. But Skirata could see that the biologist was now firmly hooked by insatiable curiosity, and a small matter like comparison with the most notorious and loathed scientist in Mandalorian history wasn't going to divert him from his quest now. There was always the chance that Nenelin would fail to come up with anything useful. Ko Sai, filthy Iwabate though she was, had been an exceptional genetic engineer, perhaps the greatest ever. She'd be a tough act to follow. This isn't the entirety of your material, is it? Of course not, said Skirata. But we have associates who'd be emphatically disappointed if we handed you the whole file. Nenelin looked to Helamar as if he was the Mando with the brain cell. What do you want me to do, then? Look at the data I've given you and tell me if the silencing of those two H genes would affect any in the cluster at chromosome 9A, or possibly 14B. You've pinned that much down, then. You tell me. It's more than just telomere activity you need to control if you want to stop accelerated aging. But I suspect you know that. Do you mind my asking the obvious, though? Nenelin had a smug little smile. Skirata thought he probably spent far too much time with adoring students who thought he was a god. Maybe he should have let Helamar smack Nenelin after all. If you're... Associates manage to achieve controlled acceleration of aging, then they'd know the route to roll back from that to an unaltered genome. Helamar managed a smile even more smug than Nenelin's. They're not just manipulating maturation of humans, he said. I can't reveal too much, obviously, but they might even be adding material from another individual's genome or building wholly artificial genes. 
You know the havoc that would play with the expression of characteristics. Menelin's eyes seemed to light up at the mention of artificially created genes. Maybe that was a daring new adventure for these lab jockeys. Or does this data come from a rival, and so you're lacking critical parts of it? Skarata cut in. Let's just say the geneticist who could best help us is a little indisposed because she's dead. That knocked the smirk off Nenelin's face. Skirata hoped that his cloudy mock rustic ale choked him, but not before he did something useful. He hadn't even asked how much he'd get paid. Skirata didn't trust anyone who didn't have a price. I have a condition, Nenelin said. Skirata nodded. Nice normal greed. That's a relief. Of course. If I can solve your little puzzle, then I want to be able to use the research for my own study. No embarrassing revelations about the source, of course. I give you my word. It wasn't as if the guy would forget it once he'd worked it out anyway. You didn't forget that kind of stuff, and so it was bound to influence whatever experiments he was running at the university. But Skirata didn't give a mot's backside what Nenelin did with the data as long as he got what he wanted a way of stopping the relentless accelerated aging in clones, specifically his clones, his boys his sons. The definition of Skirata's responsibility had expanded since he'd first decided to look for a solution, and now he was ready to offer the cure to any clone in the Grand Army who wanted it, but his immediate circle, his family, came first. Shab will even pay you, Skirata said and casually tossed him a high-denomination cash credit chip as if the scientist was a waiter. That'll help you make a start. Buy some test tubes or whatever it is you use. It's refrigeration, hydraulic shearing machines, and cuvettes, Nenelin said. But thank you. We'll be in touch every week by calm. Skirata got up and headed for the exit. Pleasure doing business, Doctor. Nenelin. Mariel and Hilamar followed Skarata out into the main salon of the cantina, through a noisy, braying crowd of well-spoken patrons with the same air of faded nobility that Nenelin had. And they say clones are all the same, do they? Skarata's ingrained mistrust of the social classes above him came from more than just his quaddy roots. It was the way they combined detached cluelessness with their certainty that they knew best. That was what got his adrenaline prompting him to take a swing every time. He inhaled the cool air in the alley outside. It felt as if he was surfacing from drowning. Even the alley was built in a mock ancient style, trying to pass itself off as some baronial fort. It was a year old if it was a day. Skirata pulled three strips of rook root from his pocket, handed them around, and chewed thoughtfully. What do you reckon, Midge? Let's see what he comes up with. Is he talking through his shebs? Well, if he is, then at least we'll know what his methodology is so we can rule it out, said he Lamar. Knowing what doesn't work is as useful a clue as any in genetics. Promise me you won't kill him until you get something useful out of him. It'll be a challenge, Hilamar said. I could have fun testing a large-gauge rusty syringe on that guy. Now you want me to look in on Cad I.K. before I pay my respects to Zay and tell him where to shove his offer? See Zay first. And no insertion instructions. Wadi and I. Well, we're not exactly persuaded that training more covert ops troopers is a productive use of Amandoad's time. Here we go again. Covert ops clones had been tasked to assassinate renegade arc troopers. Helamar and Tehai had taken that news very badly, although maybe not as badly as Darman, who'd ended up killing two of them. The Republic was rotten at its core. More maggots tumbled out every time Skirata shook it. Clones forced to kill clones, yes. Skirata could see it was one insult too far. Midge, Skirata said, the more of us back on the inside, the better. You can get any information you want. 
Jane and Mariel can slice into any system in the Republic including the Treasury. Why don't you just fleece Palpatine of his reserves and we can all thin out? Skirata concentrated on not blinking. Helamar had no idea how accurate that comment was. Skirata hated deceiving him, but what he didn't know couldn't get him into more trouble. He knew what he needed to know, and no more. Yeah, but you can steer events, Skirata said. You want to see Priest or Ro back in? You wouldn't. Not them. Helamar boiled. He loathed both of them to the point of violence. They had the makings of the Death Watch in them, those two. Him and that perverted secret fight club, her and that let's conquer the galaxy again Osik. That's not what either of us want Mandalore to be, is it? I know how to get you going, don't I? Helamar scratched the bridge of his nose thoughtfully. The conspicuous break in it from a particularly fierce game of Get Shook made him look more like a man who handed out injuries than one who healed them. That was also true, of course. Just keep me away from them. Him especially. Django must have been mad to recruit him. Joking, Midge. Okay, tell me what you're really looking for. Any clue about the timing of a shift in strategy? Skarata said. Like I said before, there's a big sea change coming and I want plenty of notice so I can get our boys out. Helamar stood with hands on hips, staring down at Skarata's boots. Okay, just for you. And get that leg fixed, will you? It's a simple op. What are you, a martyr or something? Maybe I am. Skarata had lived with the aftermath of that ankle injury for nearly forty years. He rationalized it as a reminder of stupid risks, but perhaps it was a penance. He couldn't sleep in a bed now, either. On the night he'd rescued Ordo and his brothers from the Kaminoans, he'd slept in the chair to keep an eye on them, and from that point on he felt that rest in a comfortable bed was off-limits to him until he fully secured their futures. Ritual ritual to keep the fates appeased, to focus him, whatever had eaten a big chunk of his life. You're right, Skarada said. I'll get it fixed. Helamar went on his way. Mariel, unusually quiet, strolled in the other direction toward the speeder parking area. Well, our professor's bold moral stance on not exploiting poor downtrodden clones like me didn't last long, did it? He said. He's got the breaking strain of a warm butterloaf. Son, said Skarada. If all scientists had nice shiny consciences, we'd still be fighting with stone axes. Who do you think developed all those handy blasters, lasers, and ion cannons? A lot of academics don't support the war, though. Yeah, but if you went back in there, told our overeducated friend what you were, and asked him to liberate you and your clone brothers, he'd be out the doors so fast you wouldn't see his shebs for dust. It's a theoretical principle for him. It's not personal. Worse than that he's not even motivated by creds. I hate a man who's driven by a vision. You can't trust him. And you're busting a gut to free us just for the cred ships and the plunder, of course. That's different. You're my boys. Anyway, it's not as if we're stuck with him. He's just one scientist working on a fragment of the data. And he's not going to be chatting about the approach over a CAF in the university common room, is he? None of them will. They'll all potter away on their own section of the genome, thinking they're privileged with some secret, and never have the full picture. Sooner or later, we're going to have to try it out. The cure, I mean. Fry it on me. It had to be tested on a clone. Skirata didn't see any of them as expendable, even rank and file troopers he'd never met, but the thought of trying some unproven therapy on any of his own boys scared him. He couldn't try it out on himself. It was the one sacrifice he could never make for them, however much he wanted to. We'll make sure we know how to undo the effects of it before we get to that stage.
Scarada said, ruffling Muriel's hair. I won't take risks with your health. Muriel laughed. Lots of nice healthy firefights instead. You could go home to Mandalore now and never fight again. Scarada felt instantly guilty. It didn't take much where his kids were concerned. Nobody's forcing you to fight now, son. I'm not sitting on my shebs while my brothers fight either. Muriel seemed more interested in an illuminated sign a little farther ahead than avoiding premature old age. He quickened his pace. Sooner or later, though, we might have to use Kadaike's tissue samples. Skirata shook his head. Etain hadn't objected to letting Kosai take a look at her son's genome, but Kosai had been their prisoner, held in isolation. There was nothing the Kaminoan could have done with the knowledge. Once some other gene cruncher got wind of the fact that Darman and Etain had a son, though, the baby would be a valuable commodity. Half Jedi, half perfect soldier, that was a genome a lot of companies and governments would kill to get their hands on. It's too dangerous, Merike, Skarada said. They can detect the midichlorians. They'd know. Maybe only the Jedi Council has the kit to do that. Wouldn't they see there was material in the cells that didn't add up? Kadaike is the only child of a clone that we have, and home of the aging genes aren't present or at least what we think are those genes. Mariel didn't sound desperate, just patient, as if Skirata didn't realize things and needed a biology lesson repeated with helpful diagrams of squalls and jockrabs. I thought the maturation genes the Kaminoans added to the basic Django model were recessive, for their own business reasons, but it's never quite that simple in genetics. Add takeaway, or change one gene even move its position and it can have a massive impact on the expression of all the others. They're all connected somehow. It's not a simple case of chopping bits out of gene sequences or adding them. If it was, cloning wouldn't be such a profitable or secretive business. It's very hard to get right. Skirata didn't want to argue. The whole quest was his idea. He could hardly turn around now and say there was a limit to how far he would go to save his clone sons from an unfairly early death. Skirata wasn't sure now if his own reluctance was based on fear of exposing Katakar to discovery or just a general unease about using the kid for genetic research in any way. That was all, too. Kaminoan. Kid? My grandson. He really is my grandson now. We can approach it from the embryology end, too, Mariel said. Doctor. Eliam Banyora. Everything I've read suggests he's the top man when it comes to development. Let's tell him we want to see if we can clone humans with extended active life spans for manual labor. Cover stories needed to have just enough truth in them to look like the real thing. Skirata wondered whether to just tell them the truth. That he'd been one of life's losers until his unhappy life had been transformed by a bunch of clone kids who needed him simply to survive. And so now he would do anything, absolutely anything, to give them a normal life and the lifespan that went with it. If the scientists wanted the biotechnology as the price of saving his boys, he'd pay it. He didn't care. He just wanted them to have lives like other men. You know what I find funny? Skirata unlocked his speeder, the spoils of war commandeered from a Jabimi terrorist who was too dead to need it now, and realized the sign that had caught Muriel's attention was outside a confectionery store. Clones, always peckish, tended to have a very sweet tooth. Maybe it was linked to their maturation, the metabolic need to fuel all that fast aging. That the guy could look you in the eye and still not know what you are. Even now, most Aruatais here don't know what a clone trooper looks like. Nor did they care, by and large. But some did like Bessany Wenin, and when they cared they could move mountains. Mario paused. Can you wait a few minutes while I get something, Calder? Candied nuts. Nuts slice. 
I hear that store does very good nuts slice. Scarada fished in his pockets automatically and crammed a stack of credit chips into Muriel's hand. Time we got some bank accounts sorted out for you all, he said. Muriel shrugged. We're not short of creds, any of us. I mean real bank accounts, not skimming off the Republic's budget. In case anything happens to me. Bear, we can slice into any banking system in the galaxy, like Midge said. We're big boys now. And nothing's going to happen to you. Skirata walked a precarious line between wanting to protect his adopted sons from an unforgiving galaxy and giving them the space the Republic denied them to be independent. It was a parent's dilemma, magnified many times and complicated by their accelerated compressed lifespans. He didn't want to dole out pocket money to them like kids. These were fighting men, and they deserved the wherewithal to lead their own lives, all the simple routine choices that citizens had. I don't mean money laundering, Skarada said. I'll get Jing to set up personal accounts for you all. Private, to spend as you like. None of my business. Muriel laughed and strode off toward the brightly lit sign. I'll only blow it all on fast speeders, slow women, and overpriced candy. Skirata sat in the driver's seat and waited for Muriel to return with his booty, checking the messages on his comm link to pass the time. No, he didn't have to worry about Muriel. The lad was sociable, confident, and guaranteed to find a way of fitting in wherever he went. Of the six nulls, he was the one best able to deal with the demons the Kaminoans had forced on him. But the others Aiden, Kamarke, Jane, and Prudiai kept Skarada awake at night to varying degrees. And Ordo. I'm too protective. Ordo can cope. He's a grown man. And he's got Bessany. Skarada stared at the Comlink's miniature screen without really seeing it. He tried not to have favorites, but from the moment two-year-old Ordo had aimed a blaster at a Kaminoan to try to save his brother Nulls from termination, the kid had been his heart and soul. And now he'd sent Skirata the usual stack of Citrap text comms. There was a file of budget data, with a note that there appeared to be some big procurement projects due to deliver around the third anniversary of the war. That time slot appeared to be increasingly significant. Ordo had added a terse line. I disposed of a rep intel agent tonight. He was trailing Bessany. I suggest we persuade her to leave for Mandalore before something serious happens to her. I also married her. Skirata read the last terse line a couple of times. He'd raised his boys as good Mandos, and the pressure to marry young must have seeped in deep without Skirata noticing he'd even put it in their heads. The nulls were late starters by Mando standards. Marrying at sixteen was common. My boys grown up and left home. It was a private deal between a couple, nothing to do with anyone else, but Skirata felt a little excluded by the suddenness of it and scolded himself for feeling that way. Ordo was still playing the big brother to everyone just as he had in Topoka City, but Skirata shared his worries. Trouble was coming. They could even guess at a possible date for it. All that mattered now was getting out in one piece with as much capital as possible and a method for reversing accelerated clone aging. Skirata's priority was his underground escape route for clone deserters something that had started with his nulls, then spread to include his commando company, and now extended to any white job the ordinary clone trooper who wanted something else out of life. It was Skirata's sacred mission. He was wedded to it. But how many of the white jobs want to leave the army? How many of them can even conceive of the life they've been denied? He couldn't save one million men, let alone three. He'd save as many as he could. They had, after all, saved him in a way that went far beyond stopping him from getting killed in combat. Come on, Merike. You buying the whole store or something? Skirata scrolled through the remaining messages. Most were business, 
Fencing all the valuables that Vav had stolen from the Maijito bank vaults was taking time, as was laundering the bonds and credits. Then there were updates from Rav Brawler on Mandalore, letting him know how the construction of the bastion in Kiramora was going. He almost missed the last message. It was very short. Dad, Razan's missing. We haven't heard from her in months. We need to talk. Yours, Ijot. It was from one of his sons. Not his clone sons, the kids he put everything on the line for. It was his biological son, Ijot, whom he hadn't spoken to in many years and with his other son, Tor had declared him Darbir, no longer a father. Aruatais didn't understand Mando family law but to be divorced by your own kids was one of the worst disgraces for any Mandalorian. Razan Skirata hadn't seen his daughter in years either. But she hadn't signed the Darbir Declaration, and that had always given him some hope that she didn't hate him for the divorce. My little girl. She's missing. The hatch opened and Muriel slid into the passenger's seat, pockets bulging, but the grin died on his face. Beer? He stared into Skirata's eyes. Beer, what's wrong? Skirata hadn't realized his shock and fear were visible. He hadn't realized tears were running down his face, either. My daughter, he said. My girl's missing. Skirata had two families, both in need, and no Mandalorian could ever turn his back on his kids forever, even if they disowned him. We'll find her then, Bear, Mariel said matter-of-factly. After all, she's family. Skirata hoped she was. Family took a lot more than genes to hold it together. Chapter 4 No, I'm not going to play Manalor. Okay, you can tell everyone I'm Fett's son if that makes them happy, but you can keep the politics. And I want payment. It'll crimp my mercenary earnings. Spar, formerly Arc-02, to Fen Shaisa, unconvinced that Mandalorians need him to masquerade as Fett's legal heir. Crag at restaurant, lower levels, Coruscant, 938 days ABG. Hi, sweetie. The Twi'lek waitress greeted Atane with a big smile. The usual? That'd be great, said Atane. Thanks. Nobody wandered into the Craggit by chance. It was a place for regulars, a greasy-looking diner right on the edge of the lower levels, and so it was popular with those who spent a lot of time in the lawless neighborhoods nearby the Coruscant security force. Jedi General Atain Termukin was now a regular here, too, but it wasn't the Craggit's lavishly greasy all-day breakfast that lured her. It was brief and secret visits to see her son. She named him Venku, but now he was known as Cad Cad I.K., Little Saber. Cad was now nearly a year old and Atain's heart broke anew each morning at the prospect of being separated from him for another day. The fact that he had a small army of doting babysitters did nothing to dull the pain of having to keep her motherhood secret from everyone, including Cad's father. The longer this went on, the harder it would be to tell Darman that he had a son. Etain settled at a corner table and got a nod from CSF officers she knew by sight but not by name. Her brown Jedi robes gave her a kind of anonymity, much like the clone's armor. Nobody asked why she was slumming it down here, because Jedi often did marginal jobs, and anyway she was Cal Skirata's buddy. CSF, and Captain Jailer Obrim in particular, were very chummy with Skirata and his boys. One of the officers paused in mid chew as Atane sat down at a nearby table. General, have you heard from Phi lately? He's doing okay, she said. The CSF officers knew Phi wasn't dead. They'd helped Bessany rescue him. Atane was comforted to know she wasn't the only sane woman who did crazy, dangerous things for the welfare of clone troopers. He's even got a girlfriend now. There was a ripple of approving comments from surrounding tables. The cops liked Fi. Everyone did because he was a funny, friendly guy, 
but he had legendary status within CSF. He'd once thrown himself on a grenade to shield CSF officers, and that bought a man serious respect. Katarn armor had saved him that time. It hadn't saved him from brain trauma on Gaftiker. Even Fi ran out of luck sooner or later. If he ever comes back here, said the officer, tell him to drop by the social club, won't you? I'll do that. Serana, the Twi'lek waitress who managed the Kragat day shift, sidled over to Atain and put a cup of mild brew CAF in front of her. Lassim is running a little late, she said. Anything wrong? No, she's been out buying baby clothes. Serana gave her a knowing wink. She was getting on a bit, as Darman put it, but still magnetically glamorous, with the flowing walk of the dancer she'd once been. Kadaike is outgrowing everything. That's a baby in a real hurry to grow up. Takes after his grandfather for sheer impatience. My baby? That's my baby. I'm not the one choosing his clothes. I'm not the one who feeds him and puts him to bed each night. Did Serana know he was really at Tain's? She hadn't shown the slightest hint that she did. But Skirata tended to surround himself with people who knew the rules and kept their mouths shut. The stakes were high. So what? So what if the Jedi Council kicks me out for fraternizing with Darman? She was on the point of coming General Zay to confess, as she was at least once a day. But she'd lose her rank and command. She couldn't turn her back on the Grand Army now, not when they needed every Jedi officer they could get. Barden's not a Jedi anymore, though, and he's still making himself useful. Her whole reason for keeping her child a secret had evaporated when Bard and Juzik turned his back on the Jedi Order. It hadn't changed a thing. He was as deeply involved in the war and helping clone troops survive as he'd ever been. Atain stared into her mug of CAF and wondered if she'd just become too comfortable with her rank, or even if she was more worried about what the masters of the Jedi Council thought of her. They say that however old you are, you still want your parents' approval, deep down. The doors opened. Lasima walked in carrying Kadaike on one hip and a shopping bag in her free hand looking the part of the busy young mother. Atain couldn't pretend it didn't hurt. She tried to look casually interested, as any woman might when admiring a friend's child, but it was hard. When he started crying it tore at every nerve in her body. She wanted to grab him. It was an urgent, primal instinct. Several cops stopped Lasima to coo over Cat I.K. His crying was a half-hearted grizzle, more a long complaint than anything, and he squirmed in Lasima's grip. They all want to be uncles, she said dragging herself away from the chorus of oohs and ahs. She held the baby out to attain as if she had to persuade her to take him. Here. Want to hold him? Atain scooped Kadaike up in her arms. He became instantly quiet, and everything around her suddenly ceased to exist. He smelled clean and wonderful in hers. The cop at the next table put down his CAF, and leaned across to make faces in the way people did when in the presence of infants. Atain wiped dribble from the baby's chin as he stared mesmerized at the officer with huge dark eyes Darman's eyes. Who's gorgeous? Who dat gorgeous baby? The cop was a big, square man who looked as if he spent his days kicking down doors, but now he was reduced to sentimental mush. He glanced at Atain. You look like that comes naturally, he said, with no idea how deep the comment cut. You've definitely got the secret of calming babies. Jedi mind influence. Atain said, forcing a smile. It was time to move somewhere more private before the pretense crumbled. Jedi or not, her hormones seemed still to be in disarray, her emotions made more erratic by the strain of being separated from those she loved most. I think he needs changing. Come on, Lasima. 
Let's do the necessary, or Cal will complain that we're neglecting his grandson. Lasima's apartment the one Skirata had bought to get her out of Kiba the Hut's clutches, and provide them all with a base away from the barracks was part of the same grim permacrete complex that housed the Kragit. By slipping through the rear doors and into the kitchen, Atain could reach the apartment via the turbo lift and a flight of stairs. The place had the feel of a fortress, and that was probably why Skirata chose it. It occupied a whole floor. Lasima followed her. The apartment doors opened into a big living room that had probably once been a warehousing area, and that bore all the signs of three very different people trying to coexist there with a small baby. It smelled of cooking, laundry, and air freshener. On a subtler level, the force told her that Juzik was scared but more content than he'd been in years, that Lasima spent sleepless nights fretting about Aden's safety, and that Skirata. Skirata wasn't the swirling darkness Atain had first sensed. The pit of violence and anger was still there alongside the selfless passions, but there was also a small deep pool of profound contentment, a softness she hadn't sensed before. On the table was a chaotic pile of electronic circuits and mechanical servos that had to be Juzik's latest project. Skirata tended to leave no physical traces as befitted a man who lived up fully to the nomadic side of Mandalorian culture. How long can you stay? Lasima asked. Atain settled down on the nearest chair and let Kedai K totter around the room by holding on to furniture. He landed on his backside with a bump, giggling. Two days. Oh. I'm doing Bardai K's old job now. Two days is a long period of leave when you're looking after a commando group. Atain checked Kadai K over and saw how much he'd grown. I ought to sleep, but I don't want to waste a moment. Controlling nearly 500 commandos was an impossible task. They were almost entirely self-directing, and the most she could do was pass them their objectives, deal with their requests and problems, and visit them in the field. There were too few Jedi to go around. So there's one more reason why you stay. And the commandos were all so different. Apart from the men trained by Skirata, their culture seemed to vary from squad to squad, even those trained by Wallen Vav and Rav Brawler, whose style she knew, and who were now among her band of unlikely friends. I talked to Kat Ike about you, Lasima said suddenly even if he can't understand. I always say Mama's coming home soon, and things like that. You never know how much they take in. Atain looked up. Lasima was a typically pretty Twi'lek, a young woman with a wretched past who had been used just as callously as the clones she'd found kinship with. Now she looked anxious, as if she felt guilty for looking after Kat I.K. It's okay. Atain said. I'm grateful to you. It's my fault we're all in this mess. Without you. Well, I know he's loved and well cared for. I'm not trying to take your place. I never thought you were, but I could hardly complain if you did. Lasima looked at her with a slightly baffled expression for a moment. She looked very different these days. She'd taken to wearing very sober, high-necked clothing, not the usual low-cut, tight-fitting crop tops that most Trilek females wore. It was as if she was making it clear that she wasn't the unwilling entertainment at some sleazy hut cantina any longer. Atain decided she would remind herself of the average Trilek girl's lot whenever she felt tempted to complain about her own restricted life. Cal absolutely adores him, Lasema said as if trying to make harmless small talk well away from the minefield of absentee parents. He's very good with babies. You wouldn't believe it, would you? Mandalorians look so hard-bitten. Skirata typified the Mando ideal of responsible fatherhood and devotion to his clan. He was a sucker for helpless kids. And Bard, I.K.A., loves being an uncle. He plays little force games with Kat Ike so that he gets used to his abilities. 
Really? Atain was instantly worried but it made sense. The baby's force powers were as much a part of his development as learning to walk, and he would have to learn not only to use them but also to conceal them. I'd better talk to him about that. Lasima looked as if she wished she hadn't mentioned it, and changed tack. He's such a gorgeous baby. Rarely cries, smiles at everyone. Cal says he's exactly like Darman was at the same age. And I'm missing it all. I'm not seeing him grow up. Atain was hardly the first mother to have duties that took her away from her child. It was just something that no Jedi was supposed to experience, and she understood the ban on attachment better now than she ever had. It was a harsh rule, and she worried that Jedi raised other Jedi in a constant soulless cycle of detached cold indifference. But at times like these she understood how disruptive it was to have someone whose welfare mattered so much to you that it clouded your judgment. But if we don't experience this, how can we possibly sit in judgment on non-force users? How can we understand why they do the things they do? Atain wondered what suppressing natural emotions did to Jedi in the end. She rearranged Kadaike on her lap, but he could sit pretty well on his own. She realized she just wasn't used to doing this, and that she should have been. Kadaike turned his head to look into her face with intense curiosity, then grinned again and said what sounded like, Ka! La! They weren't quite words but Atain squealed with delight and surprise. The baby stared back into her face with wide-eyed shock at the reaction. He's talking, she said. Clever cat I.K. Who's mama's clever boy? Say mama. Can you say mama? Cad gurgled as if he was going to break into laughter. It dawned slowly on Atain that her son was probably trying to say Cal and Lysema. It was logical, because those were the names he heard every day. But she couldn't deny that it hurt. Mama, he said suddenly. Mama, Mama Mail. He laughed, obviously delighted with himself, eyes locked on hers. That was all Atain needed. It was a moment of perfect connection between them and she would treasure it for the rest of her life. She nuzzled him and rocked him to make him laugh more. Clever Cad. Yes, it's Mama. Cad pointed at Lasima. Lala. Lala. Lasima beamed at him and got a heartbreaking smile back. He's growing so fast. For any other parent it would have been a source of pride but for Atain it simply rekindled the fear that her son might have inherited his father's accelerated aging. Mariel had reassured her that the Kaminoans had made sure the trait wasn't passed on. She wondered why they didn't just make clones sterile, but it could have been anything from complications with gene expression to simply seeing what happened if clones reproduced. Kaminoans didn't think like humans, and they didn't see clones as anything more than product just organic droids. She hoped Mario was right about inheritance. She'd read far too much about epigenetics during her pregnancy, and now worried that Cad's genes were somehow undetectably tainted by whatever had happened to Darman. Cad babbled incoherently, and made a lunge for the hank of hair draped over her shoulder. Atain caught him as he rolled to one side like an amiable drunk and threw up. Lysema rushed to mop up, but Atain was determined to do the messy work herself. Babies were always getting sick, the experts said. I hope this is normal development. Every mother worries about everything, Lysema said. Not that I know, but they said my sister did. There was a whole world of misery wrapped up in those two sentences. Atain realized how very little she knew about the Twi'lek. Maybe Lasima's family stayed in touch, but the way she said it made Atain think that she was alone, sold into the awful servitude that awaited most Twi'lek girls with more looks than family connections, and as long as she intended to stay with Aten she could never bear children of her own. 
and here she was having to look after someone else's baby. That must have rankled. Mandalorians might have been hardwired to take in any needy kids as their own at the drop of a hat, but Atain didn't feel that way at all. He's mine. Kadaike is mine. I want to be with him. She was a second away from grabbing an air taxi, storming into Zay's office at Area Barracks, and telling him she was giving up her Jedi status. The thought was becoming ever more frequent and feeling like a rehearsal. Cad looked up as if searching her eyes for something. Then his face crumpled. He let out a small wail that tailed off into a whimper and flooded her with his unhappiness. He was reacting to her anxiety. When I was a baby. Did the Jedi who raised me sense how I felt? What did I feel of their emotions? She had no recollection. She didn't recall the family she'd left either. All she knew was that it wasn't going to be that way for her son. His force powers would have to find some other outlet. She made an effort to concentrate on happy thoughts, visualizing Darman and herself in a peaceful garden with Cad on her lap, the best way she could communicate reassurance on a force level. Force-sensitive babies needed more than cuddles and a lullaby. Look at us, Atain said. Jedi, Trilek, clone trooper. We're all locked into a path in life because of our genes. But we don't have to take it, do we? None of us. We can all be what we want to be. Lasima, looking more like a bank clerk in her sober dark tunic, took a feeding bottle of juice from the kitchen and handed it to Atain. Cad intercepted it, two-handed. I don't dance any longer, Lasima said. And you don't dance to the Jedi Council's tune. I think we've all stopped dancing, thanks to Cal. The future seemed a little brighter now and alive with possibility. The war was survivable. Atain didn't think in terms of winning any longer, or even what the Republic might turn into if it did win. It wasn't the democracy the Jedi seemed to think it was. She felt that she was struggling to the peak of an unforgiving mountain, that a little more effort and courage would get her to the summit alive, and then she could make her way to safety. But climbers said the most deadly and dangerous part of mountaineering was the descent. Come on, sweetheart. Cad sucked at the bottle with ferocious determination. Normality. He was like any other baby of his age, pretty well running to the timetable of normal human development that she'd memorized. The last thing she wanted was a prodigy. He'd had enough of an unusual start in life already. Atain imagined Zay's reaction if he could see this scene. Lasima unwrapped the baby clothes and held them up for Atain's approval. When are you going to tell him? She asked. She didn't mean General Zay. She meant Darman. It was the question Atain now put to one side every time it came up. It was easier to deal with Zay first. Darman had as good as said he wasn't in any hurry to have children, but sooner or later she had to tell him that not only was Cat her son, he was also his. Hindsight was a poisonous thing. Atain wished now that she told Darman from the start, but Skarada had probably been right. It was one complication too many for Dar who looked and behaved like a grown man but still had many of the emotional vulnerabilities of a kid. I think I'll do it sooner rather than later, she said at last. And if he takes it badly, at least he knows. Forty-eight hours leave was trickling through her fingers like water. It was unfairly short. But it was a consequence of the path she'd chosen. She watched Ked gulping down the contents of the bottle and reached out in the force to Darman to check that he was okay. She knew exactly where he was now. She could calm him any time, even redeploy him. She was a group commander in special operations, and he was one of her resources. And he wouldn't thank her for cosseting him. Ked sucked on a now empty bottle and looked up at her with a distinct it's time Yuri filled this expression. I'll tell Dar when he returns from Horgab.
she said. But I doubt I shall ever tell Zay. Cad was going to have a life as unlike hers as she could make it. He would have choices. Lasima's apartment, Coruscant. Juzik had never worried about what clothes to put on each morning until now. He stared at himself in the mirror, minus his beard for the first time in years, and wondered if he'd pass for a government health inspector. As a Jedi, he'd own next to nothing, just the brown robe he stood up in, a couple of changes of tunic, pants, and underclothes, his lightsaber, and a lot of gadgets none of which actually belonged to him. It all fit in one scruffy bag. Now he had armor, although portability was still paramount, and he had disguises. Today he was disguised as a regular human being, a suited bureaucrat, folio case in hand, clean-shaven. He had a prison to visit. Doctor. Ovalot Kale Yuthan had been moved from one facility to another, and then apparently vanished in the system, but it was impossible to hide much from the nulls. They had been trained to infiltrate any system, and the Republic's was more vulnerable to them than any. The security codes for the Treasury had opened a particularly rich seam for Janark N10, and he was working his way via crawler programs through separate systems and government departments, using the interfaces between them to jump across departmental barriers. Joined up government more efficient cooperation among the Republic's bureaucratic fiefdoms was an idea whose time had come. It also made slicing their data a lot easier. Say bye bye, Kadike. Say bye bye to Uncle Bardan. Etting, cradling her son in one arm, took his hand and made a little waving gesture with it. Bada, he said. He seemed happy with words that ended in A. Juzik waved back. Cad looked bemused by Juzik's sudden change in appearance and frowned slightly at Atain as if looking for confirmation of his identity. Yes, it's Bardike. He'll be back soon. Just pinning down locations, said Juzik. Won't be long. You're wondering how I can do this, aren't you? Atain radiated regret. There wasn't much that one Jedi could hide from another. I'd find it impossible, Juzik said carefully. He wondered if the separation was good for either her or the baby. But I understand. All the time Darman has to fight, so do you. If anything happens to me, Dash. Jedi casualties have been few and far between in this war. Hear me out. If I don't come back, make sure the Jedi Order doesn't find Cad. Juzik fiddled with his high collar. Armor wasn't half as restricting as a business suit. Nothing's going to happen to you, he said. Like I said, we lost a lot of Jedi at Geonosis, but very few since. Bardan. They'll have to get past Cal's small army first. But yes, if you want my word, I'll give my life to protect him. Atain made a little, ah, uh, sound, and when Juzik turned away from the mirror, she looked on the brink of tears. I don't expect you to dash. I know, but I expect me to. By the time he returned from his mission, she'd be back on duty, and Lasema, Bessany, or Skirata would be here holding the fort. Now, no foolish heroics. May the force be with you, Atain. Juzik didn't look back. When he took his leave of someone, there was always a final moment when he had to break eye contact, a degree of pain to be faced, so he always got it over with fast. Moving through the city unnoticed was second nature to him now. All transactions by cash credits, multistage journeys by public transport, avoidance of areas with security cams. He could mind rub and disable surveillance holocams with a thought, but he didn't want to leave a wake of renegade force using behind him. And if there were any loose ends despite his care, Jailer Obram could probably tie those up. 
The Valorum Center looked like a min-market spa from the outside, and only the impressive security double gates, and a sequence of doors that could have doubled as an airlock on Mustafar gave a hint that it was a judicial psychiatric unit. Not all its guests were criminals. Many were a danger only to themselves, but they were all there because the courts had ruled that they needed locking up. It attracted surprisingly little attention, but then there were any number of government buildings with unwelcoming facades springing up on Karuskant these days, and it wasn't a residential area. Juzik presented his identity to a droid at the gates that looked more like an ion cannon emplacement. It scanned the details and swung back to let him pass. It was very easy to fake a civil service ID if you had a civil service contact willing to give you his or her chip for electronic cloning and modification. Bessany Wenin's original chip had now spawned bogus employee identities across the whole tangled spectrum of Republic administration. A bureaucracy that didn't actually know how many staff it employed on any given day was ripe for infiltration. The last time Juzik had sliced into the payroll system, the full-time workforce alone stood at 8 million, more than twice the size of the Grand Army. Danelle Harris was just another pen pusher who might or might not have existed. Juzik wore him like a coat. I won't keep you long, he said, looking suitably harassed as the deputy chief administrator with Pelbian, Dr. S. On his ID badge led him through the soothing pale green corridors. Just preparing a response for the health minister. Another hoo-ha about dangerous patients being released into the community too early. I'm still not sure how we managed to mislay your request. I'm very sorry. No matter. Juzik already had the ground plans for the facility courtesy of the unsuspecting utilities administration but it did no harm to record the layout, too. He clutched his comm link in his hand while he walked as if waiting for some important transmission, but the integral holocom was active, recording in detail to be examined later. Will I be able to see the director at such short notice? Say no. I won't mind. I could bluff my way through it, but... He's out of the office today, I'm afraid. Well, I'm sure you can give me the figures. Juzik strode on, trying not to look as if he knew where he was going. Just how much of a risk are the patients you have here? How many are actually a threat to other citizens? Aren't they mainly troubled souls more likely to throw themselves off buildings? Mainly. Pelbian was a thin human male in his fifties who kept looking over his shoulder as they passed through each set of security doors, as if he was expecting an attack. But we do accommodate some high-risk patients on a short-term basis. The truly dangerous ones are then transferred to the isolation facility on Jevlet. And I can assure you that our clinical assessments of risk are much, much more exacting than some other institutions. We do not put faith in pharmaceutical cures or convincing interviews with assessment panels. The facility was remarkably quiet and empty. Juzik had somehow expected something more like a hospital, with at least droids moving around, but this wasn't a place where visitors or activity seemed to be encouraged, and the doors were all locked. The farther into the complex that Juzik walked, the more unsettled he felt. This was a miserable place for a force user. Juzik could sense emotions. Wave after wave of anxiety, fear, wild elation, and even occasional oddly misplaced certainty swept over him almost like whispers emerging from each locked room. He'd never been this close to so many people all in. All with. He wanted to say torment, delusion, insanity, but that wasn't it at all. Some were very unhappy but some were very happy indeed, quite manic in fact. It took a lot to rattle Juzik, but this shook him. It was made worse by seeing nobody, just sensing them. He felt surrounded by ghosts. What proportion do you release into the community? 
he asked Pelbian, trying to center himself again. Sometimes he envied ordinary beings. All they had to do was look. But he didn't dare try to shut out the clamor of emotions because he was seeking one mind, one person who he had reason to believe was being held here. He was looking for Dr. Yuthin. If she wasn't here, then he'd run out of secure facilities to search, and the trail had gone cold. Only 3% ever leave this institution, Pelbian said. We take quite extreme cases, after all. Juzik concentrated. It was like sifting through a thousand conversations going on simultaneously, looking for one word, but he couldn't walk every corridor without arousing Pelbian's suspicions. Ahead of them, a med droid and a female Mon Cal in a pale lemon lab coat wandered down the corridor deep in conversation before turning left into an office. Juzik was beginning to think there was nobody else walking free in the building, and he felt oddly comforted by seeing them. He could hear voices, too, muffled by distance and heavy doors, but snatches of senseless conversation he tried to follow despite himself. He even thought he heard some words of Mandoi. The human brain had a wonderful ability to zero in on the apparently familiar. He strained to listen to the voice a woman, alternately crying and cursing by the sound of it and some of the words seemed to be Mandalorian, but some were totally alien. He could have sworn he heard Shakar. No. It was Shekhar. Whatever that was, it wasn't Mandoi. He had to move on. Don't get distracted. You have a mission. Anxious for some focus to his search, he tried to open up a line of questioning. There was no mind influence he could use yet because he had no idea how to frame the question. If Yuthin was a patient here, then Pelbian wouldn't have her in a cell marked secret prisoner. I would find this job very depressing. Juzik said knowing that might flush out a fuller response that he could steer and pick apart. Most medical staff have some expectation of curing their charges. The best you can do is to stop them being a danger. Or keep them in as content a state as we can manage. Pelbian said defensive, opening yet another pair of doors under the scrutiny of a chunky droid armed with a stun stick. That's a goal in itself. Juzik felt the opening. They must all be wretchedly unhappy. Yuthan would be, if she was here. The Nulls had already picked up intelligence that the geneticist was selectively breeding Sokoff flies to keep herself busy, although there was no guarantee she would be allowed to keep insects in this pristine, sterile place. The building smelled of that particular cleaning fluid that Juzik associated with dentistry a faint spicy scent that caught the back of his throat. No, some are very happy in their delusions, Pelbian said. He seemed content to chat aimlessly, perhaps because it seemed to appease Juzik. So much so that I envy some of them. There were a lot of angry people in here, to anger that seemed without focus for the most part. Whoever was behind one set of doors made Juzik step up his pace to pass them faster, so strong was the urge for bloody destruction that emanated from them. If any Jedi wanted to learn about the dark power of rage, then this was the place to bring the younglings. Any you feel sorry for? Juzik asked. He needed a break now. He scanned as best he could for beings that felt more like himself, more normal. Do you feel that any of us might be in that state, but for Providence? Oh, we have a dozen physicians in here, at least, Pelbian said. It's quite sobering to look them in the eye. And beings who think they're doctors, and some of them seem more competent than the qualified ones. Juzik forced a smile. You want to tell me more? Pelbian blinked at Juzik's careful manipulation of his mind unaware of it but reacting to a thought that wasn't his. He didn't discuss individual patients. It jarred with him, but there was something in there. Something else not so much troubling him as bothering him. Juzik nudged him a little more. You want to tell me about the patients you're not sure should be here. You want to take me to them. 
some of them. Well, even I wonder if they should be here, Pelbian said at last. He was walking with purpose now, not just ambling along at Juzik's side, as if herding him toward the most impressive aspects of the facility and away from the worst. They're so internally consistent about their imagined lives that I have to remind myself why they're here. Show me. You want to show me. You want to show me how tough your job can be, so I file a favorable report on this facility. Juzik had to nudge Pelbian again. It was risky. The man wouldn't realize he was being influenced by a Jedi technique, but he might decide he wasn't feeling too well and call a halt. A faint breath of familiarity brushed Juzik, and he found himself staring at cell doors bearing the number 7885 in black letters. He'd never met Yuthin. He couldn't feel her, but he could feel someone normal, someone sane, someone who didn't belong. Like this one? Juzik said gesturing to the cell. No, his family committed him after he had an unfortunate incident at home. Pelbian seemed to be debating with himself. Okay. Follow me. But the same person's in there. For some reason, that distracted Juzik for a moment, the sudden realization that there was someone nearby who wasn't disturbed or crazy at all, but locked up anyway. The sense of betrayal and hopelessness was now overwhelming, and he could hardly leave it alone. Something deep inside said help him, help him, you can't just walk away. But he did, this mission was critical. He abandoned a being in need. As cell blocks went, the Valorum Center's Hesperidium wing was comfortable and apart from the smell of cleaning fluid, and all those security doors didn't look that institutional. Juzik followed Pelbian into what seemed to be an older part of the building with higher ceilings, and then through more doors. Juzik recorded it all. Had any of the Nulls been with him, gifted with eidetic memories because the Kaminoans thought it would make them better troops, they'd have memorized the route and every detail along the way instantly. Pelbian stopped outside a set of doors and fumbled for a passkey. Yes, this woman troubles me, he said as if answering Juzik. Pelbian didn't respond the same way as most beings to mind influence, that was clear. She's perplexing. Juzik knew even before the doors opened that he'd find a sane but disoriented woman in there. He could feel her, not quite as he expected dulled somewhat, but not in need of psychiatric care yet. When the doors parted revealing a second toughened transparent steel set within, it was all he could do not to cheer. The cell quite a pleasant suite, actually, but without any natural light was full of small transparent cases stacked on a counter. Black specks moved around inside them. Sokoff flies. Pelbian lowered his voice conspiratorially. She thinks she's a separatist scientist working on a doomsday virus. It's really very impressive, because she obviously has scientific training and a brilliant mind. She almost had me convinced at one point that she'd been kidnapped by Republic forces on the Outer Rim, shot in the back, and brought here to be forced to reveal her secret research. Quite extraordinary, Juzik said. Yuthan recalled the Kalura raid all right. What a detailed delusion. According to her file, she was committed by the Public Safety Department because they thought she might actually be qualified enough to create some plague for real. I must say she's doing some fascinating genetic research on those flies, even without proper lab facilities. We help her out occasionally, you know. Good grief. Oh joy. Should you be telling me this? Isn't it classified? I don't think you can classify psychotic episodes, Master Harris. Although scarring shows she really has been shot by a projectile at some time. Juzik stepped into the room. A well-groomed middle-aged woman with red-streaked black hair glanced up from her makeshift desk and looked hard at him, data pad in hand. This gentleman is from the Coruscant Health Administration. 
Pelbian said smiling nervously at her. Just showing him around. How's the breeding program going? Euthanit was definitely her raised one contemptuous eyebrow. You might be medicating my meals, you mediocre quack, but my brain is still functioning better than yours, she said wearily. Then she fixed on Juzik again. So you're from the government, are you? Well, I'm a prisoner of war, and as such I have rights. I demand a lawyer again. My name is Dr. Ovalot Kale Yuthin, and I'm being held in communicado. Juzik gave her a slightly pained but compassionate smile, his best. The Chancellor was a clever man. What better way to hide Yuthin than this, in plain sight, letting her tell her story in an imprisoned community where everyone had a crazy story? Of course you are, madam, Juzik said. I'll get right on. She'd be out of here, all right, only not the way she'd hoped. Absolutely consistent, Pelbian said on the way out. Juzik disrupted a few surveillance holocams as he went, fogging the images. Every detail. Sad, said Juzik. No, brilliant. Wonderful. Hope for my brothers. Now about those figures. Right away, Master Harris, said Pelbian. It probably wasn't necessary to rub the man's memory, but Juzik erased enough of their conversation to reduce his visit to a minor annoyance that would be quickly forgotten the natural way. All the way back to the apartment for changes of speeder bus, a couple of long walks, and doubling back once or twice, just in case Juzik felt his triumph being tarnished slowly by a small nagging, worrying voice. It wasn't the welter of disturbed minds that left him most unsettled or even coming face to face with a woman whose job was, effectively, genocide. It was finding that she was not the only wholly sane person being imprisoned in Valorum. And there was nothing he could do about the other one. He couldn't pursue the man's case, because Harris now had to disappear. He'd made too much of a splash as it was. There were always casualties in war. Not all of them occurred in combat. Hadrishan Road, Horgab, 1510 hours local time. Dar. Dar. Get down. Hordes of heavily armed Majasi had come out of nowhere, and now Omega were stuck in the remains of the ancient fort, under fire and running out of luck. The convoy had vanished except for the vehicles still burning in the pass. Darman threw himself flat as another mortar whooshed overhead and detonated somewhere behind the crumbling wall, ripping more chunks out of it. Darman found himself looking at the world from a 90-degree angle, noticing that the front wall providing cover didn't look so solid now, either. Voices filled his audio link. Where the shab did they come from? Told you, Criffing Tunnels. At IK, can you move the remote? Come on, look for a route out. We can't sit up here all shabla day waiting to get picked off. On it, Sarge, can you see that? Oh, Shab. Niner rarely swore. Things had to be worse than Darman thought. He scuttled on all fours across the ground, pushing the ammo crate out of the way. When he checked his HUD icons, the view from the remote wasn't encouraging. From a position nearly 200 meters above them, it showed the terrain in all its depressing reality, a sheer drop on three sides, and a long rocky slope down to their rear, the only access to the old fort. It was also the only route out. The fort had been a great vantage point in its heyday and easy to defend, but even four Republic commandos couldn't hold out here forever against hundreds of Majasi. I'm calling for extraction, Niner said. Darman began calculating how far they'd get if they tried to storm their way out. Who the Shab is going to lift us out of this? The 85th have Lartais. Let's see if they have a window in their busy manicure schedule. The view from the remote showed Majasi moving around to the rear of the peak. 
It would take them maybe half an hour to pick their way up the long slope. Longer if Darman made life more interesting for them by bringing down some rock on their heads. He reloaded with grenades and began crawling toward the path, which fell away sharply as if the peak had been sawn off by a giant hand to create a level base for the fort. I'll delay them while you call a cab, he said. Niner had his right hand cupped to your level. He always did that when coming in a tight spot, as if it made voice traffic easier to hear, despite the sophisticated audio in his helmet. Roll a debt down, for Fearfax's sake, Dar. Don't expose yourself. C.O.R.R., propped on one elbow as if he was sunning himself, listened with a cocked head. They sound like they've got another repeating blaster or a cannon down there. They could just blow the top off this stump then, said Otten. But that would kill us, and that means they want us alive. Darman had a good idea what taken alive meant around these parts. It wasn't how he planned to bow out of this life. Let's hope they don't manage to conjure up their own air support. Had base, this is Omega. Had base, this is Omega. Request immediate extraction. Niner kept repeating the call, but it didn't sound as if he was getting a response. Darman could hear the fizz and crackle of the comm link. Had base, repeat, this is Omega. We're pinned down at the old shirt fort, twenty clicks southwest of your position. Low ammo, enemy strength estimated at. Between 150 and 200, with cannon and heavy repeaters. No entire that we can see. Had base, this is Omega. Darman had reached this point in combat several times over the last couple of years. There was a very good chance that he was going to die. The more times that happened, the more confident he was that he could get out of it, but there was also the realization that this time might well be the last. It was a long way down, and there were an awful lot of Majasi down there. In the way of knife-edge moments, he found himself thinking things unconnected with the prospect of an unpleasant death. He hadn't called Atain, and he hadn't spoken to Fai in months. Apart from that, he made his peace with the world. It was suddenly quiet. Niner, leaning back against the mud bricks, checked his ammo. Well, even if we get past that lot, we're on foot, and that's not exactly a fast getaway. And Fleet Met says sandstorms are on the way. Darman checked his HUD. Nobody liked flying in a sandstorm even if they had the filters and other countermeasures to venture out in it. It was a lousy time to need extraction. How many thermal dells have we got? Darman asked. I've got three. Two, said Otten. C.O.R. pulled three out of his belt and held them in a cluster like fruit. Being a man who knows about things that go bang, I estimate we have enough beradium yield between us to reduce this peak to rubble, or make a hole big enough to swallow it. Darman's mind raced. Lots of bad guys, one way down, not enough ammo, but a big explosive capacity. Yeah. I was hoping that would be the result. Only problem is, we're sitting on it. I'm still thinking. Well, it beats being interrogated by the locals. Quitter, said Darman, but C.O.R.R. had a point, and he wondered when he'd take off his armor so that he died outright and didn't linger injured like Fi. If he was going to go, he wanted to go clean. Suddenly he wasn't just bothered that he hadn't said goodbye to Atain. He was devastated that he might never see her again. Look, if they're going to come and take us, then they've got to come up that slope. The path's two meters wide. Log jam. You thinking of playing Skittles with them? Aden asked. Well, the blast radius is five meters. I can throw a bit farther than that. Darman had started life as the squad's ordnance expert. He'd picked up so many new skills since Geonosis that Fearfec. I forgot the anniversary. I forgot. But I remember them every day. 
Sorry, Vin. J. Taller. And? Niner reloaded the repeating blaster. What if we don't kill that many? Darman shrugged. Every little bit helps, as they say. The odds were bad. Katarn armor technology meant that they could take a considerable pounding from blaster fire and even grenades. But close quarters combat hand-to-hand -hand probably made them vulnerable. They could be brought down by sheer numbers. Then the armor wouldn't do a thing to save them. Aden took a noisy pull of water. I don't want to rush you, Dar, but if you take a look at the remote view, you'll see we have visitors. Darman tested his vibroblade, ejecting it from his gauntlet plate with a satisfying shunk. If they wanted a fight, they'd get one. C.O.R.R. continued to call for extraction, while Darman pried the plates off the debts to wire them together. Another mortar found its target, now way too close for comfort. Aden edged forward to lay down fire. They don't know how many of us are up here. Well, they will if they reach the Shabla top, at IK. C.R.R. paused, listening for some response in the comlink interference. If I live through this, first thing I'm going to do is shove my vibroblade in some intel guy's dash. I make that two mortar positions, said Niner. And yeah, I'll join you. Darman couldn't see what was happening behind him. Cross-wiring thermal debts was a fiddly job, and it didn't seem to occur to the others that the jury rig device could just as easily kill them all without any help from the rebels. All Darman could think at that moment was that Juzik would have been really handy to have around now. He was great with gadgets. And a spot of force-created avalanche would have been just the job. Okay, I'm done, he said. How far have those Shakar got? Aten steered the remote. It was too small for the rebels to notice at that altitude. They're about fifteen meters up. Another ten and they'll be on scree. Bring that lot down, and you'll probably block the path. It'll take them hours to dig past it. The wired debts formed a loose ball about the size of a human head, and as near to spherical as Darman could make it. He wasn't so sure he could throw it accurately enough now that he realized how ungainly a shape it was. He'd have to roll it and detonate remotely. And that meant split-second timing, or he'd miss and detonate the device behind them. Okay, at IKA, you talk me through it, he said and ran for the edge of the path. He had to get on the slope and line up as best he could. Ready? Ready. Behind him, Niner's repeater spat and boomed as another mortar shook the fort. He skidded down the narrow path for a few meters until he could hear the occasional shout from a rebel to go left, or some other order. If I roll it now, it'll reach the detonation point in eight seconds. Who was he kidding? He couldn't be sure of that. He waited for Aden to refocus the remote. Now he could see clearly. What seemed like an endless stream of rebels were scrambling up the slope with rifles slung across their backs. It was probably only fifty, but it felt like hordes somehow, and he knew there were more behind them. Stand by. In your own time, Dar. Debt's away. Darman let the ball tumble down the narrow path. It bounced and skidded don't blow early. You should be here. Please don't and he watched its progress via the remote view with his forefinger resting on the control in his left palm. Bounce, bounce. Heads. He could see the tops of heads, and he pressed the button. For a silent moment, he thought the device had failed. Then a deafening explosion shook the ground under his boots, and all he saw in his HUD was a blinding fireball and flying rubble. Fragments peppered his armor. Bouncing around him, he felt as if he was falling and reached out instinctively to grab something solid. His hand caught an outcrop and he found himself sitting solidly on his backside. He couldn't feel anything under his boots, though. A panicky flash of a thought seized him. No, I couldn't possibly have broken my spine. 
He swung his legs just to be sure. Dar? Dar. Aden's voice filled his helmet. The rest of the squad could all see the images from the remote he knew. Dar, you okay? Dar. Darman glanced down. He was sitting on a ledge of rock, staring down from a brand new cliff. The debts had blown out a landslide. Rocks were still clicking and groaning, pebbles bouncing. His legs were fine. There was just nothing under his boots to feel. We didn't need Juzik after all, he said, appalled. I don't think they're going to get up to the top anytime soon. Oh, Shab. C.O.R.R.'s voice sounded more stunned than angry. And we're not going to get down, are we? Darman shuffled back from the precipice and scrambled to his feet to run back up the remains of the path. At least we're on the highest peak. Nothing's overlooking us. We've got cover. And a few less enemy than we had a few minutes ago. It still couldn't make up for the fact that they were marooned on a plug of rock 150 meters above ground level with no way down, no support, and dwindling supplies. As Darman dropped down behind the wall again, nobody said a word. The firing had stopped for a while. Go on, yell at me, he said. Anand shrugged and directed the remote to a higher altitude. Darman could see chaos temporary. He knew while the rebels rushed around trying to rescue their comrades and regroup. He bought some time, but it would be no use to Omega now. Any luck, C.O.R.I.K.? Niner asked. He could hear C.O.R.R.'s transmissions as well as the rest of them, but it was his way of chivying everyone along. Because if the 85th don't respond, we've either got to kill every last rebel or learn to criffing fly. Or both. Aden said. We can try a descent, but we'll be completely exposed to fire if we try to climb down. Three seconds, five meters. That was about as long and as far as you could run before a sniper got a fix on you. Climbing down a sheer rock face Katarn armor or not was asking for it. The rebels didn't have state-of-the-art blasters, but they had mortars, and that would finish off anyone. Where's the rest of the convoy? Darman asked. Some got away. They must have called it in by now. Except they don't know we're here, and we'd have looked like some bunch of local trouble to them, Niner said. If they saw us at all. C.O.R.R. laid out his ammo in front of him in descending order of stopping power. It wasn't a comforting sight. It looked as if he'd prepared for a last stand before but he never talked about the action he'd seen. It clearly wasn't just bomb disposal. The last item in the row was a small grenade. He looked up and caught Darman staring at him. For me, he said. I don't expect much of local hospitality. Good idea, said Niner, tossing a similar device in his hand. Darman looked at Otten but neither of them set aside a quick end for themselves. Maybe it was knowing they had someone waiting back home. Keep trying the 85th, said Niner. Aden shook his head. No, Flash HQ. They should be able to get through to them. It normally took time they didn't have, but time wasn't an issue now. The rebels who had regrouped and were making their way back up the cliffs surrounding Omega they were the issue. Them and their repeating blasters. Atain would hear they were in trouble. Darman preferred not to worry her. But now he didn't have a choice, and he took some comfort in the fact that the fort was 30 or 40 meters higher than the rest of the terrain, and it still looked as if the rebels wanted to take them alive. The rebels could sit it out, of course. Even in climate-controlled Katarn armor with fluid recycling, commandos couldn't hold out indefinitely on a rock in a burning desert. Area HQ, this is Omega. C.O.R.R. repeated quietly, as if he was ordering a carry-out meal. The squad kept their communal audio link open. Arca HQ, this is Omega, 
Request urgent forwarding for immediate extraction. Arca HQ, this is. It would be dark in a few hours. Darman and Niner hauled and rolled whatever solid objects they could find to shore up the blast pocked walls of the ruin that provided their only protection. A volley of blaster bolts smacked into the rock a meter below, seeming more like a ploy to torment them than a serious attempt to kill. Omega, this is Arca HQ, said a male voice. Say again. Captain Mays. I see you're answering the comms today, then. The ARC trooper Captain Zay's aide wasn't known for his cheery camaraderie. Omega, your position's noted. Calm trouble? Can't raise the 85th. Request immediate extraction from these coordinates. We're surrounded and low on everything. I'm alerting head FOB now. Stand by. CORR switched to a private comm link channel that Maze couldn't hear. How are you, Omega? Can we help? We're really concerned that you're stranded on a shabla rock surrounded by an infinite number of armed locals who'll cut your get se off when they haul you screaming from the summit. He switched back to the open circuit again. Thank you, Captain. Standing by. It was relief, Dharma knew. C.O.R.R. vented his tensions through acid sarcasm. I know what Phi would have said. Phi would have said, Captain, you never call, you never send flowers. Darman hoped Phi was happy on Mandalore. He really did. I make it about seventy Shakar, Aden said. Not infinite. They've got buddies back home who could show up any time. C.O.R.R. said. And stop being pedantic. It'll make you go blind. He didn't say they were sending a lardy. He didn't say when. He said stand by. C.O.R.R. snapped a fresh clip into his dice. His POV icon showed that he was scanning the cliffs at high magnification, so he noted the open-ended nature of Maze's response, too. Darman moved across to the north wall and set his HUD on maximum magnification. HUD was wreathed in black smoke, and now that his mind wasn't so firmly fixed on his own predicament, he could hear the hump 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 of artillery fire. The 85th probably had their hands full. That was probably a detail that Mays didn't want to depress them with. So what's the problem with the comms? Niner asked. Maze's gravelly tones interrupted him. Omega, air evacs coming from Nesca instead. One standard hour subject to the storms. Had FOBs lost a calm relay in the shelling. You do pick your moments. Maze didn't ask if they could hold out that long. If they couldn't, it was too bad. Nesca was the closest base after Had and nobody was riding to the rescue any faster. Thanks, HQ, CORR said. Tell General Zay we have a confirmed kill on Jalak, by the way. Not a wasted journey, then, Omega. You have a nice day, too, Captain. The link went dead and Maze was gone. Maybe get your hair done. A bit of shopping. Arcs get cranky when they're cooped up on desk jobs. Darman said, feeling he had to make excuses for Maze. They'd all rather be at the front. You really think any sane man wants to get his Sheb shot off? It's not like he's got some need to be with his brothers like the Nulls. The Alphas have buddies, too. Darman said, recalling Sul and his anger at the fate of a brother Ark executed for going AWOL. They're no different from us. CORR puffed contemptuously and didn't answer. Three brilliant bolts of hot white energy shaved the top of the wall and sent brick dust flying. Niner opened up with the repeater and blew a chunk out of the facing cliff, taking what looked like a couple of bodies with it, but all across the rock slopes Darman could detect movement lots of it. 
the rebels were reinforcing. Yes, those tunnels needed some serious attention from a ton or two of 500 grade thermoplastoid. 55 standard minutes, said Otten, aiming through a gap in the wall. At least there was nothing to the rear now just on all the other flanks. You had to look on the bright side. And the LAT slash I was on its way. Counting down. Remember, eke it out, Vode. Niner muttered. Don't expend more than you absolutely have to, in case our ride's delayed. Otten steered the remote. Or if the shock are turned into mountain nerfs. The remote view showed that one party of Majasi were preparing for a climb. They had grapples, lines, and what could have been launchers. How far down? Darman asked. Exactly? Aden's POV icon showed he had superimposed telemetry on the remote's view. 158 meters 40 centimeters. Aden paused. To the datum line. The rappel line built into commando armor was 100 meters tops. Darman visualized the last, last, last resort escape that might not break his neck if he hit the right angle and rolled the last 50-odd meters, but once he was on the ground with Shab knows how many rebels converging on him, he'd be fresh out of ideas. And luck. But there was always the sandstorm. They could use it for cover. It could also end up being the death of them. Jetpacks, he said wistfully. Really should get jetpacks as standard. Mandos aren't daft. The Majasi climbing team fired a grapple and line. It bit into the cliff face with a chattering noise, and when the first climber was twenty meters up the slope, C.O.R. put a blaster bolt through the top of his head. Maybe I should have waited for him to get higher. Darman kept an eye on the remote view and tested his gauntlet vibroblade a few more times. Yes, he was getting scared lardy inbound or no lardy inbound. Standing your ground was one thing, but being trapped like a staked fesha waiting to be eaten was another thing entirely. He began to wonder how many he could take with him if the worst came to the worst. They've got some get -essy. Seeing as they don't know what we can do to them once they reach us. Well, they definitely want us alive, Niner said. Or else they haven't got enough heavy ordnance to cream us totally. An hour was a surprisingly long time. Between monitoring the remote which the rebels obviously hadn't detected, or else they'd have tried to disable it and resisting the ingrained reflex to hose the source of incoming fire. Darman had time to watch the horizon to the north. Had's canopy of black smoke was now invisible, swallowed up by a mass of rolling yellow cloud that looked as solid and implacable as a tidal wave. The wind was picking up strength, debris whipped and whirled around the fort. Darman did a rough calculation and worked out that the storm front would be upon them in minutes. Heads down, Vote, he said. Here it comes. The sand couldn't penetrate their vacuum-resistant armor, and the Deces had filters. Their HUDs enabled them to detect their surroundings in the thickest smoke. The screaming wind could be silenced by their helmets. But being caught in a storm like this was nerve-wracking. Darman heard the first sprays of windborne sand rattle against his katarn plates and huddled in a ball in the lee of a wall with the others. Oh, Shab, C.O.R.R. whispered. The whirling grains engulfed them, utterly silent as Darman cut his external audio so he could hear the rest of the squad on the helmet link. All they could do was sit it out. The rebels wouldn't be climbing now, that was for sure. He thought of Etain and hoped Maze had passed on the Citrep. Fearfek, this must be a big one, Niner said. The storm didn't seem to be abating. The sand cloud must have covered hundreds of square kilometers. We won't get extracted until this passes. You wouldn't even get a TIV pilot out in this. Sicko would have tried, 
Dharma knew. But he was long gone, and for a brother they'd known only briefly, his death still cut way too deep. Visibility was now zero. Dharman opened his external audio cautiously so that the roaring storm was a whisper. He thought he heard another sound, but that was impossible. It had to be the buffeting of the storm. Chakada chakada chaka. No, he wasn't imagining it. It was getting louder. Chakada 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 chaka. It was a regular mechanical noise with another constant rising and falling note underneath, almost like a faint siren. No, not a siren, a drive struggling to cope. Whatever it was, it wasn't a L.A.T. slash I. That was a sound he'd know anywhere, sweetly familiar and comforting enough to make his chest feel hollow and heavy with emotion. Shab, he said. Darman measured the crisis level of any given day by the number of times they used the S word. Today was a hundred Shab day, getting close to Shab's saturation point. No other word offered such relief when you were tired, in pain, incredulous, or just facing imminent oblivion. Shab, it's not one of ours, Dash. They looked up, even though they didn't need to. The remote could have shown them the worst if they'd switched it to infrared. No, it wasn't a LAT slash I. The drive struggling against the abrasive, sand-laden winds sounded alien because they were. The vessel's undercarriage was visible through the swirling amber haze, brilliant turquoise with angular black designs half scoured down to bare metal by past sandstorms. It was old. Darman caught a glimpse of jutting hydraulic lines and piston-shaped servos. Shabir, said C.O.R.R., groping for the anti-armor attachment and slapping it on his dees. Okay, if we don't go home, nobody goes home. Darman aimed at what he hoped was the hydraulics reservoir. The wind nearly took him off his feet. Otten collided with him. Niner. Repeater held in both hands by some astonishing feat of raw muscle, was yelling at them to get clear. He fired. Darman fired. Maybe they all fired, but all Darman knew right then was that a fireball blinded him and laid him flat on his back as red hot metal debris, rock, and oily fluid spattered his visor. Keldabe Mandalore. Phi was adamant, or at least Parja was adamant and therefore he obeyed. He would not help Fen Shaisa by playing a fet. We're only here so you can see Keldabe, okay? Parja had hold of his elbow as if she was a possessive wife rather than someone supporting a man with mobility problems. A trip to the big city, that's all. You don't owe him anything. Keldabe wasn't exactly big. Fai still found it overwhelming but he remembered to consult his data pad to navigate. The Mandalorian capital was a cluster of stone, wood dura steel, and plastoid buildings clinging like determined fungi to a granite outcrop. Beneath the granite cliff, the Kelita River was busy cutting a ravine. The place was somehow scruffy, majestic, defiant, and inviting at the same time. It was what the lower levels of Coruscant would have been if they'd been given some attitude bundled into a city-shaped lump, and dumped in unspoiled countryside. Phi loved it immediately. The sun glinted off the tower of Mundel Motors Engineering Works, a landmark that pilots used for their approach to the landing strip. And the air smelled of resin trees, a delicious woody sweetness that lingered at the back of his palate. Lovely, Phi said. Lovely. It's a slum. Parja steered him. The Shebs of the Galaxy. But it's ours. They walked across one of the bridges and into the heart of the city. Alleys threaded between buildings so unalike and eccentric that it was clear the phrase Mandalorian town planning didn't exist. It was everything that Coruscant wasn't. Does he have a palace? Fai asked. Shais is just a minor chieftain, if that. Not even Mandalores have a palace these days. I'm not sure if they ever did. 
Where are we going then? The tap calf. Why a tap calf? Convenient. Parja paused to stare at a shop front. It was full of tools and machine parts, and she gazed at it the way Fai had seen Coruscanti females stare at fashion shops. Everyone knows the Oyubat. It's been here since Candorus Ordo was a glint in his mama's eye, and it never closes, ever. They say the pot of stew over the fire's been simmering for a thousand years, and that all the cooks do is throw in more meat and veg every day. Yuck, said Fai. I hope they wash their hands. Mandalorian informality fascinated Fai. He'd been raised on military precision, a place and a regulation for everything. Somehow, in this please-yourself, hierarchy-free chaos there was still a powerful sense of social purpose that could come together into a formidable army at a moment's notice. He took off his helmet to feel the breeze on his face, and a passerby paused to look at him. I'm gorgeous, he said. See? Parja giggled. Barden's going to be pleased with your progress. Listen to yourself. Yeah, but I used to be able to rappel off the Erlen HQ building, do 200 press-ups before breakfast, and drop a moving target at a thousand meters. I was special. I was the best. He's meeting us here? Why not? It'll take two minutes to tell Shaisa where to ram his dumb idea, then we pick up some supplies and head back home so Bardan can do the healing thing. If I counted the days between Juzik's visits. Not only was he pleased to see a dear friend a precious connection to his previous life, but the healing sessions held out the prospect of more improvement. He felt the strength seeping back into him like a belly full of hot food at the end of a freezing patrol. Juzik always seemed tired afterward though. It was as if he was draining himself. Fi wished he could understand how Jedi could harness the activity of cells like that. Found it, Fi said triumphantly. The Oyubot was a sprawling cantina with a motley collection of windows that didn't look as if the builder knew what a perpendicular line or level was. It seemed to be a collection of buildings that had grown together over the centuries. Fai drew himself up to his full height and walked through the doors into a scent of a wood fire, yeast, and rich food perfumes that was irresistible. Sitting near the crackling fire was Shaisa, boots up on a chair, hands clasped behind his head, holding court with two men who had their backs to Fai, both in mid-green armor. When he spotted Fai, Shaisa sat up straight and looked earnest. Ah, the prodigal son and his good lady, he said. What are you drinking? We're not staying, Parja said. We're here to meet a friend. The two men with Shaisa turned around just as Fai got to the table, and he wondered why he hadn't recognized them the moment he walked through the doors. Even the backs of their heads identical, the same close-trimmed black hair should have clued him in. They were clones, just like him. No, not exactly like him. They were arcs. One was Sul, formerly A-30, the deserter Omega had tracked down on Gaftiker before Sergeant Aiden had booted him off the planet. The other fight took a guess at Spar. I suppose I ought to thank you, Sul said. Seeing as your brother whacked those two covert ops clones sent to kill me. We buried them, showed them respect. They were just doing what they were ordered to do. It really upset Dar. Maz and Olin, Fai said. He was proud that he could remember their names. It was the kind of detail he thought he'd forgotten. Like you care. What happened to you? You never stopped yapping on Gaftiker. Parja very nearly snarled. She was magnificently scary. He took an explosion full in the face. That's what happened, Chikar. Hey, sorry. Shaisa shoved Sul in the shoulder. Come on, leave the man be. Spar, pull up some seats for my guests. So it was Spar. 
he deserted long before the Grand Army even left Topoka City. Fi wasn't sure what to make of him. He didn't look happy. We'll pass, thanks, Parja said. If you won't drink with me, then I'll put this to Fi straight, Shaisa said. Mandalore needs someone to stand up and say their fets air. You said no, Sul said no, and Spars said no. And you're the only three lads who I can ask right now. It's an easy job. All you have to do is play figurehead. Is there a pension plan? Fi asked. It's just keeping up appearances for the Arotais. We live in nervous times, and the job's been vacant for too long. I don't get why the clans don't just fill it the usual way. Spar muttered. Either Mandalore needs a real leader or it doesn't. If you're going to put up a sham one, you might as well go the whole way and select a proper one. The Fet name puts the very fear of Heron up the Arotais. Shaisa had an earnest manner that Fi found hard to dislike. The glib charm fell away fast, leaving a man who seemed genuinely worried for his world. Whatever happened to Django in the end he killed Jedi with his bare hands. Folks don't forget that. And if you leave the clans without a focus for too many years. Well, we don't want another Death Watch starting up. Right now, we don't have an obvious candidate for the job. Fi didn't yet understand Mandalorian politics, but Parja seemed to. She didn't sit down. She leaned on the back of Fi's chair, one hand on his shoulder. Why don't you step in, Fen? She asked. Ah, me. I'm just an odd job man, he said, spreading his hands. It didn't look like false modesty. A bit of this, a bit of that. A foot soldier. We need more than a pair of fists leading us these days. We need someone to keep the clans together, and I think you'd be pretty good at that. Fi simply didn't understand a society where nobody made a grab for power when they got the chance. Perhaps there was nothing to be grabbed only whatever burden landed in the Mandalore's lap. He concentrated hard on declining the offer himself rather than let Parja speak for him. She was right. It was crazy, even if he could see Shaisa's point. So, Fi, will you do it? Shaisa asked. Fi felt sweat beating on his top lip again. He could hear Skarada in his head, warning him to look after number one first. I can't walk straight, I can't talk properly, and anyway, Fed has a real son somewhere. Sorry. Can't do it. Shaisa smiled sadly. Okay. You can't blame a fella for trying. Concentrate on getting yourself fit, Nivio D. Count me out too, Sul said. I'll fight if you want, if I get paid, but I'll stay in the background. My. Previous employers weren't exactly thrilled by my sudden resignation. They all looked at Spar, and he shrugged. You can use me as public relations, Shaisa but it's going to wear thin pretty fast. And I don't know Fed any criffing thing. How about Mandalore? You don't think you owe your own? How about it? I never bought Fed's tosh about serving the Republic, so I'm not the patriotic kind. He turned to Fi. Like I told you, Navio de Fed didn't give a mot's backside about anything other than himself. He got paid for helping churn out cannon fodder like you and me. And that's what Mandalore wants as a symbol of its power? Terrific. So it was Spar who talked to Fi in the Ensory Marketplace. Fi wondered if the Ark Trooper felt guilty about deserting even before the war started. He didn't seem the guilt-ridden kind, but there was something about him that smacked of regret. So it's okay, said Shaisa slowly. For me to put about the story that you're one of Fett's sons, and that Mandalore is considering having you take his place. Spar had that typical arc expression of disdain now, one eyebrow raised, lips pressed together. They must have picked it up from Django. Okay, 
As long as you don't advertise that I'm a deserter, or I'll have a death squad after me, too. Thanks, pal. Shaisa raised his mug, and they seemed to have reached some agreement. That could well be all we need for the time being. Fi still couldn't work out why Shaisa didn't just step in and take the Mandalore's role, seeing as he was doing most of it anyway. Parja seized the opportunity to haul Fi away to a quiet corner of the cantina. I'm glad that's over and done with. And you did well, Sire I.K. She kept glancing at the door, looking out for Juzik. You've more than done your duty. Now's your time to be selfish. Fi had never been good at saying no and meaning it. Skirata had raised his squads to believe they could do anything, because they were the best, and deeply ingrained confidence like that was only a short step away from feeling obliged to tackle every task simply because he could. Fi now struggled with a vague guilt that chewed quietly at him, telling him that all he had to do was sit around looking fet like and making man all or noises. Wouldn't have been a good advert anyway he said, arguing aloud with himself. Mandalore the drooler. Parja squeezed his hand hard. Don't. Joke. As long as it is a joke. The Oyubot was very quiet for the hub of Keldabe life. He'd expected it to be full of clan chieftains brokering deals and playing that awful board game that involved stabbing the squares. But maybe it was the wrong time of day to watch the loose and chaotic business of Mandalorian governance taking place. Eventually the doors parted and a slight figure in green armor appeared. Juzik really looked the part now, as if he'd never been a Jedi, but his lightsaber still hung from his belt. Fine knew what most Mandalorians assumed when they saw the weapon, and why they gave the man a wary glance. They didn't think they were looking at a Jedi. They thought Juzik wore it as a trophy. It gave him an instant reputation. He clasped Fi's arm and then Parge's like any Mandoad and pulled off his helmet, revealing short hair and a complete absence of beard. Fi expected it to make him look younger. It had the opposite effect. How are you feeling, Niviodi? Juzik gave him a big grin. You're looking more like your old self. Tired, Fi said. It'll be nice to get home. I can stay a few days this time. Ready when you are. And I have some interesting news for you about. Well, an old friend, shall we say. Parja stood up and retrieved her helmet. Got some parts to collect from Mundle Motors, and then we can be on our way. Fi decided to explain the whole Shaisa deal to Juzik later but he noticed Juzik looking discreetly around the cantina as if he was admiring the decor, and there was an expression on his face that Fi had come to know from operations. Juzik could feel something. His gaze swiveled in the direction of Shaisa and the two renegade arcs. Ah, said Juzik. Vode. Spar and Sul, Parja whispered. Juzik nodded gravely. Let's go. Fi was so used to thinking of Juzik as being on his side Jedi or Mandoad, it didn't matter that he hadn't considered how folks here would react if they found out he was a Force user. Your past didn't matter, they said. Once you put on the Besker Gam, you were family, Alliant. Fi wondered if that clean slate extended to all newcomers to the Mando way. But Sul turned slowly. He might have been checking on Fi or it might have been the general wariness that Django had instilled in all the arcs he trained. Whatever made him look, he looked. And he stood up. Do I know you? He said. There was only a handful of people in the Oyubat at that moment, which was just as well. Juzik stared back calmly at Sol. Shaisa and Spar watched as if it didn't concern them. You tell me said Juzik. So walked slowly over to Juzik. Fi found himself instinctively moving between his friend and the Ark, and Parja stepped in, too. There was no telling which way this would go. The Ark looked him up and down, and nodded knowingly at the lightsaber. 
Never met you face to face. Sol said quietly. But I know that voice from a few calm messages, don't I? I've got no argument with you, Juzik said. We're not on Karuskin now, and we're not under GR rules. Who authorized the covert ops guys to kill our own men, General? Now they had an audience, however small. If I could see two men in the corner straining to listen. He could have stopped this by now if he'd been his old self. Come to that, so could Juzik. If I had seen him smash heavy doors apart with a single gesture. He could defend himself in ways they couldn't imagine. I'm not a general now either, Sul. Juzik was very still, weight evenly on both feet. And do you seriously think I'd harm a clone? I think, said Sol, that you hypocritical mystics would waste every last one of us if it served your purposes. Watch your mouth, Fi said. That's my VOD you're talking to. Now Spar decided to get involved wandering over with apparent casual ease to stand by his brother Ark. Problem? Jedi. Sol spat out the word hand straying way too close to his blaster. A criffing Jedi, all gussied up like one of us. It was the hand that triggered Fi. Part of his brain must have been working just fine, a part that connected his fists to his animal instincts, because he brought his gauntlet up hard under Saul's jaw and sent him staggering backward into Spar. Get away from him! Fi snarled. You touch him and I'll gud you dash. It took Parja and Juzik to hold him back. He wanted to rip Sol apart, and he had no idea where the rage came from, but all he knew was that it was eating him alive and he wasn't nice, funny Fi any longer. Shaisa was on his feet in an instant, grabbing Sol by the collar and parting the three clones. Fi had no idea how he'd landed that punch in his condition but he had, and it hurt like Heron. Sol was bleeding from the lip. It's your boyish high spirits, and I know you lads enjoy a scrap. Shaisa said arm locked tight around Sol's neck. But sort this out over a nice friendly drink or two, whatever your problem is. Okay? Come on, Fi. Parja bundled him toward the doors. Not worth it. Walk away. The barkeep watched chin resting on one hand as he leaned on the counter, as if he saw fisticuffs like this all the time. Fi pulled away from Parja. You stay away from Bardike, he warned, jabbing a linger in Sul's direction. You hear me? You so much as look at him, and you're dead. The moment he got outside in the cool air, Fi felt instantly ashamed and confused. He never lost it like that before he was injured. It wasn't him at all. His heart hammered so hard it almost hurt, and he felt he had no control whatsoever over the animal part of him. Juzik took his arm and helped Parja steer him across the square to sit down by the bridge. Well, Juzik said balancing his helmet on his knee. I see you've got some higher motor skills back, and a good degree of verbal fluency. Sorry. I just saw his hand. The blaster. No problem. Thanks. Parja kept looking back toward the Oyubad as if she expected the two arcs to come after them. She patted her sidearm. Sol's just mouthing off. Rav says arcs are all mouth and commas. I can't blame him, Juzik said. He knows arcs won't get a happy retirement and it must be hard to trust a Jedi when you've been used like they have. Is everyone going to treat you like that? Fi asked. It did more than anger him, it upset him. Juzik was his buddy, his brother, as close to him as Ordo or his squad brothers. They'd had near misses and narrow scrapes, and when Fi had needed him most, he'd been there, no questions asked. Is everyone going to spit on you for being a Jedi? Because I can't stand that. It's not fair. Ah, they'll get used to me. Juzik gave Fi a playful headlock and forced a grin, but he was acting, Fi knew it. 
And it's only so, after all. Arcs are all nuts. Aiden said he nearly had to headbutt him last time. And didn't he bite Dar? Fi thought back to Gaftaker. Darman and Aten had captured Sol when he deserted and he'd sunk his teeth into Dar's hand. It was a mess. Yeah, he's got Cyborian rabies now. Now there's a word you couldn't say a month ago. Juzik got up and began walking. We're going to have you back to low spec in no time, Naviodi. Come on. Home. Juzik whistled tunelessly to himself, helmet in one hand while he twirled the hilt of his lightsaber in the other, looking for all the world like another swaggering mando without a care in the world. But Fine knew it was going to be hard for him here. He wasn't a Corellian, or a Tagorian, or any one of a thousand species that Mandalorians would accept without murmur. He'd been a Jedi, and Mandoade didn't have a good history with them. Now there were small but growing numbers of disgruntled clones who felt the Jedi were to blame for a lot of their woes. It was going to be the ultimate test of traditional Mandalorian tolerance, Cian Vedan, the virgin field of snow that everyone who put their past behind them to become a Mandalorian had a right to walk upon. Fi had been taught caution. You didn't take chances, you had to know who was watching your back. He knew he'd have to watch Juzik's back for the rest of his life. Juzik had put him back together again. It was the least Fi could do for him. Chapter 5 So Doubt we're building more ships for the Republic, far more ships than they have crews to run, in fact and how much more armor? Have I missed a decimal point here or something? I mean, this is an even bigger order than Kamino placed 12 years ago. Doesn't that sound weird to anyone? And how many biffing years are we going to have to store at this time? Production line supervisor at Rothana Heavy Engineering, checking the confidential advance workflow schedule. Omega Observation Point, Horgab, 938 days ABC. Getting your gunship shot out from under you would normally sober anyone. But it didn't even slow down the Majasi rebels. Darman scrambled to his feet, visor smeared with hydraulic fluid, expecting to see a downed vessel and body parts everywhere. The gunship was a mess, all right, all buckled metal and in flames, but the Majasi they just poured out of the crew compartment into the sandstorm fighting. Darman ducked back behind the cover of the wall and began laying down fire. He couldn't see a thing. All he could do was rely on the HUD sensors to pick up temperature variations and metallic composites in the rebels' weapons. Dar. At IKA. It was Niner. Darman could hear but not see him. Get down! Blue blaster fire cut through the whirling yellow haze. Red and white bolts spat back. The rebels had dropped down behind the ancient rubble of a collapsed wall. Where the shab are you, Sarge? I can see you, Dar. You're left of me, eight meters. The HUD view shimmered. It was like watching a scrambled holonet channel on which the vague shapes of what could have been bodies never resolved into anything instantly recognizable. Got you, Sarge. C.O.R. let out a shout. Darman couldn't tell if he'd been hit even though the upgraded biomonitors in their suits relayed their physical status. The stupid readout was set at the most awkward place on the HUD when you were busy being shot at. He hated Republic procurement more each day. C-O-R-K, you okay? Yeah. Shabir Dash. C-O-R grunted as if he'd punched someone. At I-K, watch your left, I can see one going wide Dash. Darman raised his shoulders to launch an anti-armor round but a blaster bolt hit him like a fist in the chest and winded him for a moment. Recovering, he aimed two grenades in the vague direction of fire. The ancient wall rained down on him. He ducked, Aden swore. Something had hit him, hard, and Darman shook off the debris. 
There was a moment of relative silence screaming wind. But no shots. No shouts and he was sure he'd finished off the rebels until something hit his back plate so hard that he thought more rubble had fallen on him. Firing started again. As Darman rolled over, eyes streaming with the pain, a Majasi loomed over him, his face suddenly very clear and close. His blaster was point-blank in Darman's face. No thought, no coherent words. Darman ejected his vibroblade and lunged, ramming the blade, so hard into the man's thigh that when he fell back again he couldn't pull his hand free for a few moments. The guy didn't so much scream as yelp in surprise. Adrenaline was a great anesthetic. But it didn't stop the arterial spurt, and suddenly there was blood everywhere. It's not mine, it's not mine, it's not mine. That was all that mattered. Darman got up and bolted the few meters to where he thought Niner and the others were clustered. The wind was still scouring his armor like shot blasting, but the sand seemed to be thinning out and he could see more shapes and flashes of light. How many Majasi rebels could you pack in an assault ship? A lot more than Darman thought. A lot more. Shab, why don't they just did? Aden said. Judging by the hail of red and white energy bolts that greeted him, there were twenty or twenty-five of the shock are still functioning, and that wasn't good odds now. Darman was on autopilot. He was just returning fire in a continuous stream, part of his brain telling him that the moment he stopped he'd be dead and part warning him he was running out of ammo even faster. Omega were now almost on top of the Majasi. It was like trench warfare. They couldn't have been more than ten meters apart, with only the piles of rubble and stumps of the walls for cover. When this storm drops, we're stuffed, C.O.R.R. said. How long would it take to get killed? How many blaster rounds would finally destroy their Katarn plate's energy-diffusing properties? The better protected you were, the more complex and frightening the death that awaited you, Darman decided. Without it, a clean shot would end it all. With it well, you couldn't design for immortality. Just delaying the inevitable, that was all it was. One way or another, he didn't plan to be captured. Sorry, ETIK. Didn't even leave a last message, did I? Darman loaded his last ion pulse clip and aimed at the incoming fire. He could see the far wall now. The storm was dropping. Hand to hand in the end. Yeah, he'd do whatever it took. Between bursts of fire, he reached down to his belt to check the last debt was still there. I hope I'm not hallucinating, Niner said. Listen. Darman held his breath. Nothing. He couldn't hear a thing beyond the battle. C.O.R.R. exhaled. Can't hear anything, Sarge. Then a loud voice right in his ear made Darman gasp. Someone interrupted his audio circuit. Omega, keep your heads down. We see you. Hold on. It's going to get busy. Now Darman could hear it, because it was right overhead. A rapid metallic stuttering noise with top frequencies that went right off the scale the sweetest sound in the world ALAT slash I gunship. Shab, Niner whispered. About time. The pilot wasn't joking. The instant they dropped flat in the lee of the last remaining pile of rubble, the Lardy's forward laser cannon opened up and the ground under them shook. Darman half expected the rock to split and slide just as it had when he blew out the side of the slope. He thought the deafening noise was never going to stop until the firing ended in a ringing silence and the gunship dropped like a stone onto the smoking chaos in front of them. The crew bay hatch opened. The first thing Darman saw was a white-plated arm reach out as if to haul them inboard. Omega, shift your backsides, will you? It was a sergeant, a regular trooper. The hand gesture became impatient. We don't want to missile up the chuff. Come on, chop chop. They piled in, 
numb and shaking with adrenaline. The LAT slash I lifted even before the hatch closed. As the gunship banked over the desert, Darman caught a glimpse of laser fire through the gap, and the lardy shivered as if something had hit it. Its cannon opened up again. The airframe shook as if the thing was coughing, and Darman found himself clinging to the grab rail, realizing that his left shoulder hurt, and his knee didn't feel too clever, either. Thanks, said Niner. The sergeant tapped two fingers to his helmet in mock salute. No sweat. Which genius blew up the mountain? That'd be Dar. The sergeant cocked his head. I bet he paints himself into corners, too. When Darman went to remove his helmet, his fingers snagged in the fabric trim around his neck. It took him a few moments to work out that a blaster bolt had seared a hole in it. Lucky your head's still on, C.O.R.R. said casually. This fabric's supposed to be blaster-resistant. At point-blank range? Nah. It was pointless chatter fueled by relief. Nobody would get emotional about the rescue, not yet, when actually all Darman wanted to do was to fling his arms around the sergeant and the pilot and the crazy guys manning the cannon and tell them they were all his best buddies forever. Fearfeck, we made it out alive again. No, Darman was going to say it. Neviodi, you have no idea how glad we were to see you. Darman cradled his helmet and inhaled the cool conditioned air inside the crew bay. I thought those Shaka were going to be wearing my Gidesi for earrings. The sergeant was probably staring at him. His head was in a position that looked as if he was, but he said nothing as if he hadn't heard right. What? He said at last. Things were getting Shabla Harry down there. Maybe he didn't understand what the Majasi rebels did to their enemies for revenge. Thanks. Is that the local language? What is? Nair vowed. The sergeant said carefully, as if it was the only phrase he'd caught. Darman didn't expect white jobs to understand Mandoy. It was only the Republic commandos trained by Mandalorians like Sergeant Cal who spoke the language. But every trooper flashed in the words to the marching song Voden, and some phrases like Neviodi and the best profanities had percolated through the ranks fast. Not to this guy, though. Odd. You 85th? Darman asked. 14th Infantry, said the sergeant. Okay, maybe we'll give you a crash course in Mandoi so you can exchange chit-chat with shiny boys like us. Sorry, said the trooper. His accent was different from the rest of the white jobs Darman had come across. Never heard of it. I'm new. He was new, all right. As the man moved forward to the cockpit, Hand over hand on the grab rail, Darman replaced his helmet to talk privately with the squad. Does that look like reinforcements to you? New clone intake? Niner clicked his teeth. If it is, they've changed the training program on Kamino. The meat cans all learn Vodin. Odin secured his restraints, leaned back on the seat with arms folded across his chest, and stretched out his legs indicating that he planned to sleep. Maybe the Kaminoans think the Mando thing is getting out of hand and making the lads too uppity. Maybe they're cutting corners in production, said Niner. Maybe they told some Iowa bait to COVID Loshebs I'll near it once too often, C.O.R.R. said and laughed. It was a small thing, but life and death in this business hung on the apparently inconsequential detail. Darman made a mental note to tell Skirata. Then he switched out of the squad link with a couple of blinks, and opened a private comm link to Atain's code. She needed to know he was okay, wherever she was. Republic Fleet Auxiliary Support Vessel Redeemer, off thy Farah, 940 days ABC. What's your name, Commander? The Jedi looked up at Atain as she leaned over the hangar deck gantry. She was a human female, brown-haired maybe Atain's age, 
but she didn't look like any Jedi that Ordo had seen before. No traditional brown robes, just clean but well-worn overalls as if she'd stepped straight out of a factory. Only the lightsaber she was checking over gave any indication of what she was, and even that was different from those Ordo was used to seeing. The blade was yellow, and the handle was carved with sea creatures. She wasn't one of Zay's regulation-issue Jedi. Ordo was dismayed to realize he found her rather attractive. Guilt consumed him for a moment. He felt disloyal to. Bessany for even noticing another female, and made a mental note to ask Calbear if this was a terrible failing. There was no point asking Mariel. He seemed to think it was compulsory. Callista, General, said the Jedi. Callista Masana. She nodded politely at Ordo. Captain. Delta Squad are on their way. Atene seemed at a loss for the right words, as if there was something about Callista that bothered her. Thank you for responding. Every pair of hands counts. Callista gave her an equally odd look back. You'll get used to our funny little ways, General. The woman walked away toward the L.A.T. slash I on the hangar deck, where a few other equally un-Jedi-like Jedi had gathered. Ordo was fascinated as much by Atane's reaction to these unusual officers as by their behavior. Callista put her arm around one of the young male Jedi and gave him a kiss on the cheek that was definitely not comradely. They were, as Mariel would have put it, clearly an item. Master Altus has some unconventional views on how Jedi should conduct themselves, Atane said quietly, giving Ordo a gentle shove toward the hatch. He and his followers hark back to a less rigid and ascetic age. Jedi kissing in public. And Atane has to hide her relationship with Darman? These people need to work out what they stand for. This Master Altus, Ordo said following Atane to the briefing room. How does he feel about marriage and children? Is this what Callista means by funny little ways? Atane took a breath as if she was preparing to give him a rehearsed speech. In the early Jedi Order, there was no ban on attachment, and masters could take as many Padawans to train as they liked even if they were adult. It was all much more informal. Altus is a back-to-basics kind of Jedi. Maybe you should join him. They've joined us. You know what I mean, General. What do you think Bardan would say? Juzik had rapidly become a kind of moral compass for the younger Jedi as speculation about his resignation spread. He had a reputation even before he walked out. He'd already berated the Jedi Council about its stance on the war. To some he was an example they wished they could follow, but Ordo had the feeling he shamed others, and they seemed hostile in their polite Jedi way. I think he'd tell you that everyone has to make their own decision, Ordo said. And I'd say that joining a more liberal group of Jedi would be trying to have the best of both worlds, and ignoring the issues that made Barden leave. You plan to leave the Order? I certainly do. And that was the least of Atane's challenges. Every day that she didn't tell Darman that Cad was their son made the revelation harder. Ordo had racked his brain trying to think of a gentler way to break the news, but there was no good way to do it. When they reached the briefing room, Delta Squad were listening intently to the air group commander with two other commando squads or, and Nas that were made up mostly of Rav Brawler's former trainees. None of them paid any attention to Ordo and Atane slipping in at the back. The rest of the seats were taken up by infantry troopers and pilots but there was no sign yet of Ordo's five brother nulls. There was rarely an operational need to meet face to face, but they missed one another, and Ka Marque had been out in the field for a long time on his own. What are you doing here anyway? Atane whispered. Cal sent you to keep an eye on me? No, I'm here to keep an eye on Calbear. Anything wrong? Maybe. Atane turned her head slightly to stare at him. You'd better finish the sentence. 
one of his sons contacted him to say his daughter was missing. Attain closed her eyes for a moment. Poor Cal. He never said. Missing how, exactly? I don't know. I'm waiting for Calbert to tell me. She let out a long breath. It wasn't so much a sigh as the sound of sheer fatigue and disillusion escaping from her. I would so like a simple life for us all, however hard the work. We shall have it. Make no mistake, we shall have it. Ordo rarely felt pity, but when he did and if it wasn't for his small circle of brothers he felt it for Attain. He felt it all the more now that he knew that there were Jedi who did things differently, and that if Attain had been born in a different place, or a different time, that she might have been old enough to choose whether she wanted to be a Jedi, not simply taken as a helpless baby and indoctrinated. And she could have chosen to love without fear of censure. If the galaxy had been that different, there might not even have been this war to worry about. We won't wait until the end of the war, will we? She whispered lips barely moving. But when will we know when the time is right? She was referring to desertion getting out, leaving the war behind. It was an odd question for a Jedi to ask. Ordo had always thought that their senses would tell them when momentous events would happen. He realized he had a far better chance now of predicting that from intelligence than Etain had from listening to the Force. I'll know, he said. And so will Calbert. There was no point finding a way of stopping accelerated aging if nobody survived to have the therapy. And that meant leaving millions of brother clones to fight on while the small and fortunate circle of Calbert fled. Yes. Ordo understood now why Atain couldn't bring herself to follow Juzik out of the Republic's service. Do you think Callista and her free-thinking friends are up to the task? He asked. On the dais at the front of the briefing room, the air group commander was still demonstrating with the aid of a holochart how they would insert troops to secure the spaceport. They'd never led troops, and we know what happened last time that role was dumped in Jedi laps without training. I have no idea, Attain said, but I've told the squads to ignore them if they give suicidally stupid orders. They know that. Attain was a smart woman. She knew what she didn't know, and she trusted her troops. Ordo took his leave of her with a nod and slipped out into the passage to look for his brothers. The RV point was one of the engineering spaces where the only interruption was likely to be by a maintenance droid. It wasn't ideal, but Redeemer was more or less in a convenient place at the right time, and thanks to Attain, Ordo had numerous excuses for being there. There was no sign of the other Nulls when he stepped through the hatch, but Skirata was already there. He didn't seem to hear Ordo enter and carried on talking on his calm Lincoln fond tones, his back to the hatch. I know, son, he said. But other than that, do you need anything? Is everything okay? He seemed to listen for a while, laughed ruefully and said, Red, to end the conversation. Then he tapped in another code and waited. Kui, gar I kai. Mi marti I gar? Ordo had thought he was talking to one of his real sons, Tor. But he was doing a regular call around of his commando squads, just chatting and seeing how they were. It was important, he said. Men needed to know that someone cared if they lived or died. Attain had taken that to heart, because she was visiting every single squad in her commando group, all 125 of them. Ordo waited until Skirata came to a natural pause and coughed politely. Skirata jumped as if someone had discharged a blaster behind him. Sorry, Calber. Son, you know I'm a bit deaf. Skirata turned to swing his leg over a metal bench and sit astride it. Just catching up with the Adike. It was a compartment of Skirata's life that Ordo and the other Nulls weren't quite part of, like the family the veteran sergeant had before he came to Kamino. Skirata somehow kept all three separate, 
The Nulls had barely known the commandos under Kalbir's care until after Geonosis. Ordo rationalized it as Skirata's way of avoiding any comparison between the amount of time he devoted to the Nulls and how thinly his attention was spread among a hundred or so young commandos. I've called the Vode together, Ordo said. We need to get a few things straight. All of you? Skirata looked embarrassed. That sounds ominous. Going to give me a talking to? Yes. Look, I'll book an appointment to get the leg fixed. I swear. Next week. Ordo opened his data pad and checked the calendar, thumbing through the med center codes. Mariel had fixed a slot for the surgery. No need, Berike. Done. Scarato wasn't himself. The news from his estranged family had hit him hard. Ordo thought it was unjust that his sons could disown him, and yet expect him to come running when something went wrong. They were grown men, old enough to have grandchildren of their own. But this was his daughter in trouble. She hadn't declared him Darhir. Ordo was prepared to give her some benefit of the doubt for Skarada's sake with one hand on his blaster in case she turned out to be trouble that his beloved father didn't need. Am I jealous? Am I worried because he's our father, our bear, and we don't want any interlopers? It wasn't a very mando thought. Ordo suppressed it. It was another guilty moment that made him wonder what he really was. You don't need to be a Jedi to feel something shifting, Skarada said and I've had word from Omega. They're okay. I checked. Yes, I know, but Dar said they've come across troopers who don't seem to know Vodin. In the context of a galactic war, it was less than nothing. In the context of what the Nulls had discovered on Kamino the looming end of its clone production, facilities set up on Coruscant itself and the evidence Bessany had turned up about a clone program on Centax II, it was significant. It meant that there was a new basic training schedule. The Iowa bait were nothing if not mind-numbingly consistent. The song was part of the flash learning module that taught young clones the purpose and nobility of the Republic's cause. Is this the first of our syntax batch? Ordo asked. Because I've not noticed any real increase in troop numbers. Believe me, Calbir. I'd been monitoring that very closely. They'd have to test a few in combat, wouldn't they? Or maybe give the new clones a chance to assimilate. But if they weren't trained on Topoka, and Kamino didn't provide embryos for Centax, the dates Bessany found for cloning materials being sent to Centax means we have fully grown troops being produced in a year or less. There was only one way of doing that as far as Ordo knew. Sparty cloning. Arcanian Micro? I don't think even they can beat the Year Barrier yet. They'd have to come from Sparty creations on Kartal. Or else Palpatine's brought in some ex Sparty clone masters, which is more likely. He's got Kaminoans somewhere on Coruscant, too, Skarada said. The man's quite the recruiter. Ordo didn't even need to consult his data pad. His eidetic memory summoned up an entire report from nearly two years before of the separatist destruction of the Sparty facility on Kartal. I think he picked up a few scientists after the attack on Kartal, Kalber. Sparty clones, then. How much use do you think they'll be if they churn them out in a year? Ordo felt uncomfortable to hear these men men exactly like him in most ways referred to like that, even benignly, and even by Skirata. It's not just the process, he said. It's the genetic material they're grown from. The Kaminoans weren't happy with results from second-generation tissue, which is why they kept fed around. We need to do some serious digging. Why? All we need to keep an eye on is when the Chancellor plans to deploy them. That's our cue to leave. I wasn't thinking of asking Bessany to take more risks, son. I know. The comment hung between them for a moment or two. 
Then the hatch opened and Kamarke stuck his head into the compartment. So, nobody missed me, he said. I'm gone a year, and nobody baked a cake. Kamarke. Skirata got up and embraced him with a crunch of armor plates. Ordo waited his turn. Come on, get that bucket off and let's take a look at you. Shab, son, you're looking thin. Kamarke shrugged, clipping his helmet to his belt. His face did look drawn. Ordo took advantage of the moment and moved in to hug his brother. Then the rest of the nulls showed up and the engineering space was suddenly very crowded. It was just like old times, the seven of them together, ready to take on anyone. I've been babysitting him, Calbear, Jang said. Someone has to keep him away from Mariel and his wild debauchery, after all. Pretty I gave Ordo a friendly shove in the back. It's Ordai K's turn to explore the outer rim now. It was. Ordo didn't want to leave Skirata's side if he could help it, but he was always conscious that he spent more time at base than any of the nulls. Calbear doesn't have favorites. I'll swap drafts with you then. Mariel took off his helmet and grinned. Yes, and I can look after Agent when and while you're gone. The others laughed. Ordo bristled. We're here to read Calbear the Riot Act, VODI case. Remember? I thought that maybe we could grab a meal in the wardroom and celebrate still being alive, Skarada said. After you've had your say. We'll make it quick then. Pretty, I said. One, you show up for surgery and get that ankle fixed, and no crying off like all the other times. Two, we'll find your daughter, and that way if your no-good offspring is trying to bleed you because he thinks you're rich now, we'll cut off his dash. All Skirata had done to stop Pretty Eye in mid-sentence was look faintly pained. You don't owe him anything, Calbear. Dika, he's my son. He disowned you. Your wife wouldn't let you bring up your kids as mandos, but they accepted your creds happily enough, didn't they? Funny how they declared you Darbir. It was the only Mandalorian custom they ever observed. Ordo watched the color drain from Skirata's face. It was a question he'd never dared raise, because there was only one reason why sons who'd turned their backs on their Mandalorian heritage would use the ancient law to disown their father. They knew it would hurt him. They knew how much it mattered. Whatever they do to me, Skirata said quietly, they'll never stop being my kids. Now, why don't we get a meal, and you can all tell me what you're up to. Jane, how's the fundraising going? Jane followed Skirata out through the hatch. On target, and the investment income is starting to roll in. Nice job, son. And you, Kamarke? Grievous still comes and goes on you to pal, Calbear, and he gets visits from interesting allies we didn't know he had. The regent of Garrus, in fact. And there was I thinking he was in the Republic camp. Kamarke handed Skirata a data chip. A crumb to toss to Zay hears the voice traffic between the two of them, minus the locations, of course. We don't want Windu or Kenobi charging in there and blowing it before we've milked the situation. He lowered his voice. And Grievous keeps asking Dooku what's happened to all these gazillions of droids he was promised poor old dear. I think he's been set up. Told you so, Skarada said. All propaganda. All Asik. Can I have a change of scene then? It's boring out there. Mario raised an eyebrow. You need to learn to find your own entertainment, Niviodi. The nulls laughed all the way to the wardroom. They breezed in, took a table, and Skirata ordered nerf steaks all around from the steward droid. The wardroom was usually the preserve of Nalclone officers, but those who were there sensibly made no comment about an influx of ARC troopers, and nothing about the presence of two sergeants if they even recognized Skirata and Aiden as such. They knew what Arcs did and that it was a good idea to avoid them. 
The meal was as much a rare celebration as a meeting, and the nulls even had a few glasses of Chandrelin wine. I should have done this many years ago, Adiaika. Skirata raised his glass. An IK wiretail Gaia say Admiral, Jane, Kamarke, Aiden, Prudiai. There. It's formal, legal. You're my sons and heirs. And we won't bankrupt you, Jane muttered. Not with the amount you're skimming, Naviodi, Meriel said, raising his glass in return. Thank you, Birike. An honor. At least one cause for guilt had been lifted from Ordo's shoulders. He was no longer the only no formally adopted by Skirata. It was a legal detail, nothing more, but Ordo didn't want to be singled out as the favorite. He already felt he had a far easier time than his brothers. They carried on chatting nothing confidential, not until they were back on the secure helmet link until Ordo noticed a couple of the mongrel lieutenants, the non clones in their drab gray fabric uniforms, looking past him toward the entrance with mild amusement. Ordo turned. Behind him, a young ensign stood glowering at the nulls and caught his eye. Clone! Snapped the ensign. What's the meaning of this? Clone. It was never a good opening line. Mariel stifled a smile. Remember, no entrails, Ward I.K. Folks are still eating. But Ordo couldn't laugh it off. Not only was it a gross insult, it was also a test. If he allowed this upstart to disrespect him, he encouraged him to treat all clones badly. A lesson was needed. Ensign, he said slowly. I'm not clone. I'm captain. He tapped his red pauldron meaningfully. Captain Ordo, Arc N11, Special Operations Brigade, Grand Army of the Republic. And you'll address me properly. The wardroom fell silent. The ensign had taken on an Arc Trooper, and he was going to get his shebs handed to him. Ordo could sense their anticipation without any need for telepathy. You can't talk to me like that, the ensign said. You're a clone. Ordo stood and ambled slowly toward him, both thumbs hooked in his belt, coming to a halt almost nose to nose. It was hard not to hit the brat and be done with it. He wanted to very badly, and noted the comper pin next to the ensign's flash. Political ideologue, eh? It was the Commission for the Protection of the Republic, strutting little twerps who wanted firm government as long as it was imposed on lesser beings and not them and proud to be one, Ordo said, feeling his throat tightening and his pulse accelerating. Designed to be superior. And looking at you, I can see why the Republic had to buy in a real navy. What's your problem? You can't bring non-commissioned ranks into the wardroom. The ensign hadn't backed down, so he was doing better than most. Officers only dash. Quote him the regs, Ordike. Pretty I laughed. Chapter and subsection. That'll teach him. But the ensign was on his suicide run now. He pointed at Skirata. And as for bringing the hired help in here, that mercenary dash. Up to that point, Ordo had balanced on that fine edge between finding things almost funny and being irritable. He was aware of his moods and occasionally explosive temper. They said the nulls were all psychos, screwed up to by too much genetic tinkering, and Ordo knew his reactions weren't those of a normally socialized human being. But he had bigger issues on his list than satisfying this ensign's desire for a sergeant-free wardroom, and he let his instincts take over. His instincts were very, very angry. Gar Regulation 5611, Subsection A An officer may invite guests into the wardroom. Ordo said. And you'll apologize to Sergeant Skirata right now. I will do no such thing. I'll have you court-martialed. Ordo answered to nobody but Skirata. This little gutworm had to apologize. 
It was a matter of honor, and not just his. Really? Court marshaled this. He brought his head down sharply in a well-practiced headbutt, and the crack of bone not his split the wardroom air. The ensign fell backward with a shock to have sound, hands cupped to his nose. There was plenty of blood. I'm sticking you on a charge, Ordo said calmly, picking up a pristine white napkin to wipe his forehead. Without a helmet, it always hurt more than he expected. Insubordination. What's your name? The ensign was stunned, in more ways than one. Lou. Luscody. And now, Ensign Luscody, you'll say the magic words. He grabbed the kid's collar, hauled him upright, and stood him in front of Calbear. Apologize to Sergeant Skirata. The ensign glanced around, maybe calculating his chances of dropping Ordo, maybe looking to more senior officers to back him up. Nobody else moved. Ordo tightened his grip. I apologize, the ensign said at last. Sergeant. Skirata raised his glass. Apology accepted, son. Now use an e before my boys really lose their tempers. Ensign Luscody left to a polite ripple of applause from one corner of the wardroom. He obviously wasn't popular. A steward droid trundled up to the table with a jug of ale that Skirata hadn't ordered. Most entertaining, Captain. A commander sitting at a nearby table nodded, indicating the drinks were on him. How I've longed to do that. The ensign would think twice about treating another clone like dirt. But so would the more polite officers here. Violence had its place in education. Coassii, said Skirata. Cheers. It was a telling phrase, K-O-S-E-I. It was a command that meant, stay alive. And so it was a toast, or an exhortation to hang in there, or even to come home safely. Staying alive and making the most of each day's living underpin much of the Mandalorian language. Koasii, Aiden said. Oya Manda. Ordo, never fond of alcohol stared into his glass and wondered what the Republic's armed forces would be like if they had to recruit wholly from non-clones. Whoever had ordered the clone army had excellent foresight. But as Fi had once said, they might have set up the whole war anyway, not that a carefully planned war looking for an excuse to start was anything remotely new in the galaxy. It was still important to find out exactly who could plan so far ahead, and so well. Hangar Deck, Redeemer, two hours later. Skirata found a quiet corner of the hangar deck as he waited for the transport, staring at the comm link in his hand for a long time before keying in Tor's code. It had taken him three days to work out what to say. He thought he'd calm his estranged son straight back and demand to know what had happened to his daughter, buoyed up on a wave of anxiety, but there was too much water under the bridge and the boy was a stranger. Boy. Tor was thirty-nine now. Maybe he even had grandchildren. That was possible, if he'd been Mandalorian and married very young as Mandoate did, but his mother wouldn't have allowed that. Elippi thought the Beskergam was dashing when she married Skirata. But his long absences on deployment started to wear on her with three small kids to care for and then she hit the big cultural wall tour was coming up on eight years old, and Skirata wanted to do as all Mando fathers did to take his son to train and fight alongside him for five years. Skirata could picture a lippy now, five-year-old Ruzan and six-year-old Ijot clinging to her legs crying, while she yelled that no baby boy of hers was going to war. From that argument and she shouldn't have yelled like that, not in front of the kids their marriage went rapidly downhill. The next time he came home on leave, the kids were with her parents on Corellia, and she told him she wanted a divorce. It took thirty seconds, Mando style a short oath to wed and a shorter one to part. Skirata handed her all his earnings and left for another war. Every credit. Every credit I didn't absolutely need to survive, until the day I left for Kamino. Then I was dead and gone. 
He waited for Tor to answer with calm links set on audio only. He had no idea what to call him. Son? He called most younger men, son, by default. This time it wasn't a reflex. Skirata here, said a voice. For some reason he expected Tor to have rejected his name, and it shocked him into brief silence to hear it. Hello? It's me. Cal Skirata. I... I didn't think you'd call back. Skirata plunged in as he would with Zay, and bit back the urge to ask every detail of their lives. They'd decided not to be his sons, and begging for crumbs would only make things worse. Cool distance was the only way to deal with it. He used the word missing. Is Ijot okay? He's fine. Tell me about Razan. We lost contact with her some months ago. And now you start looking? We drifted apart. The adult Tor was a stranger. The Tor that Skirata was reaching out to had grown up and changed years ago. There was nothing familiar even about his voice. Skirata's finger hovered over the hologram key, wanting to activate it to see what his boy had grown into, and finally he gave into thirty-two years of wondering. The hologram shimmered into life, blue and unreal. Tor was dark-haired thickset, smartly dressed and that was all Skirata could tell. Lora's holograms were lousy on detail. And Tor could see him, and what was immediately behind him. Where are you? He asked. Who's oh, wow, that's the Republic Army. They're clone troops, Skirata said. My boys, too. I'm on the front line. You always were. Tor was on neutral Corellia if his calm signal was real it would be. Of course and his only contact with the war was probably via HNE bulletins. How could he ever understand his father? Tor, tell me what happened to Razan. I need all the data you can give me. Yes, we thought you'd be best place to find her. When, where, how? How can I talk to a kid I raised as if he's a client? I need detail. She was living on Drawl, last we knew. We didn't see her more than once a year, but when her comm code didn't function, we got worried. Her apartment was cleared out, and there was no sign of her. Did you check her bank account? Why? Activity. Withdrawals, or a complete lack of them. No. I don't have any access. We weren't that close. I would have raised you smarter, son. And we'd have been close. What does she do for a living? She drifts. Security. Bartending. A bit of career work now, she says. Please don't let her be a mercenary. I wasn't there to teach her how to stay alive. Did you report her missing to the Corellian cops? They said she was an adult free to go where she liked, and we'd have to come back with evidence of a crime before they could get involved. Okay. I need her state ID number and a recent hollow image. I've got her date of birth. She's my girl. She's still my daughter. I'll do the rest. I know it'll cost you, but we can pay. No. Thanks. You look... like you've had a tough time. Dad. So now Skirata was dad again. That hurt. In his peripheral vision, he could see Mariel and Ordo chatting, thinking they were keeping a discreet eye on him when he knew perfectly well that they were standing by to pick up the pieces. Would he take Tor and Ijot back? Would he swap any of his clone sons for those he had some genetic investment in? Never. Is that bad? Understandable? Noble? I still don't know. It just... is. I'm doing fine, 
Skirata said, struggling with the mix of remembered heartbreak and resentment that he couldn't link to the person he was looking at now. I didn't want to leave. I wouldn't have left. I sent you every cred I earned. Calm me the data and I'll find her. It's what I do. Tor seemed to be hovering on the brink of saying something. His fidgeting was visible. I just want you to know we're sorry. It was about Mama, that's all. We just wanted you to be there when she was dying. Skirata gave up trying to handle the welter of emotions. He could see a red and white blur striding toward him, but he didn't look up. There's no point going over it now. We did what we did, son, and for reasons that made sense to both of us at the time. Son. It slipped out. Ordo, helmet under one arm, moved purposefully into the range of the hollow video pickup and put his hand on Skirata's arm. It was a real hands-off-my-father gesture. There, General Termyukin needs to speak to you. Ordo's tone was pointed and maybe Skirata was imagining it, but there was some emphasis on the bear. She's about to leave. It broke the spell. Got to go, Tor, Skirata said. Get that data to me as soon as you can. Bear? Tor asked. He called you father. So how did you introduce your estranged biological son to his adopted stepbrother? Skirata decided he wouldn't even try. Tor, this is one of my sons. Captain Ordo Skirata. Look, tell Ija tell him not to worry and that it's all going to be okay. Skirata closed the link abruptly and looked up at Ordo. The null managed to look both faintly disapproving and guilty at the same time. Sorry, Calbear. I wouldn't have known how to end the conversation anyway, son, Skirata said. It's bothering you, isn't it? Not exactly a joyous reunion. I'm not even sure was missing. They just don't know where she is. Skirata decided to keep an open mind until he could hack into Ruzan's bank account and see if it was still active. She sounds like a restless spirit. I meant, Ordo said grimly, that you're distressed by your sons. Are you? If you want to be reconciled with them, we'll do whatever you want to ensure it's trouble-free. Ordo had never shown the slightest sign of jealousy as a kid. Each of the Nulls was in that curious clone way anxious not to have more privileges than his brothers. It was a way of avoiding conflict in a closed stifling, wholly artificial clone society in Topoka City. But the Nulls had also been genetically altered to maximize the potential for fierce loyalty in Fett's typical Concord Dawn genome. Their brutal infancy before Skirata rescued them had made that potential manifest itself fully, and if a null liked you, he'd die for you. If he didn't, it was a good idea to run for it. They had no middle path. They're never going to take your place, son. Skirata gripped his arm. And I wanted to tell him to use an E, but I have to be bigger than that, because a father's responsibility doesn't have an expiry date. I could have tried to stay in touch better than just transferring creds. Ordo very upright, thumbs hooked in his belt tilted his head slightly. They bled you dry and finally rejected you, and you still love them. Don't you? I don't know, Ordo K.A. Skirata saw Atain making full speed on a collision course with them, two lightsabers swinging on her belt, and dwarfed by the huge concussion rifle slung across her back. But if they hadn't, I'd never have had to take Django's offer to train clones, and then I'd never have met you. Ordo's head dropped a little. And we'd have been euthanized, because nobody else would have thought our lives worth saving. If the tidy nature of fate is the point, I accept the argument, but that doesn't change what happened to you. Well, if you want something to shine bright, it has to be polished hard. Skirata wondered exactly what Django would have done if he hadn't been there to stop Orinwa from having the Null Kids put down. 
Django talked tough was tough but his callous attitude didn't extend to children, however brutal it looked from the outside. Django might have been a self-centered Shakar, but don't believe all that bluster about Boba being nothing more than his apprentice. He wanted a son, no doubt about it. He knew what it was to be a kid waiting to die, so I reckon he'd have given the Iwabait a good hard Kavanwayan and sent him on his way. Shame you didn't do a hit more for the other boys cloned from you, Jang I.K., but I suppose you didn't have much pity left after all that happened to you. Atain strode up and looked into Skirata's face. What's wrong? She asked. And what's a Kavan Wayan? A headbutt, said Ordo. A Keldeb kiss. Atain wore a little frown of concentration. Skirata suspected she was memorizing every Mandoe phrase she could, the better to be a good Mando wife in due course. Cal, the two of you are radiating trouble like a beacon. Can I help? Family strife, he said. Your Jedi radar is pretty impressive. So is the strife. Ordo said cryptically, then squeezed Skirata's bicep in parting. Rhett. Calbear. Supply droids and repulsor trolleys began filling the deck, transferring pallets of food, spare parts, and fuel cells from stores to a replenishment shuttle. Redeemer was a heavily armed warehouse. Atain and Skirata were about to go their separate ways again. Any message for Veshik squad? She asked. I'm paying a field visit. Skirata pulled out a packet of candied bivet fruit and handed it to her. Tell them to remember to brush their teeth afterward. You miss them. Yeah. Skirata wondered what Atain was going through being separated from her son so often. In case you're still wondering, I just spoke to one of my biological sons for the first time since he disowned me. It's never easy. It's your daughter, yes? She's probably gone off on some adventure, but I'll find her anyway, just in case. I can't work out if Ordo's jealous or scared, but he's very upset. He's got nothing to worry about. That boy's my heart, and he knows it. Just let me get this straight, Cal. I did the sums. You were still supporting your kids financially when they were pushing 30. None of my business, but I think you more than did your duty by them. Atain had an earnest little face dusted with freckles. Skirata sometimes found it hard to reconcile her durasteel will with that apparently fragile exterior. The way you first described how they disowned you made me think they were still children, not grown men. And you didn't walk out. You were dumped. It was my rough Mando charm. Irresistible. I'm saying that you've got nothing to feel guilty about. I'm with Ordo on this. It's not healthy to be at their beck and call. There was a small place in Skirata's mind where he knew that was true, but the rest of him felt he'd failed. Attain meant well. Like Ordo, she seemed only to want to protect him. Now how about you? I'm going to tell Darman about Cad when he comes back from Horgab. Okay. And I'm going to leave the Jedi Order. Skirata kept his reaction to himself. She'd sense it anyway. Now? No, but I'll know the right time. My work's not finished yet. Someone called to her. A young lieutenant not a clone, but a random human being stood with one boot on the rail of a small armored shuttle. General? Flight checks complete, ma'am. Ready when you are. Atain gave Skirata a wink. I'll make sure Veshik brushed their teeth. Force be with you, Calbear. She walked away, still looking like an attachment to the cone rifle. He knew very few Jedi with a taste for the weapons of the ordinary soldier. So far, they'd all ended up in his motley gang. Calbear. She calls me Calbear. Skirata checked his comm-link data display for files from Tor, 
and wondered what Razam would call him when he found her. Chapter 6 As a Jedi, I was taught to preserve life. I let these clones know, these men to their deaths. These were living, sentient beings. What I have been asked to do is the opposite of everything I was trained to do as a Jedi. Master Crook, in self-imposed exile on Rull, explaining to Mace Windu why he chose not to continue as a general, shortly before returning to the Order to fight again. Had forward operating base, Horgab, one and a half months later. What happened, General? Did we finally find something worth pillaging from this planet? Attain just sighed to herself, but it wasn't directed at Scorch. He knew that Attain was the most relaxed of generals and didn't mind her commandos mouthing off. He shook his head at the size of the Horgab base, which had grown to something approaching a small city itself, and wondered why the GR presence here was getting bigger rather than smaller. This ball of rock wasn't worth the effort. If the locals wanted to kill each other, Scorch could SEC no reason to get in their way. The whole planet could turn separatist and nobody would ever notice the difference. Ours is not to reason why, Naviodi, Sev said. Bred to be happy with our fate and all that sewage. Shabla Asik, Scorch said. Remind me to punch the next dumb city that says that. Scorch doubted he would ever get within punching distance of a civilian who knew enough about them to even say it, but it was a nice fantasy for a few seconds. Boss and Sev went off in the direction of the mess, and Fixer hung around like a little black cloud of disapproval. He examined the new ordinance. Yes, we should have put the civilian government back in the pilot's seat and withdrawn troops from here by now, Attain said. But it doesn't seem to work like that. Grab yourself something to eat while things are quiet. She strode off in the direction of the base commander's office. Inside a minute, there was a distant but deafening wump and the whole building shook. Scorch ducked instinctively as dust rained gently from the joists overhead. Incoming. A clone's voice called, feigning boredom, and everyone around laughed. Yeah, quiet. Fixer pried open an ammo crate with his gauntlet vibroblade and rummaged through the contents. Regular spa retreat. He tooted loudly. Diskilling, that's what this is. What is? Scorch asked thinking about his next meal. In this game, you grabbed whatever you could whenever you could and as much of it as possible food sleep, water, laughs. There were a lot of clone troopers milling around, and he didn't recognize the unit flashes on a couple of them. Scorch didn't like not knowing things. He filed it mentally as something to catch up on later. Going to lodge a complaint with the Galactic Union of Amalgamated Building Wreckers? Fixer examined the new Mersan entry grenade with sighing disdain. Even a weak way could use this. That's the whole idea, genius. You ought to suggest that to Mersan as an advertising slogan. Scorch took the grenade from him and attached the standoff rod, then slid the grenade's housing over the muzzle of his dice. A couple of troopers watched warily. It wasn't a smart thing to do inside a building. The device was designed to blow out doors from a safe distance safe for the operator, any way to effect a rapid entry. Personally, I don't mind trading professional exclusivity for an absence of pain. Fixer held out his hand for the grenade. Scorch returned it, and the troopers appeared to relax again. I thought you were a craftsman. I am. I just don't like being met with a hail of blaster bolts when I knock on doors, that's all. Fixer slipped a couple of the grenades into his belt pouch. The two of them wandered off toward the scent of frying oil and hot sauce, removing their helmets to get a good deep lumpful of the seductive aromas without air filters getting in the way. In the mess hall, white armor in various states of cleanliness, from snowfield to rolling in the dirt, formed an unbroken sea except for a little craggy island of matte black, burly Katarn Mark III rig. 
Etienne was huddled at a table in conversation with Omega Squad. Thought she was heading to see the CO, Fixer said. Scorch looked around for a splash of red and orange to spot Sev and Niner. They were in line, getting their plates loaded by a droid that seemed a little too obsessive about portion control for Sev's taste. Sev's voice carried across the burble and hum of mess hall chat. I need extra protein. Otherwise my aim wanders, and then I shoot tinnies. By accident, on account of being starved. She must have diverted. Scorch wanted to stay on the subject. Well, she could hardly walk past Darman, could she? It'll end in tears, Fixer said. Spolesport. Seriously. It's not right. Clones shouldn't mix with officers. Let alone Jedi officers. What, in case we get ideas above our station? Don't know our place, to die nice and quietly so we don't upset the civvies? You spend too long talking to Fi and those null dingbats, Scorch. You've seen the average galactic citizen now. We didn't know any better on Kamino. If anyone's superior, it's us, not them. Fixer just stared at him. It was the most dangerous thought Scorch had ever expressed. But he wasn't going to be made to feel he was less than fully human because he'd been hatched rather than born, because he'd seen plenty of natural humans now, and they weren't much to write home about. He was the best of the best. He deserved the same respect as the next man, and maybe a little more. You're jealous of Darman, Fixer said at last. She's not my type. Scorch felt unaccountably angry. But if you're saying I envy him for having the guts to live his life, not the life he's been told to get on with, then yes. I am. Decut. Fixer muttered. Sometimes too often, in fact Scorch had nothing to do but wait, and thinking filled the time even when it was the last thing he wanted to do. He often thought about Skarada's new grandson. Clones, like all beings in the galaxy, speculated and gossiped. You reckon that baby is a clones? Scorch said at last. What baby? Fixer targeted the menu suspended above the servery. They actually had a choice. Troopers parted to let him pass. What's up with you today? The baby Skirata brought into the barracks when Zay was away. His grandson. Snack-sized. Yeah. Why do you think that? It's just weird to hand your kid over to a Mando who's fighting in a war. I mean, how bad must things be at home if the kid's safer with Skirata? So why does it have to be a clone's baby? And maybe Skirata's family lives in the Sheb's end of the galaxy, so it's an improvement to have the old Shabir hauling Junior around minefields. Karuskant. Not exactly minefields. Scorch thought of the baby's curly black hair and dark eyes. There was something. Something very familiar about him. The kid could easily have been one of the younger clones back on Kamino, those baffled and serious youngsters who once stared at older clones like Scorch in the refectory. That was me, not so long ago. Scorch saw himself in their eyes. Desperate to succeed aware of yearning for something but not able to articulate it, feeling safe only among his immediate brothers. Scared. Scared of everything. I think I'll have the mince nerfs too, Fixer said like he was some kind of restaurant critic. Scorch couldn't recall if Fixer had ever had that wide-eyed look when they were kids. You, Scorch? Uh, whatever's the biggest portion. Shaka Noodles Looking after a clone's kid was just the kind of thing Skirata would do. He'd been an assassin, a dead enforcer, any number of brutal and unpitting things, but he loved his boys to blind distraction. If any of them had found time to get a girl pregnant, he would take in that kid as his own kin. What if it's one of Omega's kids? Scorch said. 
Fixer turned his head slowly. He had to twist from the waist because his backpack frame was too high to glance over his shoulder. What are you yammering on about? Drop it. I said what if the baby was fathered by one of Omega Squad? Scorch tried to keep his voice down. They're his favorites. Have you been drinking contaminated drive coolant again? Okay, forget it. Fixer was far more interested in his meal. Scorch turned very slowly to watch Atane and Omega chatting. It had been no secret when the two squads did joint ops on Coruscant that the General and Darman were lovers. Scorch had found that such a difficult concept to handle that he simply shut it out and reminded himself he didn't have time for anything but staying alive. He worried that he was getting like Phi. The smart-mouthed little decut had become a watchword within Delta Squad for doing everything a clone commando was supposed to avoid he craved the outside world too much. He voiced his dissatisfaction, and he encouraged the same kind of dissent among his brothers. He was subversive. He should have known the only way out was in a body bag. What was it they were all told back in training? They had certainty, they had a purpose, and that was more than most beings ever got in their miserable lives. Okay, so why isn't it enough? Might be Darman's love child with the general. Fixer said, seeming to tune back into the topic. The droid slopped a brown liquid mass onto a mound of mashed vegetables. It would have needed a forensic test to confirm it was minced nerf and gravy, but this was still a long way from the bland nutrition cubes they'd been fed as kids and still carried as part of their dry rations. Hot, savory food was a luxury that Scorch never took for granted. She disappeared to Kalura for ages. Or maybe it's Captain Mazes, because he's such a smooth-talking rogue that no female could resist him. Maze was an iceberg on legs, and a grumpy one at that. Now you're the one drinking coolant. I can have crazy theories, too. Can't get any crazier than that. I win. Now eat. They grabbed their trays and made their way to the table occupied in the full military sense of the word by Boss and Sev. Omega might have mixed with other brigades and ranks, but Delta still liked their own company, and whatever mood they conveyed to other clones usually made them want to sit somewhere else. Scorch wanted to wander over to the white jobs with the unit badge he didn't recognize and ask a few questions. But it could wait. He wedged his dice and helmet between his feet and tucked into a mountain of noodles. So what's the general here for, then? Boss worked his way through a pile of oozing red-fruited pie. Other than visiting her favorite squad? She hands out candy, Sev said. Every time she visits a squad in the field, she takes treats for them. Just like Skirata. Maybe he'll teach her to garrote folks as well as he does, too. She's been bleeding about the number of men they've committed to this dump, Sev said. I overheard General Mlask say she's nagging Zay and Camus to withdraw the garrison and leave the locals to sort themselves out, because they'll be as much trouble for the Separatists as they are for us. Might tie them up here for free. Fixer chewed. The table was silent except for the faint wet sounds of eating for a few moments. There's a sort of logic to Dash. That was as far as Boss got. One moment the mess hall was lit by sunlight slanting through blast shutters set high in the walls, and the next scorch was blown backward by an instant whirlwind of shattered duraplast into darkness and sheets of flame. Something smashed him full in the chest and winded him. It was the table. He groped for his rifle, but his helmet had gone flying, and he lay on his back trying to suck in breaths, succeeding only in swallowing dust that choked him. He couldn't breathe but he could hear. That was something. The yelling began right away. No screams, just shouts to do this, check that, get medics. Scorch made a few attempts to sit up before he realized the table was still on top of him. Then the weight suddenly lifted. 
He was looking up at Sev through a haze of settling permacrete dust, so unsure of how long he'd been on his back that he checked the chrono display on his forearm plate and then realized he couldn't work it out from that anyway. Direct hit on the front entrance. Sev wiped his mouth on the back of his hand. His face was peppered with tiny beads of blood as if he'd had a bad time shaving. You okay? What happened to the perimeter defense systems? We're supposed to be secure here. Sev hauled him to his feet, but there was nowhere clear to stand. The mess hall was a mass of upended tables and chairs. It hadn't taken the full force of the missile, but the shock wave and debris had punched out the hall doors and flung anything that wasn't secured across the room. It had flung metal trays like Kasky throwing blades, turning them into lethal weapons. Scorch had that moment of trying to make sense of what he was looking at but not wanting to, because his brain was saying horrible, look away no look, you have to, even if it makes you sick. The trays had hit two men standing near the racks where they'd been stored, and one of them was in just his fatigues, a tray had taken off his leg at the knee. His buddies were kneeling beside him, giving him first aid. The other they'd given up on him. The impact had sliced off the top of his head. Some things in battle you shut out, and some you couldn't and would never stop seeing. Scorch felt the scene slot into his memory as if it would never fade. It was the incongruity of it, a scene of carnage with food and cups spread among the blood. Then rage took him. He felt himself go from stunned slow motion to off the scale in a blink. Nobody expected to have to die while they were off duty trying to grab a meal. Out of all the death he'd seen so far, this was different, he was different, and he felt he tipped over an edge that he would never be able to draw back from again. He started sorting through the debris, flinging aside the plastoid tables, oblivious to everything around him except finding his dees, locating the scum who did this, and blowing their brains out. He was nearly at the shattered doors when he felt someone grab his right shoulder plate from behind. Scorch. It was Boss, with Sev right behind him. Scorch was aware of frantic activity all around him and an alarm klaxon screaming close by, but he couldn't pay attention to it. It felt like it was all happening behind a transparent steel barrier. Whoa there. You don't know where you're heading yet. Boss spun Scorch around and handed him his helmet. And you'll probably need this. Just being stopped in his tracks was enough to jerk him out of the blind rush to exact revenge. He found himself panting. The hall came back into focus. The sound was making sense now. The rest of his squad looked a mess, covered in fine dust, and then Omega came scrambling over to them, kicking chairs aside. Atain appeared from the other side, hair in a tangle but very alert. Everyone okay? She asked. Scorch, did you get hit by anything? Did you lose consciousness? I'm not concussed, he said firmly. His voice sounded odd to him. Maybe he looked crazy to her. I just want to kill the Shabir who did this. How did they get past the missile defenses? I just raised the base security team, she said. The security scanners showed the trajectory of the missile, and it came from inside the city. Not from the rebel positions. Have they calculated a location yet? To within one block, Niner said. Good. Scorch felt that they were staring at him, but even though he was back in control again, he still knew that only one thing would let him sleep tonight. Time for house calls. Treasury offices, Karuskant. Ooh, said Jilka. She took Bessany's wrist as if arresting her and yanked her hand up to inspect it. That's nice. Bessany should have known she could get nothing past Jilka's on Zantis. The woman was a tax investigator. She could assess a defaulting taxpayer's net worth to the last cred just by sniffing him blindfolded. 
She zeroed in on the ring that Bessany had thought was discreet and understated. It's nothing. Doesn't look like nothing to me, Joka said. Bessany made an effort to herd her into a quieter corner of the archive area. Looks like top-grade sapphire. Looks like you ditched Soldier Boy for a more upmarket model. Soldier Boy, Bessany said feeling her throat tighten with temper, has not been ditched. And I'm going to get Ordo out of the army. She swallowed hard knowing it was unwise to say it, but she would not cover him up like some guilty secret simply because he was a clone. We got married. Joka looked as if Bessany had told her she was joining a Jabimi terrorist group for a lark. Can you even do that? No law against it. At least it had distracted Joka from a full assay of the stone. Bessany willed her not to say that she couldn't marry a clone, because then she wouldn't be able to bite back a retort. And I know what I'm getting into, before you ask. Record droids word passed in the corridor. I haven't a clue what you're getting into, so I wouldn't ask, Joka said. And you don't talk about him much, so there's not much for me to warn you about anyway. Boy, are you edgy lately. She shrugged. Well, congratulations. No nuptial cake to share? Bessany was edgy all right. It wasn't just a small matter of slicing data from the Republic computer network on a regular basis. She'd almost grown used to the constant anxiety about that. It was the criffing Sharoni sapphires that were uppermost in her mind, possibly because they were so visible and her data theft wasn't. She thought she'd put the problem to rest when Vav had the three gems recut into smaller stones for her by one of his dodgy hut contacts. That had shaved a lot off the value. But they were still worth millions, and they were almost impossible to trace. She'd weakened and had one made into a ring, to stop Ordo from feeling he'd been rejected. Once he was reassured that she'd have been as happy with a plastoid band, she'd sell it to raise hard credits. It's wrong. I shouldn't benefit from this. She kept the rest of the stones in her jacket, wrapped tightly in a small flimsoplast bag, because she wasn't sure what to do with them. One idea nagged at her like a begging child. It's crazy. But someone I know has a very good use for those creds, for clones even Scarata won't be able to help. It's the war. Bessany said which was true. At least it'll be over. Jilka's eyes still strayed to the sapphire, but it was the cold appraisal of a professional calculating unpaid tax, not a woman admiring a bauble. And it won't reach Coruscant. What makes you say that? It just won't. I meant why you think it'll be over. Joka shrugged. She seemed to be picking her words, but Bessany knew her well enough to know she was trying to avoid saying the obvious, that the Republic might have to give in to separatist demands, because the war was stretching it thin. She would stop short of saying that clone casualties would be too high to carry on. That was too crass an observation, true or not. At least she kept up to speed with the progress of the war. That was more than most. Cost too much, Joka said at last. Senator Skinas raised a question in the Senate about the large numbers of gunships being ordered that are taking too long to get to the front line. I think they've got a budget crunch, but the accounts are such a mess it's hard to know where to start. Ah. Skina was a decent, moral human being who cared about the treatment of clone troopers. He was a few months behind Bessany on this one. She wished he was less diligent. She didn't want attention drawn to the very area she was investigating. Maybe giving him the proceeds from selling the sapphires was too risky. Start. Start? What do you mean, start? Bessany asked. Well, if he gets the Senate to back his call for a full audit, some unlucky person's going to have to do it. Bessany had always been good at covering her tracks. For the past fifteen months or so, 
She mined the Republic's financial network for apparently routine data on exports and defense procurement, patiently piecing together a complex picture of ships being ordered from KDY and laboratory supplies heading for Centax 2. It'll be me. She said wishing Skeena had either shut up or started his finance crusade a lot earlier, when it would have given her better cover for her own activity. And I could do without an extra project right now. Bessany looked at the chrono on the archive wall and edged toward the doors with her box of data chips. Got a lot to catch up with. See you later. Did you ever find that medical supplies company you were trying to track down? No, I had to admit defeat on that one. Bessany said far too quickly. Jilka would know that wasn't like Bessany at all. Bessany hoped she'd put it down to worrying about Ordo. When she was safely in her own office, she went through her daily routine of running a search for all new transactions on the treasury ledger sometimes, as many as a million line items a day and set it to look for defense and medical product codes. Anyone hiding those items probably wouldn't use them, but she had to start somewhere each day. She could refine them farther by delivery target dates. Any expenditure was sorted by the quarter in which it was due to be drawn down from the budget. What was she really looking for now, anyway? Timetables. She knew what was happening. She just needed as many clues as she could get for Skarata to decide when the time would be right to pull his boys out. And me. She'd never been to Mandalore, and she hadn't the first clue what a frontier existence on a backward rural planet might be like. As she glanced at her office worker hands, soft and manicured, she decided it was too late to worry about that now, and concentrated on the scrolling lines of data in slight defocus, letting her eyes scan rather than trying to read. The medical items weren't showing any pattern, but the defense procurement codes were clustering around the same period about a month or two away. On its own, that was nothing, added to what she already knew, it just reinforced the time period that was becoming more apparent as the likely time for the big push. She made a copy of the defense budget data perfectly legitimate in her current role but transferred it onto her private data pad rather than her treasury one for transmission to Skirata. How much does he tell Atain? Bessany hardly saw her. It was just as well, because she wasn't sure what she could safely discuss with her. The two women could hardly sit down over a cup of CAF and chat about the various scams she'd pulled. It was one deception layered on top of another, even within their own circle. Bessany stuck to her routine, going out at lunchtime to stretch her legs and transmit the data clear of the building. As soon as her encrypted system indicated that the data had been received she deleted the files. The less time she had them on her pad, the better. A brisk walk around the plaza and a little window shopping created the illusion that life went on as it always had for her, instead of the minutes ticking down toward the time when she would have to leave everything she knew. As she walked, she felt the hairs on her nape prickle, as if someone was behind her again. She really had to shake this off. If she didn't, she'd be completely nuts soon. A casual glance over her shoulder confirmed as it did almost every time that there was nobody around but office workers on their meal break and shoppers, just like her. These days, she saw clone patrols on the streets. It had started with a few outside main government buildings, and now she was seeing them daily, the same white armor she was used to, but some with blue sigils and plate detail, some with red. She made a note to ask Ordo who they were, and carried on shopping. What matters more? An easy life, or doing what's right? You can make a difference. So it's your moral duty to do it. That's what Dad would have done. She'd cope, because Etain would, and so would Lasima. They were all in this together. Back in the office, she leaned back in her chair and unlocked her terminal to begin today's task real work. The stuff she was paid to do checking a tip-off that catering contracts were being awarded to non-existent companies, the credits pocketed by someone in the procurement service. It was a common scam and a big, complex budget. Just can't get the staff these days, 
she muttered to herself. Okay. Let's see. She accessed the treasury database of registered companies, which was simple enough. But when she tried to cross-check an entry with a CHA food hygiene inspection, she hit a problem. Instead of lines of names, addresses, and registration numbers, she got only a portal screen. Access was denied. The system was usually more reliable than that. J9. She called. J. The support droid was usually wandering up and down the corridor on this floor of the building ready to be summoned to fix computer problems. He rarely had to be called. Normally, the sound of distant swearing was enough to summon him. She heard the faint hum of his repulsors as he glided down the corridor, the top of his dome just visible above the rail in the transparent steel wall. Agent Wenin, said the droid hovering in front of her desk. Problem? I can't get into the CHA network, Jay. It's locked me out. As soon as she said it, her gut nodded. They've caught me. In the weeks after Ordo had killed the Republic's spy trailing her, she'd waited for that knock at the door or a hand on the shoulder to tell her the game was up, but nothing had happened. Central Tech took down the network during the meal break. The droid said. They found what appears to be a virus in the system, so they activated the departmental firewalls. Nothing to worry about. All requests for data will have to be via com link for a few days, that's all. Did you not receive notice of the shutdown? Obviously not, she said. Relief of a kind flooded her, but it didn't stop that churning sensation that spread from her stomach and became a feeling of cold tension in her thigh muscles. And why does neutralizing a virus take days? We've never seen this before. It's very sophisticated. We're not even certain what it's doing, because it causes no disruption, but there's definitely something running across the network that wasn't installed by the Treasury and shouldn't be there. I'll bet. Jane and Mario were gifted slicers. And she'd watched Ordo hack into the Republic Intel system with the ease of someone checking his stock prices. There was no magic or mystery in it, just the right inside information. Almost every breach of security she'd ever investigated came down not to brilliant computer skills although the nulls were brilliant but to someone being careless with passwords and verifications. I opened the door. I let the nulls into the system within hours of meeting them. She didn't regret it, but it didn't stop her from being scared. And now she had a problem. Her access was severely limited and the Treasury computer team had spotted that something was wrong. There'd be an investigation. Things would get too close for comfort. She was qualified in computer auditing, but the stuff Jane could do that was well outside her league, and she had no idea what he might have introduced into the system. Well, I'll just have to work around it, Jay, Bessany said. Have other departments been infected? Still looking, Agent Wenin, said the droid. It was all Bessany could do to stop herself from making an excuse to leave the building to warn Skirata. She waited an hour so that if she was being watched she didn't look as if she'd rushed to call someone as soon as she found her network access was down. Walking across the plaza in front of the treasury building, she bought a mealbread stick from a vendor. Then... Casually as she could she munched on it while she come Skirata. Cal? She said. I've got another one of my problems. Had capital of Horgab, half an hour after the missile attack. Had was now enemy territory. After months of regarding the capital as a safe haven, the GR could no longer be relaxed about watching its back here. Darman provided top cover on Omega's patrol vehicle as it sped down the main road behind Deltas, both of them flanked by new neck pup armored gun platforms of the 85th Infantry as fire support. More of those guys from the 14th, CORR said quietly. On either side of them, life seemed to be carrying on as normal, 
with shop awnings pulled down against the blistering afternoon sun and few citizens on the streets. The launch coordinates for the missile were in this neighborhood. Look! Manning the right-hand gun. The man looked like any other clone trooper, except for the discreet brigade markings. Darman tried to get a closer look. But his attention was needed on the street, to keep an eye out for trouble at ground level, while the others scanned rooftops. The remote that Otten had sent out in front of them checked the route ahead for ambushes, trip wires, and disturbed ground, relaying images to their HUDs. The HAD militia and civilian police had swept through a few minutes ahead of them. Are they some kind of special unit? Niner asked. Because I've only seen them in ones and twos. And that's odd. And we didn't know about them. That's even odder. Etain, crammed into the seat behind Otten on the open bay speeder, made a non-committal grunt. The nulls weren't told about them, either. Is that a problem? C.O.R.R. asked. Well, it bothers me, Darman said. Seeing as they seem to know every time the Chancellor changes channels on H.N.E. That's just talk to scare you, Niviodi. It's true. If the nulls were force-sensitive, too, Etain said carefully, they'd be terrifying. Like they're not already? Darman turned as far as he dared to look at her. Fearfect, that's my girl. I've got a girl. I matter to someone in the outside world. The heady sweetness of it distracted him for a moment. I mean, they're our brothers, and we love them now that we know them better. But when they get that red mist well, they scare me. C.O.R.R. sighted up fast on an apartment building, making Darman think he'd spotted something through the cloud of dust kicked up by the speeders. They're only a danger to Arutais. Yeah, I'm more scared of Scorch at the moment. Auden said, but he didn't sound as if he was joking. Delta's speeder was fifty meters ahead in a wake of dust. I think he's feeling it. The road narrowed and they were in another neighborhood all side streets and winding alleyways. They passed local head patrols that waved them through intersections. Feeling it had become a shorthand throughout the Grand Army for the increasing agitation and hair-trigger anger that troopers experienced as the war progressed. Darman had his moments. Some nights not many, but enough he had nightmares. Being engulfed in flames in the warehouse raid on Karuskin had come back to haunt him for reasons he couldn't fathom. It wasn't the shattered bodies on the battlefield or the faces of his first squad that disturbed him. It was the fire. Per old Scorch. Darman understood. I'll talk to him later, Attain said adjusting her calm link earpiece. Her tone indicated that talk was going to be something a little more intensive. Here we go. Cordon ahead. Niner brought the speeder to a halt beside Deltas. Dozens of local militia milled around heavily armed and watching every angle, but Darman still kept the repeating blaster on full charge. One of their officers jogged from the inner cordon toward Delta's vehicle. Boss redirected him to attain with a jerk of his thumb. We sealed off the area within ten minutes, General said the officer. We might have lost them by now, but we've pinpointed one house as a launch site. He turned to indicate the road at his back and gestured left. The street is shut off at both ends, as you requested. The houses are still occupied as far as we know. Haven't you checked? No, ma'am. We left it for you. We didn't encounter any fire. Etain didn't say anything, but her tight-lipped expression said she was underwhelmed by their commitment. Darman wondered why they didn't just arrest their own problem citizens and be done with it, but they were clear that they wanted the GR to go in and kick down doors. And it couldn't have been because they felt Scorch needed the therapy. Darman bet that the show of GR strength was a bracing reminder for any citizens thinking of going over to the rebels. 
Maybe the locals don't want to be seen dragging other locals away for questioning. Aden said, almost a whisper on the helmet comm circuit. The two squads could hear each other. But it's okay for us to play the bad guys. He might just want to reassure people that we're here and we're cracking down, said Niner. C.O.R. had fallen into a new and totally unfi-like role, squad cynic. Of course, it might also be that they're militia one day and rebels the next. Can't trust them. It was Scorch. Any of them. They'd all put around in us given the chance. Scorch wasn't joking. Darman could hear it in his voice. He could never predict what was going to be the final straw for anyone, and he wasn't sure why the attack on the base was any more traumatic for Scorch than previous missions. But it obviously was. Perhaps it was because Scorch associated the mess with Sanctuary, and now even that haven was a battleground. He'd ask him later. Okay, prepare to dismount, Attain said. The eight commandos walked into the deserted streets under the cover of the two neck pups, split into two rifle teams. Darman checked the remote aerial view. There was nothing on the roofs, and nothing in the walled courtyards. Outside a door, a small dark brown animal of a species that Darman didn't recognize sat cleaning itself. He checked again and magnified the image. In the rear courtyard of the largest house, a big patch of charred vegetation was clearly visible. It was easily big enough to be the downdraft burn from an Arakid Huntmaster missile. You could haul those things anywhere and move them in minutes, and that was what had hit had base. Of course, the guy could have just had a barbecue, Darman said. Sev cut in. Well, let's go and check out his sausages then. I don't like this. Atain was still carrying the cone rifle, but this time she drew both lightsabers from her belt. One was hers, and the other was her dead master's. Shab, had she changed a lot since Darman had first met her? But even then, back on Kalura when she had been undercover for so long that she didn't even know there was a clone army, she knew that she didn't know at all, and she trusted her troops to put her straight. She activated one lightsaber and stared at the target building as if she was willing the doors to open. I can sense a lot of beings in these buildings. Plenty of armaments. Hostility. Let's hope they've got the sense to. Stay inside. She simply walked up to the doors a bold move even for a Jedi and hammered on them, lightsaber still clenched in her fist. Grand army open up. Wow, said Sev. Bold. And dumb. Open up or stand away from the door, Atain yelled. She had no concept of cover, but she was a Jedi, and she had her own early warning system. Darman was watching her back anyway. He'd smack Sev later for the wisecracks. Your call. Lay down your weapons and come out. There was still no answer. Rapid entry with a Jedi wasn't quite the same as with a regular team, because she could sense things nobody else could and when Etain cocked her head and then backed away from the door, Darman knew she'd detected something specific. Six or seven individuals in there, canonied up, she said. I'd hoped for a surrender. Never mind. Open the box, Dar. Let's see what we shake out. Ma'am, said Scorch. Permission to join the assault team? Scorch needed to do it, and Etain seemed to understand that. Granted. Darman was struck by how much more soldier she was than Jedi now. He liked that. She understood. It made him feel safe, certain that they were all going home in one piece. One neck pup moved up, its forward repeating blaster elevating to line up for a possible wall breach. Omega go, Atain said. Dar stand by. Darman had never used the Mersan breaching grenade before. The standoff rod made his dice feel oddly unwieldy, 
but at 20 meters he didn't think he'd miss the entrance. Otten, C.O.R.R., Scorch, and Niner stacked either side of the front doors, but much farther back than usual. Delta stood by as security, ready to deal with fire from other locations. As Darman sighted up he held his breath for a moment. It was suddenly so quiet even with the steady burble of the neck pup's drives that he could hear a baby crying somewhere. Attain jerked her head around. The kid streets away. Darman whispered. He could SEC it had distracted her. We're fine. On your mark. Attain gave him a grim, closed-lipped smile as if she was going to burst into tears. It was just a second no more. Then she was her old self again. Take it out, she said. Fire. Darman squeezed the trigger. It definitely beat shooting out the doors from point-blank range. The rod struck the metal plating, and the sheets blew apart with such neat precision that there was just a loud explosion and a flare of dust before the doors simply fell in through the opening like an entry ramp. Scorch threw a grenade hard through the opening, the squad rushed the doorway, and the firing started. Blue-white blaster fire lit the doorway and windows like a chain of pyrocrackers. Darman switched to blaster mode again and got ready to pick off any troublemakers, but Overwatch wasn't a role he felt comfortable with when his squad were clearing a house. I got separated from my squad at Geonosis. Why he was thinking about that now, he had no idea. The flashing and cracking of blasters stopped suddenly. Then there was a massive hump and the roof of the two-story building erupted sending tiles raining onto the street in a ball of dust and splinters. Attain ducked, debris diverted from her in midair, a neat trick if you could do it. Darman felt it rattle on his armor. Shab, Scorch. It sounded like core. Happy now? Omega, we're clear. Niner's voice filled Darman's helmet. For live prisoners, three dead. One neck pup moved in close to the house to provide cover while the other stayed focused on the silent homes around them. The neighbors weren't exactly craning their heads out the windows to watch. Three men and a woman came out with their hands on their heads, stumbling and unsteady, with C.O.R.R., Auden, and Niner at their backs, DC-17 aimed. Missile launcher in the rear lean-to, Niner said, and plenty of rifles, mortars, and anti-armor rounds. Hey, someone get the militia to take these jokers, okay? And then Scorch came out. He was dragging a body a burly male, from the looks of what was left by one leg. That was no mean feat even for a fit commando. He dumped it in the center of the street between the neck pups, making no attempt to maintain cover, and went back into the shattered building. They could have left the bodies for the militia to sort out, like the damage to the houses on either side. Darman went to help him, but Attain stopped him with a touch on his arm. Just cover him, she said. I wouldn't step in now if I were you. She felt something nobody else could. But you didn't have to be a Jedi to know that Scorch was in trouble. Darman heard Sev mutter something, and Boss responded. Negative, Sev. Don't. It took him several minutes, but Scorch hauled out all three bodies and arranged them neatly in a row. Darman thought that was the end of it, an act of closure that the locals would note, and remember that helping out the rebels if it meant attacking GR personnel was a dumb idea that would end in tears. As hearts and minds went, it was definitely negative. But Darman could see why Scorch wasn't in the mood to hand out candy to local kids. Was it only two years ago that I wanted to save the locals from the wicked seps on Kalura? Wow, talk about being naive. Scorch, Dees held one-handed cocked his head as if he was studying the Hall of Dead Belligerents. Darman thought he was going to walk away at least satisfied if not purged but instead he took aim and sprayed the bodies with blaster fire. Darman heard the same intake of breath from at least three other helmet links. Then, 
As soon as he'd started, Scorch stopped, pulled off his bucket one-handed, and spat eloquently on each smoking pile of remains. Darman didn't realize Scorch had that much spit in him. When he was finished, he put his helmet back on and walked over to the nearest neck pup to sit down on the running board. Just as well we got the right house. C.O.R.R. muttered. Folks around here would probably see Scorch's display as contempt, a message as if it needed underlining that you didn't mess with the Republic. But Darman saw a brother who had been tipped over the edge and couldn't articulate his anger any other way, maybe just temporarily, maybe for good. Darman had seen it once or twice with clone troopers, and how their brothers had swept up the pieces and kept them together but he didn't know what happened to the ones who couldn't snap back to rights after a break. He thought of what nearly happened to Fi, and realized he could guess. Attain gestured to the militia waiting on the barricade to move in. Okay, the local force can clean up and search the rest of the houses, just in case. Probably better if we stand down now. She seemed to take Scorch's reaction calmly. I'll go see Scorch. She sat down on the running board next to Scorch and took his gloved hand in hers, which made Darman feel a little odd. He caught some of what she was saying. She was telling Scorch that she understood, and she could make him feel better for a while, as long as he didn't object to her influencing his mind to get him through the rest of the day. A faint click in Darman's ear interrupted his eavesdropping indicating someone had switched to the squad-only comm frequency. Everyone okay? Said Niner. Darman knew what he meant. He wanted to know if anyone else was going to lose it like Scorch. Cos, let's talk about it if you're not. No, you never knew what was going to get to you, and sometimes it was the least expected things. There was a sudden piyong piyong sound and Aten snarled. Shab, some Chikar taking pot shots. They all wheeled around to locate the position. There was someone on a roof on the other side of the street. The guy from the 14th opened up the neck pup's repeater, and his first burst took the rain recycler off a nearby roof before he managed to concentrate his fire on the same place as everyone else. They'd already sighted up, returned fire and withdrawn behind the barricade by the time Otten worked out that the round a projectile had been stopped by his armor. I'm okay, he said, sounding embarrassed and trying to twist his neck far enough to get a look at the gouge in the paint on his shoulder plate. Mark three armor, my best buddy. Shab, that would have ruined my day. Nice shooting, Mirasik. Darman called to the gunner from the 14th. Even a weak way could have hit the target at that range. Who the shop trained you? Flash trained. The trooper said deadpan. Well, tell Flash he's Asik at training. Look, you want some marksmanship remedial class? Just ask. Leave the poor white job alone, Dar. C.O.R.R., relatively fresh from the meat can ranks himself, sprang to the defense. First deployment. We were great on our first mission. What's his excuse? Actually, it hadn't been great at all. The Jedi generals, utterly untrained, hadn't a clue. Half the commando strength at Geonosis had been killed, deployed as basic infantry, in the wrong place with no air support. Darman shut up. C.O.R.R. had a point. Sorry, Neviodi, Darman said. When did you leave Kamino? The trooper hesitated for a moment, as if he'd forgotten. He took off his helmet to wipe his forehead and the expression on his face was one of very brief disorientation, not an attempt to be evasive. We arrived at HQ a few weeks ago, he said. I bet it's still slashing down with rain in Topoka. It never stopped. Never a clear day. Ever. The trooper's frown deepened. He flipped his helmet over between his palms as if he was about to put it on again. Bone dry when I embarked, he said. Don't recall it raining at all. 
let me check your calibration, Aden said helpfully, and climbed up on the next turret. Darman was so thrown by the answer that he didn't even snap back with a smart one-liner about the trooper needing more time on the practice range. No rain on Camino? Maybe the man's powers of observation were as bad as his aim. Attain appeared from behind him. Problem? Yeah, that guy from the 14th said it never rained on Camino. Attain scratched her cheek, looking preoccupied. Is he being ironic? Didn't strike me as the witty type. Darman's senses were still finely tuned to anything out of the ordinary among his brother clones, and if the 14th Infantry didn't know even the most basic Mando if they came from a Camino where it never rained then there was something wrong. And he was a poor shot. Darman had never seen any clone that inaccurate, not even the young kids. Do you think he's a spy? Darman said thinking of the two covert ops troopers he'd killed. They were just like him, and yet they'd been sent after their own brothers. I'm just paranoid after Gaftaker, that's all. If he is, Atain said, then he didn't graduate top of his class. It's still odd. Darman put his helmet back on and switched to a secure calm channel. Skarata needed to know about this. Small detail was the fabric of the bigger picture. Better report it. Dar, there's something I need to discuss with you. Skarata's channel was busy. Darman found his patience wasn't quite what it had been two years ago. What, ETIK? Not here. Aren't you really telling Zay that we should pull out of this cesspit? I am, yes, but dash. Good. This is a waste of time when we could be taking on high-value targets. Okay. She looked suddenly weary. I agree. What was it you wanted to talk about then? Etain, hands on hips, stared down at her boots. It'll keep, she said. As soon as the militia confirmed they had the house searches under control, the small convoy headed back to head base. Darman waited for Etain to pick up where she'd left off, but he had the feeling he'd interrupted her train of thought yet again, and she'd forgotten what she had to tell him. It couldn't have been important. Chapter 7 We've invented a separatist threat that's bigger than the reality. The claim of quadrillions, quintillions, and even septillions of separatist battle droids is so ludicrous that we'd rush to debunk it if someone didn't have a vested interest in making us believe it. Nothing adds up literally. Do you know how big a quadrillion is? Let's use the galactic standard notation a thousand million million. A quintillion? A million quadrillions. A septillion? A billion quadrillions. Any coalition capable of producing even quadrillions of any machine could roll over the Republic in a few days. And the amount of materials and energy needed to produce and move even a quadrillion droids is immense it would drain star systems. Either our government is composed of enumerate idiots, or it's inflating the threat way beyond the average citizen's math skills so that it can justify the war and where it's heading. Hira Bassett, current affairs pundit, speaking on HNE shortly before being found dead at home from alleged abuse of contaminated glitterstim. Kirimorat, Mandalore, 995 days ABG. Juzik pointed to the wall at the far end of the compound, along the length of a strip of tape stretched in a straight line across the dirt. Phi, wearing just a pair of shorts and looking deeply uncomfortable, stood with his arms folded across his chest in his I'm-not-playing mode. Walk that line, Phi. Off you go. Phi took a breath as if he was going to object, but turned and started walking. Juzik and Helamar stood behind him and watched his progress, recording his movements with a handheld holoscanner. Juzik couldn't help noticing that the device had a stenciled mark on it, property of Republic Central Med Supply. Nice piece of kit, Juzik said. Free gift from a grateful republic? Helamar chuckled to himself but didn't look away from the small screen. 
The monitor was capturing reference points on Fai's body spine, joints, skull and analyzing his movement and posture. Well, they left it loafing around, he said, and I had a patient in need. He put one hand in his belt pouch, eyes still fixed on the monitor, and drew out a couple of small but expensive-looking instruments. Stylus scanners. Encephaloscan and neurochemical assay. Best in the galaxy. State of the Shabla art. Phi reached the end of the compound did a pretty good about turn, and then began walking back again. You stole it all, Juzik said. I liberated it. Helamar corrected. The taxpayers can afford it, seeing as they're not paying for clone rehab centers. I've just got to locate a few more portable diagnostic tools and assorted toys, and we can have a pretty good field medical facility here. You never know what state those boys are going to show up in when the time comes. And brain trauma's common. I wasn't criticizing, Juzik said. I was admiring. Jedi weren't above appropriating goods and cheating their owners in the cause of justice, of course. Juzik had heard many accounts of Jedi Masters commandeering vessels and pulling other dubious tricks without the slightest thought of recompense for the owner. He couldn't see any difference between that and Jilamar's pillage of the Republic's med centers for a socially purposeful cause. You'd be amazed what you stroll off with if you can talk like a medic, wear the right outfit, and know how to misuse med center security, said he Lamar. I nicked a complete operating table once. Phi finished his test walk and stood with his chin lowered, waiting for the verdict. How did I do? Can I get dressed now? He Lamar turned the small hola screen so that he could see it. That's you, compared with one of your brothers at his peak fitness. See? The screen, as far as Juzik could tell, showed percentages. That measures how much your gait wobbles, how far you stride, how much bend there is in your spine, all that kind of biometric stuff. Look! Phi frowned slightly as if calculating. 89%, just over. 89.2% correlation with the benchmark, said he Lamar. Phi let out a long sigh. Oh well. What do you mean, oh well? I'm never going to be a hundred percent. Never so long time, at IK, and 89% of a clone commando is probably about 150% of a randomly conceived human. You're the luxury model of humankind. You can afford to lose a few points. Phi didn't look convinced. So I'm better than a mongrel. Great. Get dressed and we'll do your cognitive tests. Phi trudged off into the bastion, and they followed. Juzik felt he'd failed him despite the huge progress he'd made. He was prepared to spend the rest of his life healing him, if that's what it took. But he was a Jedi, with a reasonable expectation of a longer life than a regular human and Phi had drawn the short straw on life expectancy. Healing took it out of Juzik. It was increasingly exhausting. The improvement in Phi's condition had been dramatic at first. But now it was marginal, the kind of changes that had to be measured with sophisticated equipment. When Phi's happy well, that's the only benchmark I can trust. It can take years to see any kind of improvement, and plenty of folks never recover. Helamar said as they stepped into the main accommodations from the utility area, wiping their boots out of reflex because Rav Brawler had told them she'd skewer them if they messed up the new floors. But it's no good telling him he's made an incredible recovery, because he won't see it like that. I've seen the sequence of brain scans. He had damage to at least two separate areas. How he ever survived at all well, clone lads are built from Django, and he had a tremendously robust physiology. Phi's still got damaged areas in the forebrain though, and that's what's causing the memory blips and the temper. 
Juzik considered how much effort had gone into getting Phi this far saving just one man and despaired at the numbers he would never know or be able to help. He wants to come back to Coruscant with me and see the squad. Maybe that's what he needs. Helamar consulted his looted medical sensors again. I'd still love to know how you did it. I don't really know. Juzik healed by visualizing. He saw the fabric of the body at its most basic level, the ruptured cell walls and tangled proteins, and imagined them whole and straight again. It felt the same to him in the Force as the way he harnessed energy to force rip a door off its runners. I have theories. I always do. I like to think of it as a mix of microtelekinesis and stimulating the body's natural healing mechanisms. How precise is it? As a Jedi, Juzik had been taught to trust his feelings and not to think. He never completely learned that lesson. He refused to, because he knew he could think very well indeed, and the Force wouldn't have manifested itself in him if it hadn't had some use for that intellect. And if the Force had no purpose deliberate or accidental then he wasn't inclined to let it rule him. He grabbed a slice of fruit bread from the conservator, chewed slowly, and realized he had never been a very Jedi-like Jedi. As precise as I can imagine, Mijike. Well, when I acquire the right kit to do brain scans at neuron resolution, I'd better give you a crash course in brain anatomy. Then you can be very, very precise. Helamar held out his hand for a share of the fruit bread. His armor was almost the same shade of dull gold as Skirata's, gold for vengeance, but he wasn't from the same clan. It was a personal statement. You're even smarter than you think, Bard I.K.A. The masters at the academy told me that I thought too much and asked too many questions. Well, that's what any secret cabal that doesn't like its authority to be questioned would say. Juzik couldn't resist the urge to ask. Why the gold armor? There you go again with the questions. Sorry. Didn't mean to pry. It's a fair question. I fell in love with a Mandalorian girl, married into the clans, and a Hutian killed her. I know his name. I'll find him. And then I'll show him what it means to make a bad enemy of a Mandalorian with anatomical expertise and a scalpel. The dark side could be very dark indeed in Mandalore. Juzik didn't shy from it. May she find rest in the Manda. Do you believe in that possibility? Juzik saw nothing incongruous about the Manda, the Mandalorian collective consciousness, the oversoul for want of a better word even if he knew most Mandos didn't take it literally. I use the Force, Midge. I'm prepared to give a lot of things the benefit of the doubt. Do your old buddies think you're lost to the dark side now? Probably. I just wish they'd stop worrying about light and dark, and learn the difference between right and wrong instead. Helamar laughed loudly. Juzik was glad he could get a laugh out of him after making him remember grief, but he suspected that the man never forgot it for a minute. What's the joke? Fi asked appearing in the doorway. He was wearing his gray undersuit, no plates. Is it the one about the hut and the trash compactor? Just conjuring tricks. Helamar took out his data pad. Now see how far we get with this today. It was a program that flashed up images of objects from the everyday to the obscure, and Fi had to name them. He still had a problem with that, and it seemed to be the source of much of his frustration. And don't say thingy because Thinji will not do, soldier. I'm not a soldier anymore, Fi said quietly. His eyes flickered as the images scrolled. Table. Anti-arm around. Banda. No wonder he felt like a child again. He was doing better, but it was all about what Fi regarded as normal for Fi, not the average human male. 
Juzik tried to imagine waking up with no force powers. He'd still be smart and capable, but with his extra edge missing he'd feel blind and deaf, he knew. That's an improvement. Hilamar said showing Fi the collated results. Juzik didn't know if they made any sense to him. It was all numbers. You're one of nature's miracles, even if you do need a haircut. Now let me check your blood. Fi submitted to the probe pressed into his fingertip, watching Juzik with one eyebrow raised until Juzik got the hint and gave him some of the fruit bread. Sergeant Kell used to tell us every day that we would do the best because we were the best. Fi said chomping enthusiastically. Good enough isn't good enough. He didn't mean it that way, Fi. Juzik ruffled his hair. He'd spent so many hours with his hands on Fi's skull, healing him, that he knew the contours of it better than his own. He was instilling self-esteem. Only way from best is down. Oh, you are a little ray of sunshine today, aren't you? Hilamar said tapping Fi gently on the nose like a naughty act pup. Hilamar was a mercenary, and he trained some fearsomely hard men, but sometimes Juzik could see the physician he'd once been. He doubted that Hilamar had ever been the simple country doctor that he claimed, though. Now, look at your progesterone levels. Still higher than normal. Are you pregnant? Have you been throwing up? No. But I get cravings. Fi frowned. Will I get stretch marks? Juzik always paused now to work out if Fi was being funny or if it was some odd disconnection in his brain. It had become a weather gauge of his recovery. But this was the old Fi, back for a while. Hilamar kept a straight face. Yeah, say goodbye to your figure. Everything sags from now on in. Juzik rejoiced silently at Fi's improved mood. Is the progesterone a problem, Mijike? No, said Hilamar. Every human's got progesterone. Males can't make testosterone without it. But it might explain how you've been able to get Fi's brain to repair itself it's been shown to aid healing and brain trauma. Your forced shenanigans might be stimulating secretion. You'll have to bill me later, Bardike, Fi said. I'm a bit borisic until payday. Juzik took out a cash credit and shoved it in Fi's hand. Creds largely untraceable were no problem in the alternate morality of Skirata's renegade gang. Juzik was only occasionally surprised at how quickly he'd come to see it as acceptable. Bagadetti. Here's something to tide you over. Fi studied it. Did you rob a bank? No, Vav did. Where am I going to spend it? Nearest shop is Ensory, and I can't drive a speeder. Yet. There was a heartfelt plea in the statement. Fi was imprisoned here without transport. Parja can drive you in the meantime. She's had to powder my shebs like a baby too often. It's time I grew up again. Fi got up and rummaged in the conservator, head down. While his back was turned, Hilamar mouthed a silent warning. He needs a break. Juzik nodded. Well, I must be going. Ivy got an embryologist to threaten. Hilamar pulled on his gauntlets and helmet. The Burves said he'd have the research ready for me today. He winked at Juzik. We're getting there. Nothing definitive yet, but we'll have a very good data library for Yuthin to work from. Fi watched Hila Margo and stared at the doors for a long time afterward. Talking of pregnant, he said Dar still doesn't know about CAD, does he? No, said Juzik. It's wrong. It's not fair to him. Fi stood up. Can we go to Keldate? I can't keep hanging around Parge's workshop. She's got a business to run. Juzik knew that Parja would have thrown the business out the window 
and lived on water and dead boards if she had to choose between the workshop and Phi. But Phi wanted to be out and about. Keldib seemed to do him good even if it sometimes seemed overwhelmingly complex to him. If you're good, Juzik said, I'll let you take the speeder controls. And you can visit the barber. But no brawling if we run into Sol. Phi grinned. It's just like old times. Yes, it was. They were just two young men having a day on the town. It didn't matter at all that one had been a Jedi and the other had been a clone bred to serve him. Mandalore was like that. It was a great leveler and a fresh start. Special Operations Brigade HQ, Coruscant. How have you been keeping, Cal? Zay asked. Skarata sat down without being invited. Zay knew him well enough by now not to take offense at his lack of respect for rank. He'd even laid out CAF. Outside the window, a platoon of clone troopers selected for commando cross-training were being put through unarmed combat drills by Tehai and Vav. Vav kept saying he wasn't GR personnel any longer, but it was awfully hard to tell. Where would any of them have ended up without the army? Not bad, General, said Cal. You had your leg fixed, I see. It was slowing me down. I'd ask how the family was, but that would put you on the spot, wouldn't it? Not really. Skirata took a gulp of the CAF. Zay was probably still angling to find out what had really happened to Fi. Why did it bother the man so much? He didn't care what happened to clones, except in that theoretical Jedi way. Skirata decided to lob in a verbal grenade just to show Zay that mundane beings could beat Jedi on missions. My daughter's still missing. Zay did a freeze and turn that told Skarada he hadn't been expecting that, and didn't feel the need to hide his reaction. I didn't know you had a daughter, he said. I'm very sorry. Can we help? When I say missing, Skarada went on, satisfied at having scored a point. I mean that she appears to not want to be found. Razan's over 30, so she can look after herself. How do you know she's all right? She was still using her identity chip up to a month ago. How do you know? I'm her father, and fathers know that kind of stuff. Skirata wondered if it had been a good idea to remind Zay that his skills ran to slicing into secure records. Shab, Zay knew the kind of stuff the Republic asked the Nulls to do. Zay was the one who did the asking, obliquely enough to be deniable, of course. Just keeping a watchful eye and all that. I meant your grandson. When I asked about family, that is. Skirata had never taken Ket anywhere near Zay for fear of the Jedi sensing the baby's latent force abilities. Skirata didn't trust Jedi not to abduct and indoctrinate him, and he was never sure if gossip about Atain and Darman ever reached Zay's ears. The man heard a lot more than he let on. Cad's terrific, Skirata said carefully. He's into everything. A real handful. Look, I can see this social chit-chat is a trial for you, General. What do you want? The Treasury needs some special null expertise. Skirata felt his gut somersault. If he hadn't already had warning from Bessany that Jane's spyware had been detected, it would have done a lot worse. Say must have felt his reaction in the Force. It was too strong to miss. Yes, I know they're not where they should be, Cal. Say said, guessing wrong. My professional blind eye is still turned to their extracurricular activities, whatever they might be. The nice thing about the Force was that it was so vague. Etain had told him that. All Zay knew was that either the mention of the Nulls or the Treasury had made Skirata jumpy, and he opted for Nulls. Ha! Huh. So much for omniscience, Jedi. I have such wayward kids, said Skirata. What do they need to do? 
Jane and Mariel are the information technology specialists, aren't they? They've certainly cracked a few separatist systems. And yours. Correct. Then I need them to investigate a very clever program that was installed on the Treasury mainframe. It erased itself as soon as the technicians started trying to isolate the code, and they have no idea what it was doing, but it shouldn't have been there, and Intel fears a separatist sleeper in the camp. Okay, I'll call them in, and you can brief them. Who's vetting the Treasury staff? Do they have any idea where it was introduced into the system? Skirata actually needed to know. If Zay could sense his panic and urgency, he wouldn't be far wrong. It might be a long shot, even for my boys, but they'll do their best. It could be worse. Zay nodded. The Treasury wants its own senior auditor on the job, too. Some woman called Wenin. Then again, maybe it couldn't. Skirata's immediate reaction was that Zay was shaking him down. He knew, or at least he looked as if he knew. So you want us to look for spy programs and Daiji staff? Yes. I'm recalling Omega and Delta from Horgab, and not just to stop General Termyukin from nagging me to death about the fruitlessness of the operation. They've both done urban ops here and they know how to hunt operational terror cells. Apparently Intel were involved in something at the Treasury that didn't pan out, and to which I'm not privy, so words come down from the Chancellor's office that they want the job done right. Nice to see they have faith in special operations. So now Skirata knew something that Zay didn't, that Intel had sent some hapless spook after Bessany, a spook who never made it home again. Skirata, proud of his well-honed paranoia, juggled a range of scenarios in his brain that began to feel like the Hall of Mirrors at the Republic Day Carnival. Was Zay shoving him into this position to force a confession, knowing about Bessany's and Jane's involvement? Or was he an unknowing instrument of intel, and they knew now what was happening? It had the whiff of a technique that Jailer Obram favored breaking down family murder suspects by getting them to do a news conference begging for their loved one's safe return. And Jailer says he's amazed how often they can sail through it. There was always the possibility that it was an honest and logical coincidence. Jane and Mario were the best at slicing. Bessany was the senior agent for defense budget investigation and if the SEPs wanted to glean any information, it wouldn't be data about street cleaning in the lower levels. And yes, Omega and Delta had operated undercover on Coruscant, the only Republic commandos who had and they were way better at it than Intel's bantha-brained operatives. It made sense, but Skirata's gut said that setups always did. How could he refuse? He couldn't. But he could shake Zay a little and see what fell out. Pretending that Bessany knew nothing of the Nulls would be too big a cover story to maintain. The operation at the GR Procurement Center was too easy to check out. I know when in, Skarata said. She was on an undercover op and my boys crashed into it. Bit of an awkward moment, but it all ended friendly enough. Not a face any man would forget either. Oh, she won't mind the nulls trampling all over her turf then. Zay betrayed no reaction. He really did sound as if it was just an annoying concession to keep the treasury quiet. Some civilians can be very judgmental about clones. And Jedi can't, of course. Yeah, I hear Master Voss is judgmental about our lads too. Skirata seethed. Come the glorious day. Arrogant Shabir like that would be the first up against the wall. I'll get right on it. Do you really think of them as your boys? It was one of those out-of-the-blue questions that Zay was increasingly prone to. Skirata couldn't work out if he used it as a tactic, or if his job had become so stressful that he had a million things buzzing around his head the whole time. They're my sons, Skirata said. So what if the man knew he'd adopted the Nulls? It was Mando business, 
outside the petty rules of Arutais, and nothing Zayi or even Palpatine did or said could change the fact. And I'd die for them. Zayi refilled his CAF and didn't look up. That's very moving. I realize how much you care for them. No, I mean they are my sons. Legal heirs. I adopted them under Mandalorian law and custom. Now that caught Zay with his cute around his ankles. He blinked a couple of times, seeming lost for words. Skirata noticed how gray he was looking now, and not just his hair. Well, I can't think of a regulation that prohibits it. Zay said at last and winked. And if I could, you'd just ignore it. I'm glad we understand each other, sir. Skirata said and left. Covering his tracks by randomizing his route back to the apartment had become routine for Skirata now, which was a bizarre irony in itself. He changed speeders, took different sky lanes, and even walked. As he set the speeder of the day to pick up the sky lane's automated control, he cummed each null and summoned Bessany. Maybe Juzik would make it back from Mandalore in time, too. This wasn't quite a crisis meeting, but it was definitely more than keeping up to speed. He had to implement the standby for Bias Land Chevlon now the Mandalorian tactic of strategic disappearance, vanishing to regroup and pop up again when least expected. No, this is making a run for it. I'm going to need to break it to Omega now. Who else? Who else can I safely tell now that there's a safe haven for them if they want to desert? Skirata's mind raced. Omega had a vague idea that there would be a future for them, but they didn't know the full story of the hunt for gene therapy, and Skirata had never actually spelled out that he wanted them to desert, to do a runner. He had no idea how they'd take it. And Zay. He wanted to hate the man as easily as he'd hated other Jedi, but it was impossible not to see Zay as a man stuck in a system that stank, trying to influence it from the inside, and who'd never chosen his path in life any more than the clones had. Don't go soft on them. A Jedi can walk out. A Jedi can say no. Bardike did. After a few wasting detour or two, Noting the extra clone troopers on duty outside public buildings, Skirata landed close to the Kragit and walked the rest of the way. It was like going home. Home was something he hadn't defined for many years, not even narrowing down a planet, but the Kragit and the apartment now felt almost as safe a haven as Kirimorat, maybe more so. The bastion on Mandalore wasn't full of armor noises, cooking smells, and boisterous conversation yet. He cut through the restaurant, scanning quickly to see who he didn't recognize, a Mando habit that had stood him in good stead. He knew all but three of the diners, and two of them were in CSF uniform, cops on their meal break. Captain Jailer Obram sat at his usual table, working through a pile of nerf strips. The two men exchanged casual pats on the back. What's up? Obram asked. That obvious, eh? Yes, Cal. It is. Things are getting a bit warm. If Skirata couldn't confide in Obrame man who'd bent every single police regulation to help Skirata, not to mention the law itself, then he could trust nobody. You know my vacation plan? Winter sports, you mean? Obram knew about Kirimorat, even if he didn't have the exact location. Got a firm date in mind yet? Might be earlier than expected. Before the big melt. Ah. Uh, yeah. Why don't we have a chat somewhere quieter, Cal? Maybe I can give you some skiing tips, Dash. A conversation interrupted them, and they both turned at the same time. Lasima had appeared with a tray of meals, working her shift even though she didn't need to. The Twi'lek insisted on earning her keep. At a table near the kitchen doors, a man one of those Skirata hadn't recognized the one in city said something to her. She put the tray on a vacant table. 
Skirata only caught scraps of the sentence. Hey, I was just being friendly. You Chwilek girls. Well, it's kind of nice for us patrons to see your dash. The man had his arm resting on the table. He didn't finish the sentence. Lasima drew a blade from nowhere and slammed it into the tabletop, pinning his sleeve with a loud thud. She reached forward with her free hand and grabbed his collar, almost pulling him out of his seat. Listen, Shabir. She hissed. Us Twi'lek girls. I'm not your entertainment, I'm not your sport, and I'm not for sale, understand? This Twi'lek girl can cut your get Essie off. In the second's absolute frozen silence that followed, Skirata heard two things, the distant tuneless whistling of someone working in the kitchen, and the rasp and whir of a dozen blasters being drawn from holster CSF regulation issue and charged to fire. Every cop in the restaurant had drawn his weapon and aimed. Skirata had drawn, too, without even thinking. Is that the time? said Skirata. My son... I think you need to get back to the office. Now. Lasima pulled the blade out of the table and stepped back. The man got up and left, which was probably his only option under the circumstances. No tip? Lasima called as the doors parted to let him escape intact. Tytwad. She picked up the tray as if nothing had happened and went on serving meals. Everyone resumed eating. This was no longer a restaurant for casual visitors. It was a CSF and GR canteen by default, and it was a bad place to hit on the waitresses. Cal, you have some awe-inspiring daughters-in-law, Obrim said sliding his blaster back in its holster. He mopped up the sweet melted fat on his plate with a chunk of meal bread. To think that girl was too scared to speak when you first found her. I have an uncanny knack for helping folks realize their full potential, Skarada said. I'll catch you later. CSF Social Club? 1800 hours. See you then. Skarada headed to the rear exit, the least observable route to the apartment. As he passed Lasima, she gave him a smile, and he paused. Bessany's with Cad. She said, anticipating a question. He keeps saying Dida. It's his word today. Atain sent a hollow message, and he was completely mesmerized by it. I was going to ask how you were. Never better, Calbear. You sure? That Chakar. I've never had the choice of saying no to a man before. Lasima had the most beatific smile as if she'd had some wonderful vision. Skirata knew all too well what happened to Chwilek girls from poor families. They were for sale, and nobody lifted a finger to stop the trade. It feels good. Skirata was going to train her how to defend herself, but it looked as if Aden had beaten him to it. It wasn't the first time that he'd wondered why he was still fighting for the Republic given how thoroughly corrupt it was to its core. If Zay and his Jedi pals thought that Grievous was evil, then they hadn't looked too closely under the Republic table at which they sat. Not long now, he whispered. Before the year's out, we'll be gone. Chin up, at IK. Tonight they'd finalize plans. When the time came to run, They'd have minutes, not days, maybe not even hours to get out. In the end, it didn't matter if the Republic won or lost the war. The people Cal Skirata cared about most would be crushed between the warring factions either way. GR Station Nerif, Midrim, 996 days ABG. I vote, CORR said, that the minute we get back to Coruscant, we get the Chiefs of Staff, the Defense Committee, and that oily Mershebs Palpatine, line him up against the wall, and show them the business end of Adis. The transport waited to dock at Nerif, maintaining a 300-meter separation from the other transports waiting to land at the space station. Niner, 
arms folded across his chest and apparently asleep, creaked a little as he moved. Etain watched her squads with a concerned eye. Scorch's recent fall from the grace of his usual relaxed detachment had worried her. That's mutinous talk, private, said Niner. And you haven't got a vote. Aden patted C.O.R.R.'s shoulder. I'll hold your coat, C.O.R.I.K. Well, it's dumb. It's just dumb. C.O.R.R. always had an opinion. Etain had learned fast that the commandos were freethinkers and pretty vocal, but the speed with which the rank-and-file troopers adapted to a less circumscribed life took her aback. She expected them to be like Cage Farm Nuna, not entirely sure what to do when someone opened the cage and tried to shoo them out. White jobs, as the commandos called them, didn't take long to work out that they could fly when given the chance. Why is it dumb? Atain asked. Not that I don't agree with you. About giving the government a nice bracing volley of blaster fire? C.O.R.R. asked. Well, it was disapproval of the conduct of the war, actually, but... It's not mutinous, anyway. C.O.R.R. directed his ire at Niner. Contingency rules. If they're not fit to retain command, we can boot them out. Even slot them. Atain was mildly interested, but she wanted to hear C.O.R.R.'s views on Horgab. Really? C.O.R.K., we've got 150 Shabla contingency rules, everything from arresting the Chancellor if he goes gaga to reducing key allied worlds to slag if they switch sides, Aden said, including shooting the whole Jedi command if they go over to the enemy. It doesn't mean you have to go out and do it now. Come on, C.O.R.R., Atain said. Contingency orders were long, tedious lists of worst-case scenarios, and she didn't want to hear all 150 again. Spit it out. Well, if you want to make Horgab people love us, then you can't just send in special forces to blow the Asik out of the place, especially as the government there is as bad as the other side. They need agri Jedi and engineers. Give them a reliable water supply and some crops, and they'll all calm down. He's got a point, said Aten. When did we ever try anything other than head-on confrontation? With anyone? All that happens is we end up fighting on more fronts and spread all over the chart. You don't believe me? Go look at the deployment schedule. Map it on a holochart, like the one they've got at HQ. Look! Aden activated his holo projector, and their small corner of the crew cabin filled with complex threads of light dotted with planets in three colors, red allies, blue enemies, and yellow neutrals. Then he changed the sort criteria, and the schematic of the galaxy became a totally different picture. The red dots showed deployed Jedi commanders, with purple dots indicating non-Jedi knock-clone commander's mongrels, as the squads called them in green dots their forces. The pattern was very spread out, with a lot of dots in the outer and mid-rims. That's what's killing us, Aden said. I know we've been banging on about it for a year or more, and so have the nulls, but this is just keeping the war ticking over. If we concentrated on one strategic target at a time and really brought one theater under control before we moved on to the next, the war could have been over by now. Could have lost it, too. Atain suddenly felt them all staring at her, even though she couldn't see their eyes behind the helmet visors. Just saying. Could have gone either way. C.O.R.R. snorted. Yeah, and we might even be better off under the seps. I agree that it looks flawed, she said. It's so flawed that it looks as if all they're trying to do is to maroon as many generals in as many stupid places with inadequate support as they can. It didn't look good. It never had. All Atain could care about now was making sure that her boys there she was, falling into Skirata's terms, Skirata's thinking made it out alive. She thought about Commander Levitt, 
and Beck, and Ben. She never forgot their names, and she reminded herself to check if Fenn survived and how Levitt was doing. Levitt said he liked the idea of having a farm, having seen them at close quarters on Kalura. Clones could think outside the confines of their military world all right. Once they did, they weren't dumb and happy with their lot. She thought the only reason General Kenobi talked about them like a proud act owner was that he couldn't admit even to himself that the Jedi Order was complied in a thoroughly evil thing. But at least he didn't refuse to use their names, like General Vos seemed to. Atain found it increasingly hard to find common ground with some of her fellow Jedi. She could see the Order foundering, unchanging over the centuries, hidebound by esoteric arguments about the unseen mysteries and yet blind to its own moral decline in the real world. Master Altus must think that way, too. She thought of the very un-Jedi Jedi who had shown up to help the war effort, the ones like Callista, who had families and lived a life without a temple or the rules of the council. Mainstream Jedi regarded Altus's splinter group as dangerous. But for all their heresy, they didn't look remotely tainted by the dark side. That was why she'd asked Callista to meet her here. There was a third way. Prep for docking, said the pilot's voice over the intercom. You're off watch, and I'm not you, Barvez. Shower, food, sleep, said Darman, prioritizing. Aden shook his head. Food, shower, sleep. Sleep, said Niner. Then more sleep. They looked at Kor. Glorious revolution, then installing a military junta, he said. Atain stared, not at all sure about his hidden depths, but he laughed. Or a nice big plate of mince robe patties. I'm easy. The transport docked, sending a little shudder through the crew bay as it settled on its dampers on the hangar deck. Atain jumped down from the hatch and stood back to count out the squad's Omega, Delta, and Vavut. Vavut had been trained by Rab Brawler, it showed. They behaved like sons eager to please their mother. Come on, General, let's get you fed and watered. Deck, their sergeant, began steering her in the direction of the mess. You won't be fit for much without some decent scrawn inside you. I'll join you later she said, checking her chrono. Two standard hours, relief crew area, for briefing. I'll even stand you an ale in the mess. Darman hung back. When exactly are we shipping out again? Tomorrow. Good. I told Zay that triple zero could do without you for another day, because I wanted you all to get a clear eight hours sleep for once. Darman just grinned. I'll do my best. I'll bet. It was as good a time as any. And anyway, I need to talk to you without the squad around. I don't mind. I don't have any secrets. It's private. Really private. Darman's grin crumpled for a moment, and what returned was an anxious smile. Okay. Am I going to need a few LS to sustain me? No. Oh, Fearfeck. Yes, you will. You don't like ale anyway. Atain turned and walked away before she ended up blurting it out there, and then in a busy transit area. The last thing she needed was half the galaxy knowing she had a child. The urge for confession burned her up. Every moment she didn't come clean with Darman made it worse. It shouldn't have been this way. It was all her fault, all her doing, but there had to be something wrong with a system that put two people in the positions that Atain and Darman were in. She found Callista pacing around in a quiet corner of the med deck, one level below. Sorry if I kept you, General, she said. I was just seeing if I could help. Quite a few wounded troops passing through. It took Atain a few moments to realize she meant medical help. Doing a bit of healing? I'm not a good healer, but I try. 
A little bit of mind influence to lift their spirits seems to be what I do best. Do you ask their permission? Callista looked faintly offended. Of course. Yes, you would. Atain's question had already been answered but she went on anyway, because she needed to talk to another Jedi who wouldn't make pious noises about helping her get back on the right path. I've come to see you about your funny little ways, as you put it. Something tells me you're not here to lecture me on our deviance. The two women looked at each other in silence for a moment or two, tasting the subtle ebb and flow of the force around them. Not exactly, Atain said. I'm not the kind of Jedi the Council wants as its arbiter of adherence to the tenets. Go on, say it. I have a child they don't know about, and a lover I shouldn't have. I'm still serving in the Grand Army, but I can't carry on like this. Before I give up being a Jedi completely, I want to know if I can salvage any of my calling. Callista put her hand on Atain's shoulder. You want to join us? You know what'll happen if you do. We're effectively the lunatic relative that they don't talk about. Would I be accepted? What do you expect of your adherents? Well, your family's welcome. You never need live a lie for a start. You have a lover? Of course. What's life if you shun the most powerful influence for good that any being knows? Atain wondered how Darman would fit in as the non-force using other half in a community of Jedi. Then she realized she was making yet another decision for him, assuming control, assuming that she knew best just as she had when she decided to conceive. If I were to come to you, would we be obliged to live in your community? Atain asked. Callista leaned her head as if she was struggling to hear her. The idea was already beginning to look like a bad one, and Atain's voice dipped accordingly. It was ludicrous to think that she could think of being a part-time Jedi, occasionally popping in to do a bit of Jedi work with Master Altus and his sect. The father of my child might have to be based elsewhere. Callista looked bemused. I can't speak for Master Altus, but I can't imagine him turning you away if you wanted to spend any time at all with us. Atain found it almost shaming that Altus and his people would throw their lot in with the Jedi order to fight alongside them when they were effectively shunned by it the rest of the time. She was also shamed that the order was happy to have them back on board when it suited them. She was starting to think like Juzik. I think I shall spend some time with you one day, she said. A few weeks was all she had in mind, just to be certain that she wanted no more to do with the Jedi path. If you'll have me. This is very sad you know. What is? That you have to be so miserable simply for being a normal human being, force user or not. Master Alta says the Jedi Order has become more like a corporation than a spiritual body, all rules and infrastructure and committees. To continue the analogy, he says that the Order has lost sight of its core business which is simply doing the right thing for others. Atain thought of the Jedi Temple and its vast archives, technical facilities, and apparently limitless budget. Yes, it was hard to see where it had all started. I wish I could say we're stagnant, Atain said, preparing to leave before she poured out all her frustration and resentment on this woman. But I feel we're decaying. Callista gave her a polite nod. One day, Come visit us and bring that baby of yours. We'd love to see him. As Etienne walked back to the main mess deck, she couldn't recall mentioning that she had a son. It might have had no significance, just a better pronoun to use than it, but perhaps Callista was sufficiently force-sensitive to tell. She suddenly craved Darman's company. Nerif was a huge station, a docking platform and resupply base for a quarter of the mid-rim, and when she finally reached the mess, Omega weren't around. The deck was a sea of strangers, mostly clone troopers, with a scattering of grey-uniformed non-clone officers and a couple of Jedi Padawans. 
When she reached out in the force, Darman felt peaceful and distant. He almost always did. Sometimes it was hard to tell if he was awake or not from his impression in the force. She cummed him. It took him a few moments to respond. Dar, where are you? Freshers, Kadek. The steward droid booked me into the officer's quarters, not that I asked for that. Private cabin, not a mess deck, so find cabin 1761 and deck. I'll meet you there. Darman's voice sounded suddenly husky and self-conscious. I've missed you too. Atain could be slow on the uptake, she knew. Per Dar, he was expecting a little diversion by way of romance, not the biggest shock of his short life. She'd have to play this carefully. Talk first, she said. Catch up on lost time afterward. Deal? Okay. She got to her cabin before him and waited trying to meditate. Being a Jedi required maintenance. It was a set of skills, she realized, and once she stopped using them, they went off tune. She spent so long now in the mundane world that she rarely meditated and even her kinetic skills needed sharpening up. Her duties were much less combat-oriented now. She had to get up to speed again, if only for basic survival purposes. She could still sense Darman's presence long before he rapped on the doors, though. She kept that skill very sharp indeed. He still felt remarkably innocent in the Force, not exactly the child she'd first mistaken his presence for on Kalura, and the bright optimism had definitely tarnished but it wasn't shot through with dark vortices of anger and passion like Skirata's yet. Scorch, though. She thought of Scorch, quiet despite the raw blazing fear and anger that she'd calmed that had, and hoped the Force would spare Darman that. The war was grinding down even these soldiers, despite a genome selected for its potentially abnormal resistance to stress. Itiake? Good navigation. Come in, quick. She could sense nobody nearby but the last thing she needed was to be spotted inviting one of her men into her cabin. Did you get something to eat? I lost the GR record for bolting down ten Roba sausages washed down with half a liter of CAF, he said, setting his helmet and rifle down on the upper bunk. The cabins were cramped, the kind with washing facilities that folded up into the bulkhead. CORR trounced me. The man's a sarlacc on legs. I. Hung. On. To. The. So. Brigade. All comers pie with unignified fruit mush filling record though. You can still be proud of me, E.T.I.K. Darman had an utterly disarming smile. It made Atain feel worse, because the trust just shone out of him. She would be contrite. She would beg forgiveness. And he had to be told, but she worked up to it gently. I really like C.O.R.R., she said. I'm astonished how political he is, how much he thinks. He's really rather subversive. Dar began detaching his pack and armor, stacking the plates beside his helmet. There was no such thing as a quick change for a commando kid out the way the RCs were. Yes, us simple clones can even count, and we is happy to be dumb, yes sir, just churn us out and line us up in the shooting gallery, because we don't feel a thing. Atain was mortified. She hadn't meant it like that. It was simply admiration of C.O.R.R.'s ability to shake off the indoctrination that told him the only purpose of his life was to lay it down for the Republic. Dar, you know I'd never even think anything so disgusting. She grabbed his hand. You believe me, don't you? I'm not a bigot. I meant that dash. I know. It's okay. Sorry. Just a bit fed up. Darman was the most laid back of men, so some Mumbro must have said something out place to the squad. If she found out well, 
if she found out it was a Jedi officer, she'd go and give them a very un-Jedi bawling out they'd never forget. And now she had to tell him. Dar, I love you. You know that too, don't you? Are you working up to telling me something bad? Not exactly bad. Because that's how Sergeant Cal used to start when he had to scold us as kids. You know I love you, son, but you mustn't do that again. But he does love us, so it's okay. Attain knew now why Jedi her brand of Jedi, anyway feared attachment. She was now totally out of control of the situation, unable to be serene. Love messed you up something rotten. But she still wouldn't trade it for anything, including her next breath. It was the peak of her existence. Dar, I need you to listen to me. Atain took his arm. She wanted to grab him by both shoulders to keep him facing her, but he was too tall. Dar, I'm going to tell you something I should have told you a long time ago. Please don't be angry with me, even though I deserve it. That got his attention. Is it Mariel? What? When I'm away. Atain was shocked silent for a moment. Fear fact, Dar, never. No, nothing of the kind. I'd never betray you like that. She'd been at this point so many, many times, and she hovered on the brink again. It was agony. Do it. Tell him. Do it. Stang, did he really think she'd cheat on him? Dar, the reason I was away on Kalura for five months was... I was pregnant. I had a baby. As soon as the words escaped her lips, she could almost see them hanging in the air. They had a life of their own, form and meaning, reality and potency. However many times she'd picked up Cad and held him, he had never been more real than at this moment, even light years away in someone else's care. Darman just looked at her. She felt him. He was suddenly as blank as his expression. It was a bombshell. It had stripped all thought from him. What? I had a baby. They were the wrong words, but that was how they came out. Darman was struggling, blinking as if he was trying to process an alien language, looking her straight in the eye but not connecting with her. A vast chasm had opened up between them. It died? The words escaped in a breath. Oh, E-T-I-K. She wasn't expecting that. He'd totally misunderstood. She'd used the past tense, and it had thrown him. He didn't even ask if it was his. It was as if he didn't connect their relationship with the possibility of a child. What did I expect him to say, after what I've done? No, Dar, he's fine. He's beautiful. He's yours. He's ours. Darman's eyes never left hers. He stopped blinking and drew in a breath with his lips parted, like someone about to sneeze or cough. Atain couldn't even feel which way he was going to jump. She was now terrified. She knew it would shock him, but it had completely winded him. You never told me? He said at last. You never thought to tell me? It was far worse than that, of course. Did he even need to know she had planned it? Yes, he did because she couldn't live with any more lies. He and Cad were her whole life now. There could be no secrets. I realized that if I told you I was pregnant, you'd fret, and you don't need any more worries when you're at the front. There was no purpose to be served by telling him Skirata had stopped her. She'd deceived Darman from the start, planning to conceive, making him think there was no risk of pregnancy. It was her fault. She would face the consequences alone. And then I didn't know when to tell you. And I was scared of the Jedi Council finding out. For all kinds of reasons they'd kick me out. They might take Cat away from me dash. Is... 
Is that his name? Yes. Cad. I named him Venka when he was born, but then you said you liked Cad as a name for a son, remember? When? Atain trailed off. She remembered when that conversation had taken place and wished she hadn't reminded him. The eruption was coming. We were talking about names. Darman had superb recall. Not perfectly eidetic, like the Null's enhanced memories, but he could remember just fine. When? When Skirata had introduced Cad to the squad as his grandson. Now Kalber was in it up to his neck, too. That was my son, he said. Atain could hardly hear him. He was almost saying it to himself. My son. It's okay, Dar. She reached out again and tried to take his hand but he didn't grip hers in return. She was too scared to try to hug him now, although she wasn't sure what she was scared of. He now looked like a spring about to uncoil. We'll make it work now, Dar. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I shouldn't have done any of this, I know it, but I so wanted you to have a son, to have some kind of future. That's what Mandalorian men want, isn't it? Heirs. Darman didn't seem to pick up that it was deliberate and force-shaped on her part, but that was like failing to notice the snowstorm when the avalanche had brought down half the mountainside. He simply took a step back from her and cupped both hands slowly over his mouth and nose as if he was trying to avoid inhaling something. Dar? He straightened up with his arms at his side. Am I the last to know that was my son? He looked as if he was replaying all the conversations from that day when they stood around in Bessany's apartment admiring the new addition to Skirata's family. Skirata had even formally adopted Darman in that on-the-spot, one-line, instant Mandalorian way and Darman had told her he wasn't ready to be a father. If he was recalling all that, he must have been in turmoil now. But she could sense almost nothing from him. Atain, did everyone know except me? No. Just those who needed to know for Cad's safety. Darman paused, staring at the bunk in defocus, and then began reattaching his armor plates. Everyone except me and the squad then. Atain had no reason to think he would ever hurt her, but in that way of all very strong, very muscular men, he had a presence that could either be reassuring or menacing, and right now he scared her inexplicably. It was the silence both kinds, the lack of sound and the lack of emotion in the force. He fumbled with his helmet, and then seemed to give up on sealing it, tucking it under one arm. Dar, when you're ready to talk about this, she said. He turned to the doors. I just need to walk for a while, he said voice hoarse. Clear my brain a bit. She listened holding her breath until she couldn't hear his boots in the corridor any longer. Then she opened her comm link and called Skarata to let him know what she had done. Chapter 8 of course clones suffer. What makes you think they don't? They've been at war continuously for more than two years without a break, and it's been a hard war. Battle stress isn't an if, it's a when. If the GR were made up of average humans, you would simply not have a functioning army now. Clone troopers are optimized humans, and only 2% of the population could ever be as tough, resilient, and aggressive as these men are. But grind them daily like this, give them no respite, deprive them of sleep, give them no outlet or support and even they will break down eventually. Doctor Najhilamar, Kui Valdar and Medical Advisor to Special Operations Brigade, assessing the Republic Department of Defense claim that clone troops would not suffer battle stress like other humans because they knew no other kind of life, and were bred for it. Transit Mess Deck N GR Station Nerif, 1910 hours GST, 996 days ABG. 
The benefits of a fully enclosed helmet had never been more apparent to Darman than now. He could sit and rage in full sight of any passing trooper, and as long as he didn't move, nobody would be the wiser. There was little privacy in these temporary barracks. Omega's squad huddled in an open four-berth cabin area, icons of relaxed calm to anyone watching, but inside their biceps was a private arena for a painful conversation. The only drawback was that body language had to be suppressed, but that was a skill all clones learned the moment they realized they could retreat inside their armor and create a private space that the Kaminoans couldn't enter. Darman wondered how many Jedi generals knew that the familiar copy that was nothing like the comments shared between brothers on private circuits out of officer's earshot. Shah, Dar, what are you going to do? Aden asked. I don't know. Darman hadn't managed much more than that in the past hour. He didn't even know yet if he was angry. The closest comparison he had to this feeling was when Jay, Vin, and Toller got killed once the immediate blind struggle to survive had passed disbelief, numbness, a physical ache in his chest, and a complete inability to think straight. I just don't know. He doesn't have to do anything. Niner fell into sergeant mode, trying to be the voice of reassurance in a crisis. There's nothing he can do. The baby's a fact. It's being looked after. There are no regs that say he can't father a child. And Etain isn't going to sue him for child support credits, is she? So all he has to do is come to terms with the fact that she Criffingwell had his kid and didn't bother to tell him. Nothing major then. Aten said arms folded tight across his chest. It was a good way to avoid making gestures that would give outsiders any clue to what was going on. He can just feel betrayed. He can manage that. C.O.R.R. had kept his mouth shut throughout the argument. He might have been annoyingly gabby on less personal topics, but he knew when to butt out. Dar felt he glimpsed the real man at those moments. He liked him all the more for it. Darman ventured into territory he was reluctant to even think about. Calvin knew. Yeah. But you said Atain would be in serious Asik if the Jedi thought police caught her. Niners seem to be going for mitigating circumstances. And don't they take Jedi babies? She had her reasons. But she had told him, and Cad wasn't any less at risk. The assumption was that the baby was Force-sensitive, or whatever they called it. That didn't make him a Jedi. Darman longed for a few sensible words from Juzik. He'd have the answers, and if he didn't, he'd still have some wise words on the situation that might make Darman see the positive side and a way of picking up again from here. It struck him that his first thought wasn't to pour his heart out to Skirata. Dar, C.O.R. said carefully, Don't you want the kid? Yes, I do. It just slipped out. I didn't think I'd be interested, but he's mine. It means there's more to me than just what's sitting here. I can't explain it very well. All I know is that it matters. It makes me someone different. Regular humans grew up knowing what families were, what parents did even if they didn't have one. In Darman's wholly artificial world on Kamino, during the years that mostly shaped him, Darman had worked out something vital that there was such a thing as a father, and Cal Scarata filled that gap in his life. He'd seen Django fed from time to time in his son and known that he was grown from the man's cells, but he never felt the connection with him that he felt with Scarata. Humans were just like any other creature in the galaxy. Their instinct was to breed and look after their young, and cloning humans and growing them in vats didn't change that one bit. I bet Ko Sai would have been shocked that her predictable clone units had such messy lives. C.O.R.R. said. She wouldn't have liked that at all. Shame she's dead then. Would have been great to see her reaction. Niner clicked his teeth in annoyance. Well, 
You can forget the practical problems, and we can get you through the bad feelings. We always have. Vote and write? Actually, Niner was wrong. He was very wrong. Darman was in a place he'd never been before, and it was about more than suddenly finding he had a child out there somewhere. It was about trust. The galaxy was all lies, and even his job was built partly on deception. But as long as there was one area that he knew was real and that wouldn't crumble under him, he felt safe. That part wasn't a tain. It was Calbear. He knew, Darman said, and he never told me. Cal? C-O-R-R -R asked. Why wouldn't he tell me? Because he knew you'd go off the deep end like this. Don't I have a right to know? I mean, he always told me I was a man with the right to control my own life. But now he decides what's good for me and what isn't. Niner cut in. Give him a break. Calbir wasn't the one who got pregnant and kept quiet about it. Well, if he had a reason for not telling me, it's either because he thought I was too stupid to handle it, or that Attain's problems were more important. I mean, it's not like I tell anyone else, is it? Or, said Niner, maybe he decided that because you and Attain are two adults, he was staying out of your private business. It made sense. Niner always did. But it didn't placate Darman one bit. He was starting to find definite thoughts solidifying in the fog of painful emotions. And three of them loomed like rocks. That he wasn't trusted by people he loved and trusted that he wasn't sure now if he could trust them. And that he had a nameless, formless, desperate animal need to see his kid even if he wasn't sure what a father in his position was supposed to do. Well, he could hang on to that. And he knew what a father's job was. He'd had what he thought was the best role model in Skarada, although doubts about that now nod at him. He checked the incoming transmissions on his HUD. If he chose not to answer on the voice channel or couldn't the data could be stored as text to be read later. Skarada had been trying to raise him on the secure link. Atain had just left a reminder that they were embarking for triple zero Coruscant, Cory, Tripsip, whatever she wanted to call it, because he didn't care right now at 0600 GST. He wasn't snubbing either of them. He just hadn't worked out what he wanted to say, let alone how he was going to react to the answers. It'll be all right, Dar, Aten said quietly. Ups and downs of being with females. We'd have learned all this by stages if we'd been born the regular way on Cory. Darman was inclined to listen to Aten. Niner was just master theory about women, and C.O.R.R.'s romances lasted as long as he was in town, thanks to Muriel's influence. Aten had Lasima, and he knew the score even if he never had to worry that there was a kid out there he didn't know existed. Things used to be simple. Niner said but it sounded as if he was talking to himself. Things did. But life wasn't simple now, and Darman understood the occasional bliss of being ignorant. Growing up at twice the speed that nature intended hurt in more ways than he first thought. It hadn't given him time to toughen up his heart. Arca Barracks Gymnasium, Coruscant, 0630 hours. 997 days ABG. Vav seemed to be in his element again. Scorch hesitated to use a word like radiant for a hard old shikar like his sergeant, but the man looked like he had some blood in his cheeks for the first time in ages. You think that hurts? Vav grunted. He had an unlucky trooper and an eye-wateringly painful grip on the floor. The D-cut should have known better than to volunteer for the demonstration, but he obviously didn't know Vav, and thought he was dealing with an old guy. He was. But Vav was an old guy who kept fit and knew plenty about pain. No, this hurts. The trooper squealed. It took a lot to get a reaction out of a man like that. They might have been meat cans, 
but they were as hard as any arc or commando. Scorch couldn't watch any longer. He called to Vav, more for his own peace of mind than the urgency of Zay's summons or to end the trooper's agony. Vav's technique was known as a Keldade handshake, but hands didn't have a lot to do with it. Sarge! He yelled. Sarge, General Zay sends his compliments and wants to see you right now. Vav let go of a delicate part of the trooper's anatomy, and the guy rolled over onto his side, out of action for a few moments. Well, at least he knew how to stop a human adversary with one grip now. Murd watched from the sidelines, yawning occasionally, with the air of having seen it all before. Get yourself off to Medbay and have that looked at, at I.K., Vav said, tidying his rumpled fatigues. He didn't look half as scary out of armor. His looks lied. Murd, watch them and make sure they don't slack off. You lot by the time I come back, I want you to be able to make each other's eyes water. Got it? It was a weary chorus. Yes, Sarge. Great Derricker of Ermenu, I've been struck deaf for my sins. I said got it? Yes, Sergeant. They barked. Vav seemed temporarily satisfied. He accompanied Scorch through the corridors to Zay's office, smelling faintly of fresh sweat and backed ointment. Are you on brigade strength again, Sarge? Scorch asked. No. Still civilian status. Valve wore a slightly preoccupied frown that didn't seem to have anything to do with the business at hand. That way I can tell Zay where to stick his orders without feeling I've lost my military self-respect. An army that refuses orders is a rabble. Scorch had heard it all before. It was like a litany, and he knew his lines. An army that refuses orders is a danger to its citizens. An army that refuses orders is dead. You ever disobeyed an order, Sarge? Only when it was unlawful. And that's not always an easy call, not when the bolts are shaving your nose hair. I'll leave that wisdom to the lawyers sitting on their padded sheps years after the event. Vav had never been a chatty man at the best of times. Maybe this was the private Vav, the one his squads rarely saw. How are things with you? Sorry, Sarge, say again? I hear and see all. There's no shame in losing it from time to time, not in a fool's war like this. Nobody could keep their trap shut, it seemed. But it was probably Etain who blabbed not the squad. None of them would have told Vav they thought Scorch needed a bit of help. The old Vav would have given him a thrashing for what he'd done at had stupid risks, emotional outbursts, generally not being ice when it mattered. Today's Vav seemed a little more tolerant, and that was unsettling in itself. Scorch wondered if his own grip on reality was in a worse state than he thought. Bit tired, Scorch said. That's all. Shipping out to Kashyyyk sometime soon. We'll be there a while. I know, but I want to see you in my quarters at 1800, okay? Scorch's gut churned. Right you are, Sarge. There was always a chance this wasn't really Vav but a shape-shifting Gerlinin. Sometimes, Scorch heard, they didn't quite manage to get in character. Scorch felt fine now. He couldn't see what the fuss was about. He was just reacting to being surrounded by Shakar who enraged him. He had bad dreams, too, but everyone did. He'd tell Vav as much. Boss, Fixer, and Sev were already waiting in Zay's office when Scorch opened the doors. There was no sign of Captain Mays. Zay had both elbows on his fancy blue lapis desk, arms crossed a sure sign that he was crawling the walls instead of just being extra agitated. Gentlemen, this is a confidential briefing, he said. The doors snapped shut from the control on his desk. 
What's discussed here goes no farther. Scorch was offended. Every Shabla job they did was top secret. He noted Vav's jaw take on a more set angle. Definitely not a girl in him then. The old Martin at Vav was still in there. I think you can trust us to be professionals, Vav said. He adjusted the collar of his fatigues, probably ill at ease out of armor or formal clothing. Whatever it is, how bad is it? It's about the compromised computer networks. I know. You've already briefed us on that. We need some leads from the nulls and the treasury text before we can get on with it. Shouldn't Omega be in on this, too? That's the nub of the problem, Wallen. Zay had the air of a man edging his way across a rickety bridge. I need someone to keep an eye on Skirata and his nulls. And I don't mean checking they've got enough CAF and cookies to keep them happy. What are you asking me to do, General? Vav's expression was set in granite now. You'll have to be explicit for once. It wasn't the first time that Zay had kept Skirata out of the loop on an operation. He hadn't wanted him to know about the mission to locate Ko Sai. But it was the first time Zay had asked anyone anyone in this room any way to treat him as potentially hostile rather than just prone to slicing up Kaminoans that the Republic wanted alive. Much as I respect the man as a soldier, I want to be sure that he's not misusing his position. Zay said, I want you to observe what he and his little private army are up to. You want me to spy on a comrade? Yes? I want to be sure he isn't harming the Republic, Wallen. That's all. I know how much he cares about his troops, and I know he bends the rules past breaking point, but I don't begrudge him whatever he creams off the budget I know it'll be for the clone's benefit. And I can't argue with the Null's record on Black Ops. I just need to know Skirata isn't sabotaging the war effort, deliberately or otherwise. Vav looked as if he was chewing it over before spitting it against the wall. Delta Squad just sat there and said nothing. The conversation was being conducted over their heads, as it often was, and Scorch wondered if Sei just had them sit in on these sessions so he could try to sense from their reactions in the force if they knew anything. Scorch felt increasingly uncomfortable with that idea. It was like the constant monitoring by the Kaminoans to check for deviance, reminding him of all the subtle ways that clones presented a nice, tidy, unremarkable facade to avoid reconditioning. Some never returned from that. You had to try to be as unindividual as you possibly could in case the Iowa bait spotted you and carted you off. You must have some evidence of dodgy behavior to try to enlist me, Vav said at last. I don't like flying blind. Level with me. Tell me where you think I should be looking or he'll completely bamboozle me or cut my throat for betraying him when I'm least expecting it. So that's a yes then. No, it's a tell me what I'm getting myself into before I say anything. I'm too old to play guessing games. Say leaned back in his seat. I have no doubt he's stealing. Well, they say that's what Mandalorians are like, after all. All the same. Say ignored the barb. But even Skirata couldn't purloin enough to put a dent in the conduct of the war. I'm looking for active sabotage of missions, withholding of information, unhealthy contact with separatists, that kind of thing. Scorch knew Skirata got up to all kinds of mischief, and he'd even taken part in some of it. So did Vav come to that, but that was why the Special Operations Brigade had them on the payroll. It wasn't Junior Scout Ranger work. They had to mix it with the lowest forms of life in the galaxy. Valve was now a statue of self-control. Attain said he always seemed utterly calm in the force, even when he was shoving a vibra-blade down someone's gullet. Say looked none the wiser. I've known Skirata for some years, Valve said. 
He's a criminal by Coruscant standards. So am I. But an outright traitor, no. He's a professional. So Mandalorians never do double agent work, Wallen? Not for the rates you pay, General. Zay met Vav's unflinching gaze and looked away before reaching for a data pad tapping to select something and pushing it across the polished desk. Vav picked it up to read. That's a list of separatist combatants taken prisoner during the last month, Zay said. Recognize any names? Vav was still totally unmoved. Yes. When Skirata mentioned his daughter was missing, I felt sorry for him, so I ran some name checks on government databases just in case she showed up at a med center or registered for work somewhere. And you found her in a Republic prison. I assume it's the right woman. He didn't spell her name. Are you Yusayan? Vav said. Ruv for short. And you think that having... A daughter five... 